The Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Horace B. Samuel Preface 1. We are unknown, we knowers, ourselves to ourselves. This has its own good reason. We have never searched for ourselves. How should it then come to pass that we should ever find ourselves? Rightly has it been said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our treasure is there, where stand the hives of our knowledge. It is to those hives that we are always striving, as born creatures of flight, and as the honey gatherers of the spirit, we care really in our hearts only for one thing, to bring something home to the hive. As far as the rest of life with its so-called experiences is concerned, which of us has even sufficient serious interest, or sufficient time? In our dealings with such points of life, we are, I fear, never properly to the point. To be precise, our heart is not there, and certainly not our ear. Rather like one who, delighting in a divine distraction, or sunken in the seas of his own soul, in whose ear the clock has just thundered with all its force, its twelve strokes of noon, suddenly wakes up and asks himself, what has in point of fact just struck? So do we at times rub afterwards, as it were, our puzzled ears, and ask in complete astonishment and complete embarrassment, through what have we in point of fact just lived? Further, who are we in point of fact? And count after they have struck, as I have explained, all the twelve throbbing beats of the clock of our experience, of our life, of our being, ah, and count wrong in the endeavor. Of necessity we remain strangers to ourselves, we understand ourselves not. In ourselves we are bound to be mistaken, for of us holds good to all eternity the motto, each one is farthest away from himself. As far as ourselves are concerned, we are not knowers. 2. My thoughts concerning the genealogy of our moral prejudices, for they constitute the issue of, in this polemic, have their first bald and provisional expression in that collection of aphorisms entitled Human All Too Human, a book for free minds the writing of which was begun in Sorrento during a winter which allowed me to gaze over the broad and dangerous territory through which my mind had up to that time wandered. This took place in the winter of 1876-77. to 77. The thoughts themselves are older. They were in their substance already the same thoughts which I take up again in the following treatises. We hope that they have derived benefit from the long interval, that they have grown riper, clearer, stronger, more complete. The fact, however, that I still cling to them even now, that in the meanwhile they have always held faster by each other, have, in fact, grown out of their original shape and into each other, all this strengthens in my mind the joyous confidence that they must have been originally neither separate, disconnected, capricious, nor sporadic phenomena, but have sprung from a common root, from a fundamental fiat of knowledge, whose empire reached to the soul's depth, and that ever grew more definite in its voice, and more definite in its demands. That is the only state of affairs that is proper in the case of a philosopher. We have no right to be disconnected. We must neither err disconnectedly, nor strike the truth disconnectedly. Rather, with the necessity with which a tree bears its fruit, so do our thoughts, our values, our yeses and nos and ifs and whethers grow connected and interrelated, mutual witnesses of one will, one health, one kingdom, one sun. As to whether they are to your taste, these fruits of ours, but what matters that to the trees? What matters that to us, us, the philosophers? 3. Owing to a scrupulosity peculiar to myself, which I confess reluctantly, 
it concerns indeed morality a scrupulosity which manifests itself in my life at such an early period with so much spontaneity with so chronic a persistence and so keen an opposition to environment epoch precedent and ancestry that i should have been almost entitled to style it my a priori my curiosity and my suspicion felt themselves betimes bound to halt at the question of what in point of actual fact was the origin of our good and of our evil indeed at the boyish age of thirteen the problem of the origin of evil already haunted me at an age when games and god divide one's heart i devoted to that problem my first childish attempt at the literary game my first philosophic essay and as regards my infantile solution of the problem well i gave quite properly the honor to god and made him the father of evil did my own a priori demand that precise solution from me that new immortal or at least amoral a priori and that categorical imperative which was its voice but oh how hostile to the kantian article and how pregnant with problems to which since then i have given more and more attention and indeed what is more than attention fortunately i soon learned to separate theological from moral prejudices and i gave up looking for any supernatural origin of evil a certain amount of historical and philological education to say nothing of an innate faculty of psychological discrimination par excellence succeeded in transforming almost immediately my original problem into the following one under what conditions did man invent for himself those judgments of values good and evil and what intrinsic value do they possess in themselves have they up to the present hindered or advanced human well-being are they a symptom of the distress impoverishment and degeneration of human life or conversely is it in them that is manifested the fullness the strength and the will of life its courage its self-confidence its future on this point i found and hazarded in my mind the most diverse answers i established distinctions in periods peoples and castes i became a specialist in my problem and from my answers grew new questions new investigations new conjectures new probabilities until at last i had a land of my own and a soil of my own a whole secret world growing and flowering like hidden gardens of whose existence no one could have an inkling oh how happy are we we finders of knowledge provided that we know how to keep silent sufficiently long four my first impulse to publish something of my hypotheses concerning the origin of morality i owe to a clear well-written and even precocious little book in which a perverse and vicious kind of moral philosophy your real english kind was definitely presented to me for the first time and this attracted me with that magnetic attraction inherent in that which is diametrically opposed and antithetical to one's own ideas the title of that book was the origin of moral emotions its author dr paul ray the year of its appearance 1877 i may almost say that i have never read anything in which every single dogma and conclusion has called forth from me so emphatic a negation as did that book albeit a negation untainted by either pique or intolerance i referred accordingly both in season and out of season in the previous works at which i was then working to the arguments of that book not to refute them for what have i got to do with mere refutations but substituting as it is natural to a positive mind for an improbable theory one which is more probable and occasionally no doubt for one philosophic error or another in that early period i gave as i have said the first public expression to those theories of origin to which these essays are devoted but with a clumsiness which i was the last to conceal from myself for i was as yet cramped being still without a special language for these special subjects still frequently liable to relapse and to vacillation to go into details 
Compare what I say in Human All Too Human, Part 1, about the parallel early history of good and evil, aphorism 45, namely their origin from the castes of the aristocrats and the slaves, similarly aphorism 136, and so forth, concerning the birth and value of ascetic morality, similarly aphorisms 96, 99, volume 2, aphorism 89, concerning the morality of custom, that far older and more original kind of morality which is toto calo different from the altruistic ethics, in which Dr. Ray, like all English moral philosophers, sees the ethical thing in itself. Finally, aphorism 92. Similarly, aphorism 26 in Human All Too Human, part 2, and aphorism 112 in The Dawn of Day, concerning the origin of justice as a balance between persons of approximately equal power, equilibrium as the hypothesis of all contract, consequently of all law. Similarly, concerning the origin of punishment, human all too human, part two, aphorisms 22, 23, in regard to which the deterrent object is neither essential nor original, as Dr. Ray thinks, rather is it that this object is only an imported under certain definite conditions, and always is something extra and additional. 5. In reality, I had set my heart at that time on something much more important than the nature of the theories of myself or others concerning the origin of morality, or more precisely the real function from my view of these theories was to point an end to which they were one among many means. The issue for me was the value of morality. And on that subject, I had to place myself in a state of abstraction in which I was almost alone with my great teacher Schopenhauer, to whom that book, with all its passion and inherent contradiction, for that book was also a polemic, turned for present help as though he were still alive. The issue was, strangely enough, the value of the unegoistic instincts, the instincts of pity, self-denial and self-sacrifice which schopenhauer had so persistently painted in golden colors deified and etherealized that eventually they appeared to him as it were high and dry as intrinsic values in themselves on the strength of which he uttered both to life and to himself his own negation but against these very instincts there voiced itself in my soul a more and more fundamental mistrust a skepticism that dug even deeper and deeper, and in this very instinct I saw the great danger of mankind, its most sublime temptation and seduction. Seduction to what? To nothingness? In these very instincts I saw the beginning of the end, stability, the exhaustion that gazes backwards, the will turning against life the last illness announcing itself with its own mincing melancholy, I realized that the morality of pity which spread wider and wider, and whose grip infected even philosophers with its disease, was the most sinister symptom of our modern European civilization. I realized that it was the route along which that civilization slid on its way to a new Buddhism, a European Buddhism, nihilism, this exaggerated estimation in which modern philosophers have held pity is quite a new phenomenon. Up to the time, philosophers were absolutely unanimous as to the worthlessness of pity. I need only mention Plato, Spinoza, La Rochefoucauld, and Kant, four minds as mutually different as is possible, but united on one point, their contempt of pity. 6. This problem of the value of pity and of pity morality, I am an opponent of the modern infamous emasculation of our emotions, seems at the first blush a mere isolated problem, a note of interrogation for itself. He, however, who once halts at this problem and learns how to put questions will experience what I experienced. A new and immense vista unfolds itself before him. A sense of potentiality seizes him like a vertigo, Every species of doubt, mistrust, and fear springs up. The belief in morality, nay, in all morality, totters. Finally, a new demand voices itself. 
let us speak out of this new demand we need a critique of moral values the value of these values is for the first time to be called into question and for this purpose a knowledge is necessary of the conditions and circumstances out of which these values grew and under which they experienced their evolution and their distortion morality as a result as a symptom as a mask as tartuffism as disease as a misunderstanding but also a morality as a cause as a remedy as a stimulant as a fetter as a drug especially as such a knowledge has neither existed up to the present time nor is even now generally desired the value of these values was taken for granted as an indisputable fact which was beyond all question no one has up to the present exhibited the faintest doubt or hesitation in judging the good man to be of a higher value than the evil man or a higher value with regard specifically to human progress utility and prosperity generally not forgetting the future what suppose the converse were the truth what suppose there lurked in the good man a symptom of retrogression such as a danger a temptation a poison a narcotic by means of which the present battened on the future more comfortable and less risky perhaps than its opposite but also pettier meaner so that morality would really be saddled with the guilt if the maximum potentiality of the power and splendor of the human species were never to be attained so that really morality would be the danger of dangers seven enough that after this vista had disclosed itself to me i myself had reason to search for learned bold and industrious colleagues i am doing it even to this very day it means traversing with new clamorous questions and at the same time with new eyes the immense distance and completely unexplored land of morality of a morality which has actually existed and been actually lived and is this not practically equivalent to first discovering that land if in this context i thought amongst others of the aforesaid dr ray i did so because i had no doubt that from the very nature of his questions he would be compelled to have recourse to a truer method in order to obtain his answers have i deceived myself on that score i wished at all events to give a better direction of vision to an eye of such keenness and such impartiality i wish to direct him to the real history of morality and to warn him while there was yet time against a world of english theories that culminated in the blue vacuum of heaven other colors of course rise immediately to one's mind as being a hundred times more potent than blue for a genealogy of morals for instance gray by which i mean authentic facts capable of definite proof and having actually existed or to put it shortly the whole of that long hieroglyphic script which is so hard to decipher about the past history of human morals this script was unknown to dr ray but he had read darwin and so in his philosophy the darwinian beast and that pink of modernity the demure weakling and dilettante who bites no longer shake hands politely in a fashion that is at least instructive the latter exhibiting a certain facial expression of, of refined and good-humoured indolence tinged with a touch of pessimism and exhaustion as if really did not pay to take all these things i mean moral problems so seriously i on the other hand think that there are no subjects which pay better for being taken seriously part of this payment is that perhaps eventually they admit of being taken gaily this gaiety indeed or to use my own language this joyful wisdom is a payment a payment for a protracted brave laborious and burrowing seriousness which it goes without saying is the attribute of but a few but on that day on which we say from the fullness of our hearts forward our old morality too is fit material for comedy we shall have discovered a new plot and a new possibility for the dionysian drama entitled the soul's fate and he will speedily utilize it 
one can wager safely he the great ancient eternal dramatist of the comedy of our existence eight if this writing be obscure to any individuals and a jar on his ears i do not think that it is necessarily i who am to blame it is clear enough on the hypothesis which i presuppose namely that the reader has first read my previous writings and has not grudged them a certain amount of trouble it is not indeed a simple matter to get really at their essence take for instance my zarathustra i allow no one to pass muster as knowing that book unless every single word therein has at some point wrought in him a profound wound and at some time exercised on him a profound enchantment then and not till then can he enjoy the privilege of participating reverently in this halcyon element from which that work is born in its sunny brilliance its distance its spaciousness its certainty in other cases the aphoristic form produces difficulty but this is only because this form is treated too casually an aphorism properly coined and cast into its final mould is far from being deciphered as soon as it has been read on the contrary it is then that first requires to be expounded of course for that purpose an art of exposition is necessary the third essay in this book provides an example of what is offered of what in such cases i call exposition an aphorism is prefixed to that essay the essay itself is its commentary certainly one quality which nowadays has been best forgotten and that is why it will take some time yet for my writings to become readable is essential in order to practice reading as an art a quality for the exercise of which it is necessary to be a cow and under no circumstance a modern man rumination sils maria upper engadine july 1887. End of preface. Section 1 of The Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. First essay. Good and Evil, Good and Bad. Part 1. 1. Those English psychologists who up to the present are the only philosophers who are to be thanked for any endeavor to get as far as a history of the origin of morality these men i say offer us in their own personalities no paltry problem they even have if i am to be quite frank about it in their capacity of living riddles an advantage over their books they themselves are interesting these english psychologists what do they really mean we always find them voluntarily or involuntarily at the same task of pushing to the front of the parti honteuse of our in inner world and looking for the efficient governing and decisive principle in that precise quarter where the intellectual self-respect of the race would be the most reluctant to find it for example in the vis inertiae of habit or in forgetfulness or in a blind and fortuitous mechanism in the association of ideas or in some factor that is purely passive reflex molecular or fundamentally stupid what is the real motive power which always impels these psychologists in precisely this direction is it an instinct for human disparagement somewhat sinister vulgar and malignant or perhaps incomprehensible even to itself or perhaps a touch of pessimistic jealousy the mistrust of disillusioned idealists who have become gloomy poisoned and bitter or a petty subconscious enmity and rancor against christianity and plato that has conceivably never crossed the threshold of consciousness or just a vicious taste for those elements in life which are bizarre painfully paradoxical mystical and illogical or as a final alternative a dash of each of these motives a little vulgarity a little gloominess a little anti-christianity a little craving for the necessary piquancy but i am told that it is simply a case of old frigid and tedious frogs crawling and hopping around men and inside men as if they were th as thoroughly at home there as they would be in a swamp i am opposed to this statement nay i do not believe it 
And if, in the impossibility of knowledge, one is permitted to wish, so do I wish from my heart that just the converse metaphor should apply, and that these analysts with their psychological microscopes should be at bottom brave, proud, and magnanimous animals, who know how to bridle both their hearts and their smarts, and have specifically trained themselves to sacrifice what is desirable to what is true, any truth, in fact, even the simple, bitter, ugly, repulsive, unchristian, and immoral truths, for there are truths of that description. 2. All honor, then, to the noble spirits who would fain dominate these historians of morality, but it is certainly a pity that they lack the historical sense itself, that they themselves are quite deserted by all the beneficent spirits of history. The whole train of their thought runs, as was always the way of old-fashioned philosophers, on thoroughly unhistorical lines. There is no doubt on this point. The crass ineptitude of their genealogy of morals is immediately apparent when the question arises of ascertaining the origin of the idea and judgment of the good. Man had originally, so speaks their decree, praised and called good altruistic acts from the standpoint of those on whom they were conferred, that is, those to whom they were useful. Subsequently, the origin of this phrase was forgotten, and altruistic acts, simply because, as a sheer matter of habit, they were praised as good, came also to be felt as good, as though they contained in themselves some intrinsic goodness. The thing is obvious. This initial derivation contains already all the typical and idiosyncratic traits of English psychologists. We have utility, forgetting, habit, and finally error, the whole assemblage forming the basis of a system of values on which the higher man has up to the present prided himself as though it were a kind of privilege of man in general. This pride must be brought low. This system of values must lose its values. Is that attained? Now the first argument that comes ready to my hand is that the real homestead of the concept good is sought and located in the wrong place. The judgment good did not originate among those to whom goodness was shown. Much rather has it been the good themselves, that is, the aristocratic, the powerful, the high-stationed, the high-minded, who have felt that they themselves were good, and that their actions were good, that to say of the first order in contradistinction to all the low, the low-minded, the vulgar, and the plebeian, it was out of this pathos of distance that they first arrogated the right to create values for their own profit, and to coin the names of such values. What had they to do with utility? The standpoint of utility is as alien and as inapplicable as it could possibly be, when we have to deal with so volcanic an effervescence of supreme values, creating and demarcating as they do a hierarchy within themselves. It is at this juncture that one arrives at an appreciation of the contrast to that tepid temperature, which is the presupposition on which every combination of worldly wisdom and every calculation of practical expediency is always based, and not for one occasional, not for one exceptional instance, but chronically. The pathos of nobility and distance, as I have said, the chronic and despotic esprit de corps and fundamental instinct of a higher dominant race coming into association with a meaner race, an under race. This is the origin of the antithesis of good and bad. The master's right of giving names goes so far that it is permissible to look upon language itself as the expression of the power of masters. They say, this is that and that. They seal finally every object and every event with a sound, and thereby at the same time take possession of it. It is because of this origin that the word good is far from having any necessary connection with altruistic acts, in accordance with the superstitious belief of these moral philosophers. On the contrary, it is on the occasion of the decay of aristocratic values, that the antithesis between egoistic and altruistic presses more and more heavily on the human conscience. It is, to use my own language, the herd instinct which finds in this antithesis an expression in many ways. And even then it takes a considerable time for this instinct to become sufficiently dominant, for the valuation to be inextricably dependent on this antithesis, 
as is the case in contemporary Europe. For today the prejudice is predominant, which, acting even now with all the intensity of an obsession and brain disease, holds that moral, altruistic, and disinteresse are concepts of equal value. 3. In the second place, quite apart from the fact that this hypothesis as to the genesis of value good cannot be historically upheld, it suffers from an inherent psychological contradiction. The utility of altruistic conduct has presumably been the origin of its being praised, and this origin has become forgotten. But in what conceivable way is this forgetting possible? Has perchance the utility of such conduct ceased at some given moment? The contrary is the case. This utility has rather been experienced every day at all times, and is consequently a feature that obtains a new and regular emphasis with it every fresh day. It follows that, so far from vanishing from the consciousness, so far indeed from being forgotten, it must necessarily become impressed on the consciousness with ever-increasing distinctness. How much more logical is that contrary theory? It is not truer for that which is represented, for instance, by Herbert Spencer, who places the concept good as essentially similar to the concept useful, purposive, so that in the judgments good and bad, mankind is simply summarizing and investing with the sanction its unforgotten and unforgettable experiences concerning the useful purposive and the mischievous non-purposive. According to this theory, good is the attribute of that which has previously shown itself useful and so is able to claim to be considered valuable in the highest degree, valuable in itself. This method of explanation is also, as I have said, wrong, but at any rate, the explanation itself is coherent and psychologically tenable. 4. The guidepost which first put me on the right track was this question. What is the true etymological significance of the various symbols for the idea good, which have been coined in the various languages? I then found that they all led back to the same evolution of the same idea, that everywhere aristocrat, noble, in the social sense, is the root idea, out of which have necessarily developed good, in the sense of with aristocratic soul, noble, in the sense of with a soul of high caliber, with a privileged soul, a development which invariably runs parallel with that other evolution by which vulgar, plebeian, low are made to change finally into bad. The most eloquent proof of this last contention is the German word schlecht itself. This word is identical with schlecht, compare schlechtweg and schlechterdings, which originally and as yet without any sinister innuendo, simply denoted the plebeian man in contrast to the aristocratic man. It is at the sufficiently late period of the Thirty Years' War that this sense becomes changed to the sense now current. From the standpoint of the genealogy of morals, this discovery seems to be substantial. The lateness of it is to be attributed to the retarding influence exercised in the modern world by democratic prejudice in the sphere of all questions of origin. This extends, as will shortly be shown, even to the province of natural science and physiology, which prima facie is the most objective. The extent of the mischief which is caused by this prejudice, once it is free of all trammels except those of its own malice, particularly to ethics and history, is shown by the notorious case of Buckle. It was in Buckle that the plebeianism of the modern spirit, which is of English origin, broke out once again from its malignant soil with all the violence of a slimy volcano, and with that salted, rampant, and vulgar eloquence with which up to the present time all volcanoes have spoken. 5. With regard to our problem, which can justly be called an intimate problem, and which elects to appeal to only a limited number of years, it is of no small interest to ascertain that in those words and roots which denote good, we catch glimpses of that arch trait, on the strength of which the aristocrats feel themselves to be beings of a higher order than their fellows. Indeed, they call themselves in perhaps the most frequent instances simply after their superiority and power, for example, the powerful, the lords, the commanders, or after the most obvious sign of their superiority, as for example, the rich, the possessors, that is the meaning of aria, and the Iranian and Slav languages correspond. But they also call themselves after some characteristic idiosyncrasy. And this is the case which 
now concerns us they name themselves for instance the truthful this is first done by the greek nobility whose mouthpiece is found in theognis the megarian poet the word esthlos which is coined for the purpose signifies etymologically one who is who has reality who is real who is true and then with a the subjective twist the true as the truthful at this stage in the evolution of the idea it becomes the motto and party cry of the nobility and quite completes the transition to the meaning noble so as to place outside the pale the lying vulgar man as theognis conceives and portrays him till so finally the word after the decay of the nobility is left to delineate psychological noblesse and becomes as it were ripe and mellow in the words kakos and in dylos the plebeian in contrast to the agathos the cowardice is emphasized this affords perhaps an inkling on what lines the etymological origin of the very ambiguous agathos is to be investigated in the latin malus which i place side by side with melas the vulgar man can be distinguished as the dark colored and above all as the black haired hich niger est as the pre-aryan inhabitants of the italian soil whose complexion formed the clearest feature of distinction from the dominant blondes namely the aryan conquering race at any rate gaelic has afforded me the exact an analogue fin for instance in the name fingal the distinctive word of the nobility finally good noble clean but originally the blond-haired man in contrast to the dark black-haired aboriginals the celts if i may make a parenthetical statement were throughout a blonde race and it is wrong to connect as virchow still contends those traces of an essentially dark-haired population which are to be seen on the more elaborate ethnological maps of germany with any celtic ancestry or with any admixture of celtic blood it is in this context it is rather the pre-aryan population of germany which surges up to these districts the same is true substantially of the whole of europe in point of fact the subject race has finally again obtained the upper hand in complexion and the shortness of the skull and perhaps in the intellectual and social qualities who can guarantee that modern democracy still more modern anarchy and indeed that tendency to the commune the most primitive form of society which is now common to all the socialists in europe does not in its real essence signify a monstrous reversion and that the conquering and master race the aryan race is not also becoming inferior physiologically i believe that i can explain the latin bonus as the warrior my hypothesis is that i am right in deriving bonus from an older duonus compare bellum duellum duenlum in which the word duonu appears to be to be contained bonus accordingly as the man of discord of variance in zweiung, duo as the warrior one sees what in ancient rome the good meant for a man must not our actual german word gut mean the godlike the man of godlike race and be identical with the national name originally the noble's name of the goths the grounds for this supposition do not appertain to this work six above all there is no exception though there are opportunities for exceptions to this rule that the idea of political superiority always resolves itself into the idea of psychological superiority in those cases where the highest caste is at the same time the priestly caste and in accordance with its general characteristics confers on itself the privilege of a title which alludes specifically to its priestly function it is in these cases for instance that clean and unclean confront each other for the first time as badges of class distinction here again there develops a good and a bad in a sense which has ceased to be merely social moreover care should be taken not to take these ideas of clean and unclean too seriously too broadly or too symbolically all the ideas of ancient man have on the contrary got to be understood in their initial stages in a sense which is to an almost inconceivable extent crude coarse physical and narrow and above all essentially unsymbolical the clean man is originally only a man who washes himself who abstains from certain foods which are conducive to skin diseases who does not sleep with the unclean women of the lower classes who has a horror of blood not more not much more on the other hand 
The very nature of a priestly aristocracy shows the reasons why just at such an early juncture there should ensue a really dangerous sharpening and intensification of opposed values. It is, in fact, through these opposed values that gulfs and are cleft in the social plane, which a veritable Achilles of free thought would shudder to cross. There is from the outset a certain diseased taint in such sacerdotal aristocracies, and in the habits which prevail in such societies, habits which, averse as they are to action, constitute a compound of introspection and explosive emotionalism, as a result of which there appears that introspective morbidity and neurasthenia, which adheres almost inevitably to all priests at all times, with regard, however, to the remedy which they themselves have invented for this disease, the philosopher has no option but to state that it has proved itself and its effects a hundred times more dangerous than the disease, from which it should have been the deliverer. Humanity itself is still diseased from the effects of the naivetes of this priestly cure. Take, for instance, certain kinds of diet, abstention from flesh, fasts, sexual continence, flight into the wilderness, a kind of weir Mitchell isolation, though of course without that system of excessive feeding and fattening which is the most efficient antidote to all the hysteria of the ascetic ideal. Consider too the whole metaphysic of the priests, with its war on the senses, its enervation, its hair splitting. Consider its self-hypnotism on the fakir and brahman principles. It uses brahman as a glass disc in obsession, and that climax which we can understand only too well of an unusual satiety with its panacea of nothingness or god the demand for a unio mystica with god is the demand of the buddhist for nothingness nirvana and nothing else in sacerdotal societies every element is on a more dangerous scale not merely cures and remedies but also pride revenge cunning exultation love ambition virtue morbidity further it can fairly be stated that it is on the soil of this essentially dangerous form of human society the sacerdotal form that man really becomes for the first time an interesting animal that it is in this form that the soul of man has in a higher sense attained depths and become evil and those are the two fundamental forms of a superiority which up to the present man has exhibited over every other animal. 7. The reader will have already surmised with what ease the priestly mode of valuation can branch off from the knightly aristocratic mode, and then develop into the very antithesis of the latter. Special impetus is given to this opposition by every occasion when the castes of the priests and warriors confront each other with mutual jealousy and cannot agree over the prize the knightly aristocratic values are based on a careful cult of the physical on a flowering rich and even effervescing healthiness that goes considerably beyond what is necessary for maintaining life on war adventure the chase the dance the tourney on everything in fact which is contained in strong, free, and joyous action. The priestly aristocratic mode of valuation is, we have seen, based on other hypotheses. It is bad enough for this class when it is a question of war. Yet the priests are, as is notorious, the worst enemies. Why? Because they are the weakest. Their weakness causes their hate to expand into a monstrous and sinister shape, a shape which is most crafty and most poisonous. The really great haters in the history of the world have always been priests, who are also the cleverest haters. In comparison with the cleverness of priestly revenge, every other piece of cleverness is practically negligible. Human history would be too fatuous for anything were it not for the cleverness imported into it by the weak. Take at once the most important instance all the world's efforts against the aristocrats the mighty the masters the holders of power are negligible by comparison with what has been accomplished against those classes by the jews the jews that priestly nation which eventually realized that the one method of effecting satisfaction on its enemies and tyrants was by means of a radical transvaluation of values which was at the same time an act of the cleverest revenge Yet the method 
was only appropriate to a nation of priests to a nation of the most jealously nursed priestly revengefulness it was the jews who in opposition to the aristocratic equation good equals aristocratic equals beautiful equals happy equals loved by the gods dared with a terrifying logic to suggest the contrary equation and indeed to maintain with the teeth of the most profound hatred the hatred of weakness this contrary equation namely the wretched are alone the good the poor the weak the lowly are alone the good the suffering the needy the sick the loathsome are the only ones who are pious the only ones who are blessed for them alone is salvation but you on the other hand you aristocrats you men of power you are to all eternity the evil the horrible the covetous the insatiate the godless eternally also shall you be the unblessed the cursed the damned we know who it was who reaped the heritage of this jewish transvaluation in the context of the monstrous and inordinately fateful initiative which the jews have exhibited in connection with this most fundamental of all declarations of war i remember the passage which came to my pen on another occasion beyond good and evil aphorism one ninety five that it was in fact with the jews that the revolt of the slaves begins in the sphere of morals that revolt which has behind it a history of two millennia and which at the present day has only moved out of our sight because it has achieved victory eight but you understand this not you have no eyes for a force which has taken two thousand years to achieve victory there is nothing wonderful in this all lengthy processes are hard to see and to realize but this is what took place from the trunk of that tree of revenge and hate jewish hate that most profound and sublime hate which creates ideals and changes old values to new creations the like of which has never been on earth there grew a phenomenon which was equally incomparable a new love the most profound and sublime of all kinds of love and from what other trunk could it have grown but beware of supposing that this love has soared on its upward growth as in any way a real negation of that thirst for revenge as an antithesis to the jewish hate no the contrary is the truth this love grew out of that hate as its crown as its triumphant crown circling wider and wider amid the clarity and fullness of the sun and pursuing in the very kingdom of light and height its goal of hatred its victory its spoil its strategy with the same intensity with which the roots of that tree of hate sank into everything which was deep and evil with increasing stability and increasing desire this jesus of nazareth the incarnate gospel of the love this redeemer bringing salvation and victory to the poor the sick the sinful was he not really temptation in its most sinister and irresistible form temptation to take the tortuous path to those very jewish values and those very jewish ideals has not israel really obtained the final goal of its sublime revenge by the tortuous paths of this redeemer for all that he might pose as israel's adversary and israel's destroyer is it not due to the black magic of a really great policy of revenge of a far-seeing burrowing revenge both acting and calculating with slowness that israel himself must repudiate before all the world the actual instrument of his own revenge and nail it to the cross so that all the world that is all the enemies of israel could nibble without suspicion at this very bait could moreover any human mind with all its elaborate ingenuity invent a bait that was more than truly dangerous anything that was even equivalent in the power of its seductive intoxicating defiling and corrupting influence to that symbol of the holy cross to that awful paradox of a god on the cross to that mystery of the unthinkable supreme and utter horror of the self-crucifixion of a god for the salvation of man it is at least certain that sub hoc signo israel 
with its revenge and transvaluation of all values, has up to the present always triumphed again over all other ideals, over all more aristocratic ideals. 9. But why do you talk of nobler ideals? Let us submit to the facts that people have triumphed, or the slaves, or the populace, or the herd, or whatever name you care to give them. If this has happened through the Jews, so be it. In that case, no nation ever had a greater mission in the world's history. The masters have been done away with. The morality of the vulgar has triumphed. This triumph may also be called a blood poisoning. It has mutually fused the races. I do not dispute it. But there is no doubt but that this intoxication has succeeded. The redemption of the human race, that is, from the masters, is progressing swimmingly everything is obviously becoming judaized or christianized or vulgarized what is there in the words it seems impossible to stop the course of this poisoning through the whole body politic of mankind but its tempo and pace may from the present time be slower more delicate quieter more discreet there is time enough in view of this context has the church nowadays any necessary purpose has it in fact a right to live or could man get on without it query tour it seems that it fetters and retards this tendency instead of accelerating it well even that might be its utility the church certainly is a crude and boorish institution that is repugnant to an intelligence with any pretense of delicacy to a really modern taste should it not at any rate learn to be somewhat more subtle it alienates nowadays more than it allures. Which of us would, forsooth, be a free thinker if there were no church? It is the church which repels us, not its poison. Apart from the church, we are like the poison. This is the epilogue of a free thinker to my discourse, of an honorable animal, as he has been given abundant proof, and a democrat to boot. He had up to that time listened to me and could not endure my silence but for me indeed with regard to this topic there is much on which to be silent ten the revolt of the slaves in morals begins in the very principle of resentment becoming creative and giving birth to values a resentment experienced by creatures who deprived as they are of the proper outlet of action are forced to find their compensation in an imaginary revenge while every aristocratic morality springs from a triumphant affirmation of its own demands the slave morality says no from the very outset to what is outside itself different from itself and not itself and this no is its creative deed this volte face of the valuing standpoint this inevitable gravitation to the objective instead of back to the subjective is typical of resentment the slave morality requires as the condition of its existence an external and objective world. To employ physiological terminology, it requires objective stimuli to be capable of action at all. Its action is fundamentally a reaction. The contrary is the case when we come to the aristocrat system of values. It acts and grows spontaneously. It merely seeks its antithesis in order to pronounce a more grateful and exultant yes to its own self its negative conception low vulgar bad is merely a pale late-born foil in comparison with its positive and fundamental conception saturated as it is with life and passion of we aristocrats we good ones we beautiful ones we happy ones when the aristocratic morality goes astray and commits sacrilege on reality this is limited to that particular sphere with which it is not sufficiently acquainted a sphere in fact from the real knowledge of which it disdainfully defends itself it misjudges in some cases the sphere which it despises the sphere of the common vulgar man and the low people on the other hand due weight should be given to the consideration that in any case the mood of contempt of disdain of superciliousness even on the supposition that it falsely portrays the object of its contempt will always be far removed from that degree of falsity which will always characterize the attacks in effigy of course of the vindictive hatred and revengefulness of the weak in onslaughts on their enemies in point of fact 
there is in contempt too strong an admixture of nonchalance of casualness of boredom of impatience even of personal exultation for it to be capable of distorting its victim into a real caricature or a real monstrosity attention again should be paid to the almost benevolent nuances which for instance the greek nobility imports into all the words by which it distinguishes the common people from itself note how continuously a kind of pity care and consideration imparts its honeyed flavor until at last almost all the words which are applied to the vulgar man survive finally as expressions for unhappy worthy of pity compare dylos dylaios poneros mokthaeros the latter two names really denoting the vulgar man as labor slave and beast of burden and how conversely bad low unhappy have never ceased to ring in the greek ear with a tone in which unhappy is the predominant note this is a heritage of the old noble aristocratic morality which remains true to itself even in contempt let philologists remember the sense in which oitsuros anolebos klemon dustekain xumora used to be employed the well-born simply felt themselves the happy they did not have to manufacture their happiness artificially through looking at their enemies or in cases to talk and lie themselves into happiness as is the custom with all resentful men and similarly complete men as they were exuberant with strength and consequently necessarily energetic they were too wise to dissociate happiness from action activity becomes in their minds necessarily counted as happiness that is the etymology of oi pratain all in sharp contrast to the happiness of the weak and the oppressed with their festering venom and malignity among whom happiness appears essentially as a narcotic a deadening a quietude a peace a sabbath an enervation of the mind and relaxation of the limbs in short a purely passive phenomenon while the aristocratic man lived in confidence and openness with himself Geneos, noble-born emphasizes the nuance sincere and perhaps also naive the resentful man on the other hand is neither sincere nor naive nor honest and candid with himself his soul squints his mind loves hidden crannies tortuous paths and back doors everything secret appeals to him as his world his safety his balm he is past master in silence in not forgetting in waiting in provisional self-depreciation and self-abasement a race of such resentful men will of necessity eventually prove more prudent than any aristocratic race it will honor prudence on quite a distinct scale as in fact a paramount condition of existence while prudence among aristocratic men is apt to be tinged with a delicate flavor of luxury and refinement so among them it plays nothing like so integral a part as that complete certainty of function of the governing unconscious instincts or as indeed a certain lack of prudence such as vehement and valiant charge whether against danger or the enemy or as those ecstatic bursts of rage love reverence gratitude by which at all times noble souls have recognized each other when the resentment of the aristocratic man manifests itself it fulfills and exhausts itself in an immediate reaction and consequently instills no venom on the other hand it never manifests itself at all in countless instances when in the case of the feeble and weak it would be inevitable an inability to take seriously for any length of time their enemies their disasters their misdeeds that is the sign of the full strong natures who possess a superfluity of moulding plastic force that heals completely and produces forgetfulness a good example of this in the modern world is mirabeau who had no memory for any insults and meannesses which were practiced on him and who was only incapable of forgiving because he forgot such a man indeed shakes off with the shrug many a worm which would have buried itself in another it is only in characters like these that we see the possibility supposing of course that there is such a possibility in the world of the real love of one's enemies what respect for the, his enemies is found forsooth in an aristocratic man and such reverence is already a bridge to love he insists on having his enemy to himself as his distinction 
he tolerates no other enemy but a man in whose character there is nothing to despise and much to honor on the other hand imagine the enemy as the resentful man conceives him and it is here exactly that we see his work his creativeness he has conceived the evil enemy the evil one and indeed that is the root idea from which he now evolves as a contrasting and corresponding figure a good one himself his very self end of section one section two of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche translated by horace b samuel first essay good and evil good and bad part two eleven the method of this man is quite contrary to that of the aristocratic man who conceives the root idea good spontaneously and straight away that is to say out of himself and from that material then creates for himself a concept of bad this bad of aristocratic origin and that evil out of the cauldron of unsatisfied hatred the former an imitation an extra an additional nuance the latter on the other hand the original the beginning the essential act in the conception of a slave morality these two words bad and evil how great a difference do they mark in spite of the fact that they have an identical contrary in the idea good but the idea good is not the same much rather let the question be asked who is really evil according to the meaning of the morality of resentment in all sternness let it be answered thus just the good man of the other morality just the aristocrat the powerful one the one who rules but who is distorted by the venomous eye of resentfulness into a new color a new signification a new appearance this particular point we would be the last to deny the man who learnt to know those good ones only as enemies learnt at the same time not to know them only as evil enemies and the same men who inter pares were kept so rigorously in bounds through convention respect custom and gratitude though much more through mutual vigilance and jealousy inter pares these men who in their relations with each other find so many new ways of manifesting consideration self-control delicacy loyalty pride and friendship these men are in reference to what is outside their circle where the foreign element of foreign country begins not much better than beasts of prey which have been let loose they enjoy their freedom from all social control they feel that in the wilderness they can give vent with impunity to that tension which is produced by enclosure and imprisonment in the peace of society they revert to the innocence of the beast of prey conscience like jubilant monsters who perhaps come from a ghostly bout of murder arson rape and torture with bravado and a moral equanimity as though merely some wild student's prank has been played perfectly convinced that the poets have now an ample theme to sing and celebrate it is impossible not to recognize at the core of all these aristocratic races the beast of prey the magnificent blonde brute avidly rampant for spoil and victory this hidden core needed an outlet from time to time the beast must get loose again must return into the wilderness the roman arabic german and japanese nobility the homeric heroes the scandinavian vikings are all alike in this need it is the aristocratic races who have left the idea barbarian on all the tracks in which they have marched nay a consciousness of this very barbarianism and even a pride in it manifests itself even in their highest civilization for example when pericles says to his athenians in that celebrated funeral oration our audacity has forced away over every land and sea rearing everywhere imperishable memorials of itself for good and for evil this audacity of aristocratic races mad absurd and spasmodic as may be its expression the incalculable and fantastic nature of their enterprises pericles sets in special relief and glory the haramuthia of the athenians their nonchalance and contempt for safety body life and comfort their awful joy and intense delight in all destruction in all the ecstasies of victory and cruelty all these features become crystallized 
for those who suffer thereby in the picture of the barbarian of the evil enemy perhaps of the goth and of the vandal the profound icy mistrust which the german provokes as soon as he arrives at power even at the present time is always still an aftermath of that inextinguishable horror with which for whole centuries europe has regarded the wrath of the blonde teuton beast although between the old germans and ourselves there exists scarcely a psychological let alone a physical relationship i have once called attention to the embarrassment of hesiod when he conceived the series of social ages and endeavored to express them in gold silver and bronze he could only dispose of the contradiction with which he was confronted by the homeric world an age magnificent indeed but at the same time so awful and so violent by making two ages out of one which he henceforth placed one behind the other first the age of the heroes and demigods as that world had remained in the memories of the aristocratic families who found therein their own ancestors secondly the bronze age as that corresponding age appeared to the descendants of the oppressed spoiled ill-treated exiled enslaved namely as an age of bronze as i have said hard cold terrible without feelings and without conscience crushing everything and bespattering everything with blood granted the truth of the theory now believed to be true that the very essence of all civilization is to train out of man the beast of prey a tame and civilized animal a domesticated animal it follows indubitably that we must regard as the real tools of civilization all those instincts of reaction and resentment by the help of which the aristocratic races together with their ideals were finally degraded and overpowered though that has not yet come to be synonymous with saying that the bearers of those tools also represented the civilization it is rather the contrary that is not only probable nay it is palpable today these bearers of vindictive instincts that have to be bottled up these descendants of all european and non-european slavery especially of the pre-aryan population these peoples i say represent the decline of humanity these tools of civilization are a disgrace to humanity and constitute in reality more of an argument against civilization more of a reason why civilization should be suspected one may be perfectly justified in being always afraid of the blonde beast that lies at the core of all aristocratic races and in being on one's guard but who would not a hundred times prefer to be afraid when one at the same time admires than to be immune from fear at the cost of being perpetually obsessed with a loathsome spectacle of the distorted the dwarfed the stunted the envenomed and is that not our fate what produces today our repulsion toward man for we suffer from man there is no doubt about it it is not fear it is rather that we have nothing more to fear from men it is that the worm man is in the foreground and pululates it is that the tame man the wretched mediocre and unedifying creature has learned to consider himself a goal and a pinnacle an inner meaning an historic principle a higher man yes it is that he has a certain right so to consider himself in so far as he feels that in contrast to that excess of deformity disease exhaustion and effeteness whose odor is beginning to pollute present-day europe he at any rate has achieved a relative success he at any rate still says yes to life twelve i cannot refrain at this juncture from uttering a sigh and one last hope what is it precisely which i find intolerable that which i alone cannot get rid of which makes me choke and faint bad air bad air that something misbegotten comes near me that i must inhale the odor of the entrails of a misbegotten soul that accepted what can one not endure in the way of need privation bad weather sickness toil solitude in point of fact one manages to get over everything born as one is to a burrowing and battling existence one always returns once again to the light one always lives again one's golden hour of victory and then one stands as one was born 
unbreakable tense ready for something more difficult for something more distant like a bow stretched but tauter by every strain but from time to time do ye grant me assuming that beyond good and evil there are goddesses who can grant one glimpse grant me but one glimpse only of something perfect fully realized happy mighty triumphant of something that still gives cause for fear a glimpse of a man that justifies the existence of man a glimpse of an incarnate human happiness that realizes and redeems for the sake of which one may hold fast to the belief in man for the position is this in the dwarfing and leveling of the european man lurks our greatest peril for it is this outlook which fatigues we see to-day nothing which wishes to be greater we surmise that the process is always still backwards still backwards towards something more attenuated more inoffensive more cunning more comfortable more mediocre more indifferent more chinese more christian man there is no doubt about it grows always better the destiny of europe lies even in this that in losing the fear of man we have also lost the hope in man yea the will to be man the sight of man now fatigues what is present-day nihilism if it is not that we are tired of man thirteen but let us come back to it the problem of another origin of the good of the good as the resentful man has thought it out demands its solution it is not surprising that the lamb should bear a grudge against the great birds of prey but that is no reason for blaming the great birds of prey for taking the little lambs and when the lambs say among themselves those birds of prey are evil and he who is as far removed from being a bird of prey who is rather its opposite a lamb is he not good then there is nothing to cavil at in the setting up of this ideal though it may be also that the birds of prey will regard it as a little sneeringly and perchance say that to themselves we bear no grudge against them these good lambs we even like them nothing is tastier than a tender lamb to require of strength that it should not express itself as strength that it should not be a wish to overpower a wish to overthrow a wish to become master a thirst for enemies and antagonisms and triumphs is just as absurd as to require of weakness that it should express itself as strength a quantum of force is just such a quantum of movement will action rather it is nothing else than just those very phenomena of moving willing acting and can only appear otherwise in the misleading errors of language and the fundamental fallacies of reason which have become petrified therein which understands and understands wrongly all working as conditioned by a worker by a subject and just exactly as the people separate the lightning from the flash and interpret the latter as a thing done as the working of a subject which is called lightning so also does the popular morality separate strength from the expression of strength as though behind the strong man there existed some indifferent neutral substratum which enjoyed a caprice and option as to whether or not it should express strength but there is no such substratum there is no being behind doing working becoming the doer is a mere appendage to the action the action is everything in point of fact the people duplicate the doing when they make the lightning lighten that is a doing doing they make the same phenomenon first a cause and then secondly the effect of that cause the scientists fail to improve uh, matters when they say force moves force causes and so on our whole science is still in spite of all its coldness of all its freedom from passion a dupe of the tricks of language and has never succeeded in getting rid of that superstitious changeling the subject the atom to give another instance is just such a changeling just as the kantian thing in itself what wonder if the suppressed and stealthily simmering passions of revenge and hatred exploit for their own advantage their belief and indeed hold no belief with a more steadfast enthusiasm than this that the strong has the option of being weak and the bird of prey of being a lamb thereby do they win for themselves the right of attributing to the birds of prey the responsibility for being birds of prey when the oppressed downtrodden and overpowered say to themselves with a vindictive guile of weakness let us be otherwise than evil namely good 
and good is every one who does not oppress who hurts no one who does not attack who does not pay back who hands over revenge to god who holds himself as we do in hiding who goes out of the way of evil and demands in short little from life like ourselves the patient the meek the just yet all this in its cold and unprejudiced interpretation means nothing more than once for all the weak are weak it is good to do nothing for which we are not strong enough but this dismal state of affairs this prudence of the lowest order which even insects possess which in a great danger are fain to sham death so as to avoid doing too much has thanks to the counterfeiting and self-deception of weakness come to masquerade in the pomp of an ascetic mute and expectant virtue just as though the very weakness of the weak that is forsooth its being its working its whole unique inevitable inseparable reality were a voluntary result something wished chosen a deed an act of merit this kind of man finds the belief in a neutral free choosing subject necessary from an instinct of self-preservation of self-assertion in which every lie is fain to sanctify itself the subject or to use popular language the soul has perhaps proved itself the best dogma in the world simply because it rendered possible to the horde of mortal weak and oppressed individuals of every kind that most sublime specimen of self-deception the interpretation of weakness as freedom of being this or being that as merit fourteen will any one look a little into right into the mystery of how ideals are manufactured in this world who has the courage to do it come here we have a vista opened in these grimy workshops wait just a moment dear mr inquisitive and foolhardy your eye must first grow accustomed to this false changing light yes enough now speak what is happening below down yonder speak out tell what you see man of the most dangerous curiosity for now i am the listener i see nothing i hear the more it is a cautious spiteful gentle whispering and muttering together in all the corners and crannies it seems to me that they are lying a sugary softness adheres to every sound weakness is turned to merit there is no doubt about it it is just as you say further and the impotence which requites not is turned to goodness craven baseness to meekness submission to those whom one hates to obedience namely obedience to one of whom they say that he ordered this submission they call him god the inoffensive character of the weak the very cowardice in which he is rich his standing at the door his forced necessity of waiting gain here fine names such as patience which is also called virtue not being able to avenge oneself is called not wishing to avenge oneself perhaps even forgiveness for they know not what they do we alone know what they do they also talk of the love of their enemies and sweat thereby further they are miserable there is no doubt about it all these whisperers and counterfeiters in the corners although they try to get warm by crouching close to each other but they tell me that their misery is a favor and distinction given to them by god just as one beats the dog one likes best that perhaps this misery is also a preparation a probation a training that perhaps it is still more something which will one day be compensated and paid back with a tremendous interest in gold nay in happiness they call this blessedness further they are now giving me to understand that not only are they better men than the mighty the lords of the earth whose spittle they have to lick not out of fear not at all out of fear but because god ordains that one should honor all authority not only are they better men but that they also have a better time at any rate will one day have a better time but enough enough i can endure it no longer bad air bad air these workshops where ideals are manufacturers verily they reek with the crassest lies nay just one minute you are saying nothing about the masterpieces of these virtuosos of black magic who can produce whiteness milk and innocence out of any black you like have you not noticed what a pitch of refinement is attained by the chef d'oeuvre the most audacious subtle ingenious and lying artist trick take care these cellar beasts full of revenge and hate 
what do they make forsooth out of their revenge and hate do you hear those words would you suspect if you trusted only their words that you are among men of resentment and nothing else i understand i prick my ears up again ah 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 i hold up my nose now do i hear for the first time that which they have said so often we good we are the righteous what they demand they call not revenge but the triumph of righteousness what they hate is not their enemy no they hate unrighteousness godlessness what they believe in and hope is not the hope of revenge the intoxication of sweet revenge sweeter than honey did comer call it but the victory of god of the righteous god over the godless what is left for them to love in this world is not their brothers in hate but their brothers in love as they say all the good and righteous on the earth and how do they name that which serves them as a solace against all the troubles of life their phantasmagoria of their anticipated future blessedness how do i hear right they call it the last judgment the advent of their kingdom the kingdom of god but in the meanwhile they live in faith in love in hope enough enough fifteen in the faith in what in the love for what in the hope of what these weaklings they also forsooth wish to be strong some time there is no doubt about it some time their kingdom also must come the kingdom of god is their name for it as has been mentioned they are so meek in everything yet in order to experience that kingdom it is necessary to live long to live beyond death yes eternal life is necessary so that one can make up forever for that earthly life in faith in love in hope make up for what make up by what dante as it seems to me made a crass mistake when with awe-inspiring ingenuity he placed that inscription over the gate in his hell me too made eternal love at any rate the following inscription would have a much better right to stand over the gate of the christian paradise in its eternal blessedness me too made eternal hate granted of course that a truth may rightly stand over the gate to a lie for what is the blessedness of that paradise possibly we could quickly surmise it but it is better that it should be explicitly attested by an authority who in such matters is not only to be disparaged thomas of aquinas the great teacher and saint beati in regno celesti says he as gently as a lamb vide bunt peanus damnatorum ut beadito ilius magis compliciat or if we wish to hear a stronger tone a word from the mouth of a triumphant father of the church who warned his disciples against the cruel ecstasies of the public spectacles but why faith offers us much more says he de spectac chapter twenty nine following something much stronger thanks to the redemption joys of quite another kind stand at our disposal instead of athletes we have our martyrs we wish for blood well we have the blood of christ but what then awaits us on the day of his return of his triumph and then does he proceed does this enraptured visionary at enum supersunt alia spectacula ille ultimus et perpetuus judici dies ille nationabus insperatus ille derisus cum tanta sceculi vestustas et tot ejus nativitates uno igne hariuntur quae tunc spectaculi latido quid admirere quid ridcam ubi gaudeam ubi exultem spectans tot et tantos regnes qui in caelum recepti nuntiabor cum ipso jove et upses tuis testibus in imis tenebris congimenses item presides the provisional governors persecutores dominici nominis seviborus quam ipsi flamis severint insulatibus contra cristelos liquiscentes cos preteria sapientes illus philosophos corum disculipus suis una conflaglitibus erubedcentes quibus nihil ad deum pertinere suadebant quibus animas aut nullas aut non in pristina corpora rediturus affirmabant etiam poetas non an 
radamanti nec an minios sed ad inobinati christi tribunal palpitantes tuc magis tragiodi audiendi magis scilicet vocales with louder tones and more violent shrieks in sua propria calamitate tunc histriones cognoscende solutiores multiple ignem tunc spectandus origa inflamia rota totis rubens tunc existi contemplandi non in gymnasis sed in igne jaculati nisi quodne tunc quidem illos velem vivos ud qui malem ad eos proteus conspecnum in satadie bilem conferre qui in dominum severivrunt hi est illes dicam fabri aut quotie storiae filius as is shown by the whole of the following and in particular by this well-known description of the mother of jesus from the talmud tertullian is adherence forth referring to the jews sabati destructor samaritis et demonium habens hic est quem a juda redemnites hic est ille arundine et colafis de vertebalas sputamentis de decoratas fele et accento potatus hic est quem clanu discente sublipurunt et resurrexisse di catar vel hortalanus detraxit net lacuto sue frequentia commentiam ledienrentur ut talia spectes ut talibus exultis quis tibi pretur at consul aut sacerdos de sua liberala tete presitipunt et tamen hoc iam hebimus codamundo per fidem spiritu imaginante representata ceterum qualia ilia sunt quae nec oculus vidit nec auris audivit nec in cor homines ascelederunt credo circo et ultraque cavia first and fourth row or according to others the comic and the tragic stage et omni studio gratiore perfidem so stands it written sixteen let us come to a conclusion the two opposing values good and bad good and evil have fought a dreadful thousand-year fight in the world and though indubitably the second value has been for a long time in the preponderance there are not wanting places where the fortune of the fight is still undecisive it can almost be said that in the meanwhile the fight reaches a higher and higher level and that in the meanwhile it has become more and more intense and always more and more psychological so that nowadays there is perhaps no more decisive mark of the higher nature of the more psychological nature than to be in that sense self-contradictory and to be actually still a battleground for those two opposites the symbol of this fight written in a writing which has remained worthy of perusal throughout the course of history up to the present time is called rome against judea judea against rome hitherto there has been no greater event than that fight the putting of that question that deadly antagonism rome found in the jew the incarnation of the unnatural as though it were its diametrically opposed monstrosity and in rome the jew was held to be convicted of hatred of the whole human race and rightly so in so far as it is right to link the well-being and the future of the human race to the unconditional mastery of the aristocratic values of the roman values what conversely did the jews feel against rome one can surmise it from a thousand symptoms but it is sufficiently to carry one's mind back to the johannian apocalypse that most obscene of all the written outbursts which has revenge on its conscience one should also appraise at its full value the profound logic of the christian instinct when over this very book of hate it wrote the name of the disciple of love 
that self-same disciple to whom it attributed that impassioned and ecstatic gospel therein lurks a portion of truth however much literary foraging may have been necessary for this purpose the romans were the strong and aristocratic a nation stronger and more aristocratic has never existed in the world has never even been dreamed of every relic of them every inscription in raptures granted that one can divine what it is that writes the inscription the jews conversely were that priestly nation of resentment par excellence possessed by a unique genius for popular morals just compare with the jews the nation with analogous gifts such as the chinese or the germans so as to realize afterwards what is first rate and what is fifth rate which of them has been provisionally victorious rome or judea but there is not a shadow of a doubt just consider to whom in rome itself nowadays you bow down as though before the quintessence of all the highest values and not only in rome but almost over half the world everywhere where man has been tamed or is about to be tamed to three jews as we know and one jewess to jesus of nazareth to peter the fisher to paul the tent maker and to the mother of the aforesaid jesus namely mary this is very remarkable rome is undoubtedly defeated at any rate there took place in the renaissance a brilliant sinister revival of the classical ideal of the aristocratic valuation of all things rome herself like a man waking up from a trance stirred beneath the burden of the new judaized rome that had been built over her which presented the appearance of an ecumenical synagogue and was called the church but immediately judaic triumphed again thanks to that fundamentally popular german and english moment of the revenge which is called the reformation and taking also into account its inevitable corollary the restoration of the church the restoration also of the ancient graveyard peace of classical rome judea proved yet once more victorious over the classical ideal in the french revolution and in a sense which was even more crucial and even more profound the last political aristocracy that existed in europe that of the french seventeenth and eighteenth centuries broke into pieces beneath the instincts of a resentful populace never had the world heard a greater jubilation a more uproarious enthusiasm indeed there took place in the midst of it the most monstrous and unexpected phenomenon the ancient ideal itself swept before the eyes and conscience of humanity with all its life and with unheard-of splendor and in opposition to resentment's lying war cry of the prerogative of the most in opposition to the will of the lowliness abasement and equalization the will to a retrogression and twilight of humanity there rang out once again stronger simpler more penetrating than ever the terrible and enchanting counter war cry of the prerogative of the few like a final signpost to the other ways there appeared napoleon the most unique and violent anachronism that ever existed and in him the incarnate problem of the aristocratic ideal in itself consider well what a problem it is napoleon that synthesis of monster and superman seventeen was it therewith over was that greatest of all antitheses of ideals thereby relegated ad acta for all time or only postponed postponed for a long time may there not take place at some time or other a much more awful much more carefully prepared flaring up of the old conflagration further should not one wish that consummation with all one's strength will it oneself demand it of oneself he who at this juncture begins like my readers to reflect to think further will have difficulty in coming quickly to a conclusion ground enough for me to come myself to a conclusion taking it for granted that for some time past what i mean has been sufficiently clear what i exactly mean by that dangerous motto which is inscribed on the body of my last book beyond good and evil at any rate that is not the same as beyond good and bad note i avail myself of the opportunity offered by this treatise to express openly and formally a wish which up to the present has only been expressed in occasional conversations with scholars namely that some faculty of philosophy should by means of a series of prize essays gain the glory of having promoted the further study of the history of morals perhaps this book may serve to give a forcible impetus in such a direction with regard to a possibility of this character the following question deserves consideration and merits quite as much the attention of philologists and historians as actual professional philosophers 
What indication of the history of the evolution of morals is afforded by philology and especially by etymological investigation? On the other hand, it is of course equally necessary to induce physiologists and doctors to be interested in these problems, of the value of the valuations which have been prevailed up to the present. In this connection, the professional philosophers may be trusted to act as the spokesmen in the intermediaries in these particular instances after of course they have quite succeeded in transforming the relationship between philosophy and physiology and medicine which is originally one of coldness and suspicion into the most friendly and fruitful reciprocity in point of fact all tables of values all the thou shalts known to history and ethnology need primarily a physiological at any rate in preference to a psychological elucidation and interpretation all equally require a critique from medical science the question what is the value of this or that table of values and morality will be asked from the most varied standpoints for instance the question of valuable for what can never be analyzed with sufficient nicety that for instance which would evidently have value with regard to promoting and erase the greatest possible powers of endurance or with regard to increasing its adaptability to a specific climate or with regard to the preservation of the greatest number, would have nothing like the same value if it were a question of evolving a stronger species. Engaging values, the good of the majority and the good of the minority are opposed standpoints. We leave it to the naivete of English biologists to regard the former standpoint as intrinsically superior. All the sciences have now to pave the way for the future task of the philosopher, this task being understood to mean that he must solve the problem of value that he has to fix the hierarchy of values end of section two section three of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche translated by horace b samuel second essay guilt banned conscience and the like part one one the breeding of an animal that can promise is not this just the very paradox of a task which nature has set itself in regard to man is not this the very problem of man the fact that this problem has been to a great extent solved must appear all the more phenomenal to one who can estimate at its full value that force of forgetfulness which works in opposition to it forgetfulness is no mere vis inertiae as the superficial believes Rather, it is a power responsible for the fact that what we have lived, experienced, taken into ourselves, no more enters into consciousness during the process of digestion, and might be called psychic absorption, than all the whole manifold process by which our physical nutrition, the so-called incorporation, is carried on. The temporary shutting of the doors and windows of consciousness, the relief from the clamant alarums and excursions with which our subconscious world of servant organs works in mutual cooperation and antagonism a little quietude a little tabula rasa of the consciousness so as to make room again for the new and above all for the more noble functions and functionaries room for government foresight predetermination for our organism is on an oligarchic model this is the utility, as I have said, of the active forgetfulness, which is a very sentinel and nurse of psychic order, repose, etiquette. And this shows at once why it is that there can exist no happiness, no gladness, no hope, no pride, no real present without forgetfulness. The man in whom this preventative apparatus is damaged and discarded is to be compared to a dyspeptic, and it is something more than a comparison. He can get rid of nothing. But this very animal who finds it necessary to be forgetful in whom in fact forgetfulness re represents a force and a form of robust health has reared for himself an opposition power a memory with whose help forgetfulness is in certain instances kept in check in the cases namely where promises have to be made so that it is by no means a mere passive inability to get rid of a once indented impression not merely the indigestion occasioned by a once pledged word which one cannot dispose of but an active refusal to get rid of it a continuing and a wish to continue what had once been willed an actual memory of the will 
so that between the original I will, I shall do, and the actual discharge of the will, its act, we can easily interpose a world of new strange phenomena, circumstances, veritable volitions, without snapping of this long chain of the will. But what is the underlying hypothesis of all this? How thoroughly, in order to be able to regulate the future in this way, must man have first learned to distinguish between necessitated and accidental phenomena, to think causally, to see the distant as present and to anticipate it, to fix with certainty what is the end and what is the means to that end, above all to reckon, to have power to calculate, how thoroughly must man have first become calculable, disciplined, necessitated even for himself and his own conception of himself, that, like a man entering a promise, he could guarantee himself as a future. 2. This is simply the long history of the origin of responsibility. That task of breeding an animal which can make promises and includes, as we have already grasped, as its condition and preliminary, the more immediate task of first making man to a certain extent necessitated, uniform, like among his like, regular and consequently calculable. The immense work of what I have called morality of custom, compare dawn of day aphorisms nine fourteen and sixteen the actual work of man on himself during the longest period of the human race his whole prehistoric work find its meaning its great justification in spite of all its innate hardness despotism stupidity and idiocy in this fact man with the help of the morality of customs and of social straight waistcoats was made genuinely calculable if, however, we place ourselves at the end of this colossal process, at the point where the tree finally matures its fruits, when society and its morality of custom finally bring to light that to which it was only the means, then do we find as the ripest fruit on its tree the sovereign individual that resembles only himself, that has got loose from the morality of custom, the autonomous super-moral individual, for autonomous and moral are mutually exclusive terms, in short, the man of the personal, long, and independent will, competent to promise, and we find in him a proud consciousness, vibrating in every fiber, of what has been at last achieved and become vivified in him, a genuine consciousness of power and freedom, a feeling of human perfection in general. And this man who has grown to freedom, who is really competent to promise, this lord of the free will, this sovereign, how is it possible for him not to know how great is his superiority over everything incapable of binding itself by promises, or of being its own security? How great is the trust, the awe, the reverence that he awakes? He deserves all three, not to know that with this mastery over himself he is necessarily also given to mastery over circumstances, over nature, over all creatures with shorter wills, less reliable characters. The free man, the owner of a long, unbreakable will, finds in this possession his standard of value. Looking out from himself upon the others he honors, or he despises, and just as necessarily as he honors his peers, the strong and the reliable, those who can bind themselves by promises, that is, every one who promises like a sovereign, with difficulty, rarely and slowly, who is sparing with his trusts, but confers honor by the very fact of trusting, who gives his word as something that can be relied on, because he knows himself strong enough to keep it even in the teeth of disasters, even in the teeth of fate. So, with equal necessity, will he have the heel of his foot ready for the lean and empty jackasses, who promise when they have no business to do so, and his rod of chastisement ready for the liar, who already breaks his word at the very minute when it is on his lips. The proud knowledge of the extraordinary privilege of responsibility, the consciousness of this rare freedom, of this power over himself and over fate, has sunk right down to his innermost depths, and has become an instinct, a dominating instinct. What name will he give to it, to this dominating instinct, if he needs to have a word for it, but there is no doubt about it. The sovereign man calls it his conscience. 3. His conscience? One apprehends at once that the idea conscience, which is here seen in its supreme manifestation, supreme in fact to almost the point of strangeness, 
should already have behind it a long history and evolution. The ability to guarantee oneself with all due pride, and also at the same time to say yes to oneself, that is, as has been said, a ripe fruit, but also a late fruit. How long must needs this fruit hang sour and bitter on the tree? And for an even longer period there was not a glimpse of such a fruit to be had. No one had taken it upon himself to promise it, although everything on the tree was quite ready for it, and everything was maturing for that very consummation. How is a memory to be made for the man-animal? How is an impression to be so deeply fixed upon this ephemeral understanding, half dense and half silly, upon this incarnate forgetfulness, that it will be permanently present? As one may imagine, this primeval problem was not solved by exactly gentle answers and gentle means. Perhaps there is nothing more awful and more sinister in the early history of man than his system of mnemonics something is burnt in so as to remain in his memory only that which never stops hurting remains in his memory this is an axiom of the oldest unfortunately also the longest psychology in the world it might even be said that wherever solemnity seriousness mystery and gloomy colors are now found in the life of the men and the nations of the world there is some survival of that horror which was once the universal concomitant of all promises, pledges, and obligations. The past, the past with all its length, depth, and hardness, wafts to us its breath and bubbles up in us again when we become serious. When man thinks it necessary to make for himself a memory, he never accomplishes it without blood, tortures, and sacrifices. The most dreadful sacrifices and forfeitures, among them the sacrifice of the firstborn, the most loathsome mutilation, for instance castration, the most cruel rituals of all the religious cults, for all religions are at really bottom systems of cruelty. All these things originate from that instinct which found in pain its most potent mnemonic. In a certain sense the whole of asceticism is to be ascribed to this, certain ideas have got to be made inextinguishable omnipresent fixed with the object of hypnotizing the whole nervous and intellectual system through these fixed ideas and the ascetic methods and modes of life are the means of freeing those ideas from the competition of all other ideas so as to make them unforgettable the worse memory man has the ghastlier the signs presented by his customs the severity of the penal laws affords in particular a gauge of the extent of man's difficulty in conquering forgetfulness and in keeping with a few primal postulates of social intercourse ever present to the minds of those who are the slaves of every momentary emotion and every momentary desire we germans do certainly not regard ourselves as a especially cruel and hard-hearted nation still less as an especially casual and happy-go-lucky one but one has only to look at our old penal ordinances in order to realize what a lot of trouble it takes in the world to evolve a nation of thinkers. I mean, the European nation which exhibits at this very day the maximum of reliability, seriousness, bad taste, and positiveness, which has on the strength of these qualities a right to train every kind of European Mandarin. These Germans employ terrible means to make for themselves a memory to enable them to master the rooted plebeian instincts and the brutal crudity of those instincts. Think of the old German punishments, for instance, stoning. As far back as the legend, the millstone falls on the head of the guilty man. Breaking on the wheel, the most original invention and specialty of the German genius in the sphere of punishment. Dart throwing, tearing or trampling by horses, quartering boiling the criminal in oil or wine still prevalent in the 14th and 15th centuries, the highly popular flaying, slicing into strips, cutting the flesh out of the breast. Think also of the evildoer being besmeared with honey and then exposed to the flies in a blazing sun. It was by the help of such images and precedents that man eventually kept it in his memory five or six I-will-nots, with regard to which he had already given his promise so as to be able to enjoy the advantages of society. And verily, with the help of this kind of memory, man eventually attained reason. Alas, reason, seriousness, mastery over the emotions, all these gloomy, dismal things which are called reflection, all these privileges and pageantries of humanity, 
how dear is the price that they have exacted how much blood and cruelty is the foundation of all good things four but how is it that the other melancholy object the consciousness of sin the whole bad conscience came into the world and it is here that we turn back to our genealogists of morals for the second time i say or have i not said it yet that they are worth nothing just their own five spans long limited modern experience no knowledge of the past and no wish to know it still less a historic instinct a power of second sight which is what is really required in this case and despite this to go in for the history of morals it stands to reason that this must needs produce results which are removed from the truth by something more than a respectful distance have these current genealogists of morals ever allowed themselves to have even the vaguest notion for instance that the cardinal moral idea of ought originates from the very material idea of o or that punishment developed as a retaliation absolutely independently of any preliminary hypothesis of the freedom or determination of the will and this to such an extent that a high degree of civilization was always first necessary for the animal man to begin to make those much more primitive distinctions of intentional negligent accidental responsible and their contraries and apply them in the assessing of punishment that idea the wrongdoer deserves punishment because he might have acted otherwise in spite of the fact that it is nowadays so cheap obvious natural and inevitable that it has had to serve as an illustration of the way in which the sentiment of justice appeared on earth is in point of fact an exceedingly late and even refined form of human judgment and inference the placing of this idea back at the beginning of the world is simply a clumsy violation of the principles of primitive psychology throughout the longest period of human history punishment was never based on the responsibility of the evildoer for his action and was consequently not based on the hypothesis that only the guilty should be punished on the contrary punishment was inflicted in those days for the same reason that parents punish their children even nowadays out of anger at an injury that they have suffered an anger which vents itself mechanically on the author of the injury but this anger is kept in bounds and modified through the idea that every injury has somewhere or other its equivalent price and can really be paid off even though it be by means of pain to the author whence it is that this ancient deep-rooted and now perhaps ineradicable idea has drawn its strength this idea of an equivalency between injury and pain i have already revealed its origin in the contractual relationship between creditor and ower that is as old as the existence of legal rights at all and in its turn points back to the primary forms of purchase sale barter and trade five the realization of these contractual relations excites of course as would be already expected from our previous observations a great deal of suspicion and opposition towards the primitive society which made or sanctioned them in this society promises will be made in this society the object is to provide the promiser with a memory in this society so we may suspect there would be full scope for hardness cruelty and pain the ower in order to induce credit and his promise of repayment in order to give a guarantee of the earnestness and sanctity of his promise in order to drill into his conscience the duty the solemn duty of repayment will by virtue of a contract with his creditor to meet the contingency of his not paying pledge something that he still possesses something that he still has in his power for instance his life or his wife or his freedom or his body or under certain religious conditions even his salvation his soul's welfare even his peace in the grave so in egypt where the corpse of the ower found even in the grave no rest from the creditor of course from the egyptian standpoint this peace was a matter of particular importance but especially has the creditor the power of inflicting on the body of the ower all kinds of pain and torture the power for instance of cutting off from it an amount that appeared proportionate to the greatness of the debt this point of view resulted in the universal prevalence at an early date of precise schemes of valuation frequently horrible in the minuteness and meticulosity of their application legally sanctioned schemes of valuation for individual limbs and parts of the body i consider it as already a progress as a proof of a freer less petty and more roman conception of law 
when the Roman Code of the Twelve Tables decreed that it was immaterial how much or how little the creditors in such a contingency cut off. Si plus minusve secerunt ne fraude esto. Let us make the logic of the whole of this equalization process clear. It is strange enough. The equivalence consists in this. Instead of an advantage directly compensatory to of his injury, that is, instead of an equalization in money, lands, or some kind of chattel, the creditor is granted by way of repayment and compensation a certain sensation of satisfaction, the satisfaction of being able to vent without any trouble his power on one who is powerless, the delight de faire le mal pour le plaisir de la faire, the joy in sheer violence, and this joy will be relished in proportion to the lowness and humbleness of the creditor in the social scale, and is quite apt to have the effect of the most delicious dainty, and even seem the foretaste of a higher social position. Thanks to the punishment of the ower, the creditor participates in the rights of the masters. At last he too, for once in a way, attains the edifying consciousness of being able to despise and ill-treat a creature as an inferior, or at any rate of seeing him being despised and ill-treated, in case the actual power of punishment, the administration of punishment, has already become transferred to the authorities. The compensation consequently consists in a claim on cruelty and a right to draw thereon. 6. It is then in this sphere of the law of contract that we find the cradle of the whole moral world of the ideas of guilt, conscience, duty, the sacredness of duty, their commencement, like the commencement of all great things in the world, is thoroughly and continuously saturated with blood. And should we not add that this world has never really lost a certain savor of blood and torture, not even an old Kant, the categorical imperative, reeks of cruelty, it was in this sphere likewise that there first became formed that sinister and perhaps now indissoluble association of the ideas of guilt and suffering. To put the question yet again, why can suffering be a compensation for owing? Because the infliction of suffering produces the highest degree of happiness, because the injured party will get in exchange for his loss, including his vexation at his loss, an extraordinary counter-pleasure, the infliction of suffering, a real feast, something that, as I have said, was all the more appreciated the greater the paradox created by the rank and social status of the creditor. These observations are purely conjectural, for, apart from the painful nature of the task, it is hard to plumb such profound depths. The clumsy introduction of the idea of revenge as a connecting link simply hides and obscures the view instead of rendering it clearer. Revenge itself simply leads back again to the identical problem, how can the infliction of suffering be a satisfaction? In my opinion, it is repugnant to the delicacy, and still more to the hypocrisy of tame domestic animals, that is, modern men, that is, ourselves, to realize with all their energy the extent to which cruelty constituted the great joy and delight of ancient man, was an ingredient which seasoned nearly all his pleasures, and conversely the extent of the naivete and innocence with which he manifested his need for cruelty, when he actually made as a matter of principle disinterested malice, or to use Spinoza's expression, the sympathia malevolens, into a normal characteristic of man, as consequently something to which the conscience says a hearty yes. The more profound observer has perhaps already had sufficient opportunity for noticing this most ancient and radical joy and delight of mankind. In Beyond Good and Evil, Aphorism 188, and even earlier, in The Dawn of Day, Aphorisms 18, 77, 113, I have cautiously indicated the continually growing spiritualization and deification of cruelty, which pervades the whole history of the higher civilization, and in the larger sense even constitutes it. At any rate, the time is not so long past when it was impossible to conceive of royal weddings and national festivals on a grand scale, without executions, tortures, or perhaps an auto de fe, or similarly to conceive of an aristocratic household without a creature to serve a butt for the cruel and malicious baiting of the inmates. The reader will perhaps remember Don Quixote at the court of the Duchess. We read nowadays the whole of Don Quixote with a bitter taste in our mouth, almost with a sensation of torture, a fact which would appear very strange and very incomprehensible to the author and his contemporaries. 
they read it with the best conscience in the world as the gayest of books they almost died with laughing at it the sight of suffering does one good the infliction of suffering does one more good that is a hard maxim but none the less a fundamental maxim old powerful and human all too human one moreover to which perhaps even the apes as well would subscribe for it is said that in inventing bizarre cruelties they are giving abundant proof to their future humanity to which as it were they are playing the prelude without cruelty no feast so teaches the oldest and longest history of man and in punishment too there is so much of the festive seven entertaining as i do these thoughts i am let me say in parentheses fundamentally opposed to helping our pessimists to new water for the discordant and groaning mills of their disgust with life on the contrary it should be shown specifically that at the time when mankind was not yet ashamed of its cruelty life in the world was brighter than it is nowadays when there are pessimists the darkening of the heavens over man has always increased in proportion to the growth of man's shame before man the tired pessimistic outlook the mistrust of the riddle of life the icy negation of disgusted ennui all those are not the signs of the most evil age of the human race rather much do they come first to the light of day as the swamp flowers which they are when the swamp to which they belong comes into existence i mean the diseased refinement and moralization thanks to which the animal man has at last learned to be ashamed of all his instincts on the road to angelhood not to use in this context the harder word man has developed that dyspeptic stomach and coated tongue which have made not only the joy and innocence of the animal repulsive to him but also life itself so that sometimes he stands with stopped nostrils before his own self and like pope innocent the third makes a blacklist of his own horrors unclean generation loathsome nutrition when in the maternal body badness of the matter out of which man develops awful stench secretion of saliva urine and excrement nowadays when suffering is always trotted out as the first argument against existence as its most sinister query it is well to remember the times when men judged on converse principles because they could not dispense with the infliction of suffering and saw therein a magic of the first order a veritable bait of seduction to life perhaps in those days this is to solace the weaklings pain did not hurt so much as it does nowadays any physician who has treated negroes granted that these are taken as representative of the prehistoric man suffering from severe internal inflammations which would bring a european even though he had the soundless constitution almost to despair would be in a position to come to this conclusion pain has not the same effect with negroes the curve of human sensibilities to pain seems indeed to sink in an extraordinary and almost sudden fashion as soon as one has passed the upper ten thousand or ten millions of over-civilized humanity and i personally have no doubt that by comparison with one painful night passed by one single hysterical chit of a cultured woman the suffering of all the animals taken together who have been put to the question of the knife so as to give scientific answers are simply negligible we may perhaps be allowed to admit the possibility of the craving for cruelty not necessarily having become really extinct it only requires in view of the fact that pain hurts more nowadays a certain sublimation and subtilization it must especially be translated into the imaginative and psychic plane and be adorned with such smug euphemisms that even the most fastidious and hypocritical conscience can never grow suspicious of the real nature tragic pity is one of these euphemisms another is les nostalgies de la croix what really raises one's indignation against suffering is not suffering intrinsically but the senselessness of suffering such a senselessness however existed neither in christianity which interpreted suffering in a, into a whole mysterious salvation apparatus nor in the beliefs of the naive ancient man who only knew how to find a meaning in suffering from the standpoint of the spectator or the inflictor of the suffering in order to get the secret undiscovered and unwitnessed suffering out of the world it was almost compulsory to invent gods in a hierarchy of intermediate beings in short something which wanders even among secret places sees even in the dark and makes a point of never missing an interesting and painful spectacle it was with the help of such inventions that life got to learn the tour de force 
which has become part of its stock and trade, the tour de force of self-justification, of the justification of evil. Nowadays this would perhaps require other auxiliary devices. For instance, life is a riddle, life is a problem of knowledge, Every evil is justified in the sight of which a god finds edification. So rang the logic of primitive sentiment. And indeed, was it only of a primitive? The gods conceived as friends of spectacles of cruelty. Oh, how far does this primeval conception extend even nowadays into our European civilization? One would perhaps like in this context to consult Luther and Calvin. It is at any rate certain that even the Greeks knew no more piquant seasoning for their happiness of their gods than the joys of cruelty. What, do you think, was the mood with which Homer makes his gods look down upon the fates of men? What final meaning have at bottom the Trojan War and similar tragic horrors? It is impossible to entertain any doubt on the point. They were intended as festival games for the gods, and, in so far as the poet is of a more godlike breed than other man, as festival games also for the poets. It was in just this spirit and no other, that at a later date the moral philosophers of Greece conceived the eyes of God as still looking down on the moral struggle, the heroism and the self-torture of the virtuous. The Heracles of duty was on a stage and was conscious of the fact. Virtue without witnesses was something quite unthinkable for this nation of actors. Must not that philosophical invention, so audacious and so fatal, which was then absolutely new to Europe, the invention of free will, of the absolute spontaneity of man and good and evil, simply have been made for the specific purpose of justifying the idea that the interest of the gods and humanity and human virtue was inexhaustible? There would never on the stage of this free will world be a dearth of really new, really novel and exciting situations, plots, catastrophes. A world thought out on completely deterministic lines would be easily guessed by the gods, and would consequently soon bore them. Sufficient reason for these friends of the gods, the philosophers, not to ascribe to their gods such a deterministic world. The whole of ancient humanity is full of delicate consideration for the spectator being as it is a world of thorough publicity and theatricality which could not conceive of happiness without spectacles and festivals and as has already been said even in great punishment there is so much which is festive eight the feeling of ought of personal obligation to take up again the train of our inquiry has had as we saw its origin in the oldest and most original personal relationship that there is the relationship between buyer and seller, creditor and owner. Here it was that individual confronted individual, and that individual matched himself against individual. There has not yet been found a grade of civilization so low as not to manifest some trace of this relationship. Making prices, assessing values, thinking out equivalents, exchanging, all this preoccupied the primal thoughts of man to such an extent that in a certain sense it constituted thinking itself. It was here that was trained the oldest form of sagacity. It was here in this sphere that we can perhaps trace the first commencement of man's pride, of his feeling of superiority over other animals. Perhaps our word mensch, manas, still expresses just something of this self-pride. Man denoted himself as the being who measures values, who values and measures, as the assessing animal par excellence. Sale and purchase, together with their psychological concomitants, are older than the origins of any form of social organization and union. It is rather from the most rudimentary form of individual right that the budding consciousness of exchange, commerce, debt, right, obligation, compensation was first transferred to the rudest and most elementary of the social complexes in the relation to similar complexes. The habit of comparing force with force together with that of measuring, of calculating. His eye was now focused to this perspective, and with that ponderous consistency of characteristic of ancient thought, which, though set in motion with difficulty, yet proceeds inflexibly along the line on which it has started. Man soon arrived at the great generalization. Everything has its price. All can be paid for. The oldest and most naive moral canon of justice the beginning of all kindness, of all equity, of all goodwill, of all objectivity in the world. 
justice in this initial phase is the good will among people of about equal power to come to terms with each other to come to an understanding again by means of a settlement and with regard to the less powerful to compel them to agree among themselves to a settlement nine measured always by the standard of antiquity this antiquity moreover is present or again possible at all periods the community stands to its members in that important and radical relationship of creditors to his owners man lives in a community man enjoys the advantages of community and what advantages we occasionally underestimate them nowadays man lives protected spared in peace and trust secure from certain injuries and enmities to which the man outside the community the peaceless man is exposed a german understands the original meaning of elend secure because he has entered into pledges and obligations to the community in respect of these very injuries and enmities what happens when this is not the case the community the defrauded creditor will get itself paid as well as it can one can reckon on that in this case the question of the direct damage done by the offender is quite subsidiary quite apart from this the criminal is above all a breaker a breaker of word and covenant to the whole and regards all the advantages and amenities of the communal life in which up to that time he had participated the criminal is an ower who not only fails to repay the advances and advantages that has been given to him but even sets out to attack his creditor consequently he is in the future not only as is fair deprived of all these advantages and amenities he is in addition reminded of the importance of those advantages the wrath of the injured creditor of the community puts him back into the wild and outlawed status from which he has previously protected the community repudiates him and now every kind of enmity can vent itself on him punishment is in this stage of civilization simply the copy the mimic of the normal treatment of the hated disdained and conquered enemy who is not only deprived of every right of and protection but of every mercy so we have the martial law and triumphant festival of the vevictus in all its mercilessness and cruelty this shows why war itself counting the sacrificial cult of war has pronounced all the forms under which punishment was, has manifested itself in history ten as it grows more powerful the community tends to take offenses of the individual less seriously because they are now regarded as being much less revolutionary and dangerous to the corporate existence the evildoer is no more outlawed and put outside the pale the common wrath can no longer vent itself upon him with its old license on the contrary from this very time it is against this wrath and particularly against the wrath of those directly injured that the evildoer is carefully shielded and protected by the community as in fact the penal law develops the following characteristics become more and more clearly marked compromise with the wrath of those directly affected by the misdeed a consequent endeavor to localize the matter and to prevent a further or indeed a general spread of the disturbance attempts to find equivalents and to settle the whole matter compositio above all the will which manifests itself with increasing definiteness to treat every offence as in a certain degree capable of being paid off and consequently at any rate up to a certain point to isolate the offender from his act as the power and the self-consciousness of a community increases so proportionately does the penal law become mitigated conversely every weakening and jeopardizing of the community revives the harshest forms of that law the creditor has always grown more humane proportionately as he has grown more rich finally the amount of injury he can endure without really suffering becomes the criterion of his wealth it is possible to conceive of a society blessed with so great a consciousness of its own power as to indulge in the most aristocratic luxury of letting its wrongdoers go scot-free what do my parasites matter to me might society say let them live and flourish i am strong enough for it the justice which began with the maxim everything can be paid off everything must be paid off ends with the connivance at the escape of those who cannot pay to escape it ends like every good thing on earth by destroying itself this self-destruction of justice we know the pretty name it calls itself grace it remains as is obvious the privilege of the strongest better still 
their super law. 11. A deprecatory word here against the attempts that have lately been made to find the origin of justice on quite another basis, namely on that of resentment. Let me whisper a word in the ear of the psychologists if they would fain study revenge itself at close quarters. This plant blooms its prettiest at present among anarchists and anti-Semites, a hidden flower, as it has ever been like a violet, though forsooth with another perfume, and as like must necessarily emanate from like, it will not be a matter for surprise that it is just in such circles that we see the birth of endeavors, it is their old birthplace, compare above first essay paragraph 14, to sanctify revenge under the name of justice as though justice were at bottom merely a development of the consciousness of injury. And thus, with the rehabilitation of revenge to reinstate generally and collectively all the reactive emotions, I object to this last point least of all. It even seems meritorious when regarded from the standpoint of the whole problem of biology, from which standpoint the value of these emotions has up to the present been underestimated. And that to which I alone call attention is the circumstance that it is the spirit of revenge itself from which develops this new nuance of scientific equity for the benefit of hate, envy, mistrust, jealousy, suspicion, rancor, revenge. The scientific equity stops immediately and makes way for the accents of deadly enmity and prejudice so soon as another group of emotions comes on the scene, which in my opinion are of a much higher biological value than these reactions and consequently have a paramount claim to the valuation and appreciation of science. I mean the really active emotions, such as personal and material ambition, and so forth. Eduring, value of life, course of philosophy, and passim. So much against this tendency in general, but as for the particular maxim of durings, that the home of justice is to be found in the sphere of the reactive feelings, our love of truth compels us drastically to invert his own proposition and to oppose to him this other maxim. The last sphere conquered by the spirit of justice is the sphere of the feeling of reaction. When it really comes about that the just man remains just even as regards his injurer, and not merely cold, moderate, reserved, indifferent, being just is always a positive state, when, in spite of the strong provocation of personal insult, contempt, and calumny, the lofty and clear objectivity of the just and judging eye, whose glance is as profound as it is gentle, is untroubled, why then we have a piece of perfection, a past master of the world, something, in fact, which it would not be wise to expect, and which should not, at any rate, be too easily believed, Speaking generally, there is no doubt but that even the justest individual only requires a little dose of hostility, malice, or innuendo to drive the blood into his brain and the fairness from it. The active man, the attacking, aggressive man, is always a hundred degrees nearer to justice than the man who merely reacts. He certainly has no need to adopt the tactics, necessary in the case of the reacting man, of making false and biased valuations of his object. It is, in point of fact, for this reason that the aggressive man has at all times enjoyed the stronger, bolder, more aristocratic, and also freer outlook, the better conscience. On the other hand, we already surmise who it really is that has on his conscience the invention of the bad conscience, the resentful man. Finally, let man look at himself in history. In what sphere up to the present has the whole administration of law, the actual need of law, found its earthly home? Perchance in the sphere of the reacting man? Not for a minute. Rather in that of the active, strong, spontaneous, aggressive man? I deliberately defy the above-mentioned agitator, who himself makes this self-confession, the creed of revenge has run through all my works and endeavors like the red thread of justice and say that judged historically law in the world represents the very war against the reactive feelings, the very war waged on those feelings by the powers of activity and aggression, which devote some of their strength to damning and keeping within bounds this effervescence of hysterical reactivity, and to forcing it to some compromise. Everywhere where justice is practiced and justice is maintained, it is to be observed that the stronger power, when confronted with the weaker powers which are inferior to it, 
whether they be groups or individuals, searches for weapons to put an end to the senseless fury of resentment, while it carries on its object, partly by taking the victim of resentment out of the clutches of revenge, partly by substituting for revenge a campaign of its own against the enemies of peace and order, partly by finding, suggesting, and occasionally enforcing settlements, partly by standardizing certain equivalents for injuries, to which equivalents the element of resentment is henceforth finally referred. The most drastic measure, however, taken and effectuated by the supreme power, to combat the preponderance of the feelings of spite and vindictiveness, it takes this measure as soon as it is at all strong enough to do so, is the foundation of law, the imperative declaration of what in its eyes is to be regarded as just and lawful, and what unjust and unlawful. And while after the foundation of law the supreme power treats the aggressive and arbitrary acts of individuals or of whole groups as a violation of law and a revolt against itself, it distracts the feelings of its subjects from the immediate injury inflicted by such a violation, and thus eventually attains the very opposite result to that always desired by revenge, which sees and recognizes nothing but the standpoint of the injured party. From henceforth the eye becomes trained to a more and more impersonal valuation of the deed, even the eye of the injured party himself, though this is the, in the final stage of all, as has been previously remarked, on this principle right and wrong first manifest themselves after the foundation of law, and not, as During maintains, only after the act of violation. To talk of intrinsic right and intrinsic wrong is absolutely nonsensical. Intrinsically, as an injury, an oppression, an exploitation, an annihilation can be nothing wrong, inasmuch as life is essentially that is, in its cardinal functions, something which functions by injuring, oppressing, exploiting, and annihilating, and is absolutely inconceivable without such a character. It is necessary to make an even more serious confession. Viewed from the most advanced biological standpoint, conditions of legality can be only exceptional conditions, in that they are partial restrictions of the real life will, which makes for power and in that they are subordinated to the life will's general end as particular means, that is, as means to create larger units of strength. A legal organization conceived of as sovereign and universal, not as a weapon in a fight for complexes of power, but as a weapon against fighting, generally something after the style of During's communistic model of treating every will as equal with every other will, would be a principle hostile to life, a destroyer and dissolver of man, an outrage on the future of man, a symptom of fatigue, a secret cut to nothingness. 12. A word more on the origin and end of punishment, two problems which are or ought to be kept distinct, but which unfortunately are usually lumped into one. And what tactics have our moral genealogists employed up to the present in these cases? Their inveterate naivete. They find out some end in the punishment, for instance, revenge and deterrence, and then in all their innocence set this end at the beginning as the causa fiende of the punishment, and they have done the trick. But the patching up of a history of the origin of law is the last use to which the end of law ought to be put. Perhaps there is no more pregnant principle for any kind of history than the following, which, difficult though it is to master, should nonetheless be mastered in every detail. The origin of the existence of a thing and its final utility, its practical application and incorporation in a system of ends, are toto calo opposed to each other. Everything, anything which exists and which prevails anywhere, will always be put to new purposes by a force superior to itself, will be commandeered afresh, will be turned and transformed to new uses. All happening in the organic world consists of overpowering and dominating, and again, all overpowering and domination is a new interpretation and adjustment, which must necessarily obscure or absolutely extinguish the subsisting meaning and end. The most perfect comprehension of the utility of any physiological organ, or also of a legal institution, social custom, political habit, form in art or in religious worship, does not for a minute imply any simultaneous comprehension of its origin. This may seem uncomfortable and unpalatable to the older men, for it has been the immemorial belief that understanding the final cause or the utility of a thing, 
and form and an institution means also understanding the reason for its origin. To give an example of this logic, the eye was made to see, the hand was made to grasp, so even punishment was conceived as invented with a view to punishing. But all ends and all utilities are only signs that a will to power has mastered a less powerful force, has impressed thereon out of its own self the meaning of a function. And the whole history of a thing, an organ, a custom, can on the same principle be regarded as a continuous sign chain of perpetually new interpretations and adjustments, whose causes, so far from needing to have even a mutual connection, sometimes follow and alternate with each other absolutely haphazard. Similarly, the evolution of a thing, of a custom, is anything but its progressus to an end, still less a logical and direct progressus attained with the minimum expenditure of energy and cost. It is rather the succession of processes of subjugation, more or less profound, more or less mutually independent, which operate on the thing itself. It is further the resistance which in each case invariably displayed the subjugation, the protean wriggles by way of defense and reaction, and further the results of successful counter-efforts. The form is fluid, but the meaning is even more so. Even inside every individual organism, the case is the same. With every genuine growth of the whole, the function of individual organs become shifted. In certain cases, a partial perishing of these organs, a diminution of their numbers, for instance, through annihilation of the connecting members, can be a symptom of growing strength and perfection. What I mean is this. Even partial loss of utility, decay and degeneration, loss of function and purpose, in or death, appertain to the conditions of a genuine progressus, which always appears in the shape of a will and way to greater power, and is always realized at the expense of innumerable smaller powers. The magnitude of a progress is gauged by the greatness of the sacrifice that it requires. Humanity is a mass sacrificed to the prosperity of the one stronger species of man. That would be a progress. I emphasize all the more this cardinal characteristic of the historic method, for the reason that in its essence it runs counter to predominant instincts and prevailing taste, which must prefer to put up with absolute casualness, even with the mechanical senselessness of all phenomena, then with the theory of a power will, an exhaustive play throughout all phenomena, the democratic idiosyncrasy against everything which rules and wishes to rule, the modern misarchism, to coin a bad word for a bad thing, has gradually but so thoroughly transformed itself into the guise of intellectualism, the most abstract intellectualism, that even nowadays it penetrates and has the right to penetrate step by step into the most exact and apparently the most objective sciences. This tendency has in fact, in my view, already dominated the whole of physiology and biology, and to their detriment as is obvious insofar as it has spirited away a radical idea, the idea of true activity. The tyranny of this idiosyncrasy, however, results in the theory of adaptation being pushed forward into the van of the argument, exploited. Adaptation, that means to say, a second-class activity, a mere capacity for reacting. In fact, life itself has been defined, by Herbert Spencer, as an increasingly effective internal adaptation to external circumstances. This definition, however, fails to realize the real essence of life its will to power. It fails to appreciate the paramount superiority enjoyed by those plastic forces of spontaneity, aggression, and encroachment with their new interpretations and tendencies, to the operation of which adaptation is only a natural corollary. Consequently, the sovereign office of the highest functionaries in the organism itself, among which the life will appears as an active and formative principle, is repudiated. One remembers Huxley's reproach to Spencer of his administrative nihilism, but it is a case of something much more than administration. End of section three. Section four of the Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Second essay, Guilt, Bad Conscience, and the Like. Part two. Thirteen. To return to our subject, namely punishment, we must make consequently a double distinction. 
first the relatively permanent element the custom the act the drama a certain rigid sequence of method and procedure on the other hand the fluid element the meaning the end the expectation which is attached to the operation of any such procedure at this point we immediately assume per analogium in accordance with the theory of the historic method which we have elaborated above that the procedure itself is something older and earlier than its utilization and punishment that this utilization was introduced and interpreted into the procedure which had existed for a long time but whose employment had another meaning in short that the case is different from that hitherto supposed by our naive genealogists of morals and of law who thought that the procedure was invented for the purpose of punishment in the same way that the hand had been previously thought to have been invented for the purpose of grasping with regard to the other element in punishment its fluid element its meaning the idea of punishment at a very late stage of civilization for instance contemporary europe is not content with manifesting merely one meaning but manifests a whole synthesis of meanings the past general history of punishment the history of its employment for the most diverse ends crystallizes eventually into a kind of unity which is difficult to analyze into its parts and which it is necessary to emphasize absolutely defies definition it is nowadays impossible to say definitely the precise reason for punishment all ideas in which a whole process is promiscuously comprehended elude definition it is only that to which has no history which can be defined at an earlier stage on the contrary that synthesis of meanings appears much less rigid and much more elastic we can realize how in each individual case the elements of the synthesis change their value and their position so that now one element and now another stands out and predominates over the others nay in certain cases one element perhaps the end of deterrence seems to eliminate all the rest at any rate so as to give some idea of the uncertain supplementary and accidental nature of the meaning of punishment and of the manner in which one identical procedure can be employed and adapted for the most diametrically opposed objects i will at this point give a scheme that has suggested itself to me a scheme itself based on a comparatively small and accidental material punishment as rendering the criminal harmless and incapable of further injury punishment as compensation for the injury sustained by the injured party in every any form whatsoever including the form of sentimental compensation punishment as an isolation of that which disturbs the equilibrium so as to prevent the further spreading of that disturbance punishment as a means of inspiring fear of those who determine and execute the punishment punishment as a kind of compensation for the advantages which the wrongdoer has up to that time enjoyed for example when he is utilized as a slave in the mines punishment as the elimination of an element of decay sometimes of a whole branch according to chinese laws consequently as a means to the purification of the race or the preservation of a social type punishment as a festival as the violent oppression and humiliation of an enemy that has at long last been subdued punishment as a mnemonic whether for him who suffers the punishment the so-called correction or for the witness of its administration punishment as the payment of a fee stipulated for by the power which protects the evil doer from the excesses of revenge punishment as a compromise with the natural phenomenon of revenge in so far as revenge is still maintained and claimed as a privilege by the stronger races punishment as a declaration and measure of war against an enemy of peace of law of order of authority who is fought by society with the weapons which war provides as a spirit dangerous to the community as a breaker of the contract on which the community is based as a rebel a traitor and a breaker of the peace fourteen this list is certainly not complete it is obvious that punishment is overloaded with utilities of all kinds this makes it all the more permissible to eliminate one supposed utility which passes at any rate in the popular mind for the most essential utility and which is just what even now provides the strongest support for that faith in punishment which is nowadays for many reasons tottering punishment is supposed to have the value of exciting in the guilty the consciousness of guilt in punishment is sought the proper instrumentum of that psychic reaction which has become known as bad conscience remorse 
But this theory is even, from the point of view of the present, a violation of reality and psychology. And how much more so is the case when we have to deal with the longest period of man's history, his primitive history? Genuine remorse is certainly extremely rare among wrongdoers and the victims of punishment. Prisons and houses of correction are not the soil on which this worm of remorse pullulates for choice. This is the unanimous opinion of all conscientious observers, who in many cases arrive at such a judgment with enough reluctance and against their own personal wishes. Speaking generally, punishment hardens and numbs. It produces concentration. It sharpens the consciousness of alienation. It strengthens the power of resistance. When it happens that it breaks the man's energy and brings about a piteous prostration and abjectness, such a result is certainly even less salutary than the average effect of punishment, which is characterized by a harsh and sinister doggedness. The thought of those prehistoric millennia brings us to the unhesitating conclusion that it was simply through punishment that the evolution of the consciousness of guilt was most forcibly retarded. At any rate, in the victims of the punishing power, in particular, let us not underestimate the extent to which, by the very sight of the judicial and executive procedure, the wrongdoer is himself prevented from feeling that his deed, the character of his act, is intrinsically reprehensible. For he sees clearly the same kind of acts practiced in the service of justice, and then called good, and practiced with good conscience. Acts such as espionage, trickery, bribery, trapping, the whole intriguing and insidious art of the policeman and former. The whole system, in fact, manifested in the different kinds of punishment, a system not excused by passion, but based on principle, of robbing, oppressing, insulting, imprisoning, racking, murdering. All this he sees treated by his judges, not as acts meriting censure and condemnation in themselves, but only in a particular context and application. It was not on the soil that grew the bad conscience, that most sinister and interesting plant of our earthly vegetation. In point of fact, throughout the most lengthy period, no suggestion of having to do with a guilty man manifests itself in the consciousness of the man who judged and punished. One had merely to deal with an author of an injury, an irresponsible piece of fate. And the man himself, on whom the punishment subsequently fell like a piece of fate, was occasioned no more of an inner pain than would be occasioned by the sudden approach of some uncalculated event, some terrible natural catastrophe, a rushing, crushing avalanche against which there is no resistance. 15. This truth came insidiously enough to the consciousness of Spinoza, to the disgust of his commentators who, like Kuno Fischer, for instance, give themselves no end of trouble to misunderstand him on this point. When one afternoon, as he sat raking up who knows what memory, he indulged in the question of what was really left for him personally of the celebrated Morsus Conscientiae, Spinoza, who had relegated good and evil to the sphere of human imagination, and indignantly defended the honor of his free God against those blasphemers who affirmed that God did everything sub ratione boni, but this was tantamount to subordinating God to fate, and would really be the greatest of all absurdities. For Spinoza the world had returned again to that innocence in which it lay before the discovery of the bad conscience. What, then, had happened to the morsus consciente? The antithesis of Gaudium, said he at last to himself, a sadness accompanied by the recollection of a past event which had turned out contrary to all expectation. Ethics, Book 3, Proposition 18, Scolium 1, 2. Evildoers have throughout thousands of years felt when overtaken by punishment exactly like Spinoza on the subject of their offense. Here is something which went wrong contrary to my anticipation. Not, I ought not to have done this. They submitted themselves to punishment, just as one submits oneself to his disease, to a misfortune, or to death, with that stubborn and resigned fatalism which gives the Russians, for instance, even nowadays the advantage over us Westerners, in the handling of life. If after that period there was a critique of action, the criterion was prudence, the real effect of punishment is unquestionably chiefly to be found in a sharpening of the sense of prudence, in a lengthening of the memory, in a will to adopt more of a policy of caution, suspicion, and secrecy, 
in the recognition that there are many things which are unquestionably beyond one's capacity, in a kind of improvement in self-criticism. The broad effects which can be obtained by punishment in man and beast are the increase of fear, the sharpening of the sense of cunning, the mastery of the desires. So it is that punishment tames man, but does not make him better. It would be more correct even to go so far as to assert the contrary. Injury makes a man cunning, says a popular proverb. So far as it makes him cunning, it makes him also bad. Fortunately, it often enough makes him stupid. 16. At this juncture I cannot avoid trying to give a tentative and provisional expression to my own hypothesis concerning the origin of the bad conscience. It is difficult to make it fully appreciated and it requires continuous meditation, attention, and digestion. I regard the bad conscience as the serious illness which man was bound to contract under the stress of the most radical change which he had ever experienced, that change when he found himself finally imprisoned within the pale of society and of peace. Just like the plight of the water animals, when they were compelled either to become land animals or to perish, so was the plight of these half-animals, perfectly adapted as they were to the savage life of war, prowling and adventure. Suddenly all their instincts were rendered worthless and switched off. Henceforward they had to walk on their feet, carry themselves, whereas heretofore they had been carried into the water. A terrible heaviness oppressed them. They found themselves clumsy in obeying the simplest directions. Confronted with this new and unknown world, they had no longer their old guides, the regulative instincts that had led them unconsciously to safety. They were reduced, were those unhappy creatures, to thinking, inferring, calculating, putting together causes and results, reduced to that poorest and most erratic organ of theirs, their consciousness. I do not believe there was ever in the world such a feeling of misery, such a leaden discomfort. Further, those old instincts had not immediately ceased their demands. Only it was difficult and rarely possible to gratify them. Speaking broadly, they were compelled to satisfy themselves by new and, as it were, whole and corner methods. All instincts which do not find a vent without turn inwards. This is what I mean by the growing internalization of man. Consequently, we have the first growth in man of what subsequently was called his soul. The whole inner world, originally as thin as if it had been stretched between two layers of skin, burst apart and expanded proportionately, and obtained depth, breadth, and height. When man's external outlet became obstructed, these terrible bulwarks with which the social organization protected itself against the old instincts of freedom, punishments belong preeminently to these bulwarks, brought it about that all those instincts of wild, free, prowling man became turned backwards against man himself. Enmity, cruelty, the delight in persecution, and surprises, change, destruction, the turning all these instincts against their own possessors, this is the origin of the bad conscience. It was man who, lacking external enemies and obstacles, and imprisoned as he was in the oppressive narrowness and monotony of custom, in his own impatience, lacerated, persecuted, gnawed, frightened, and ill-treated himself. It was this animal in the cage of the tamer which beat itself against the bars of its cage. It was this being who, pining and yearning for that desert home of which it had been deprived, was compelled to create out of itself an adventure, a torture chamber, a hazardous and perilous desert. It was this fool, this homesick and desperate prisoner, who invented the bad conscience. But thereby he introduced that most grave and sinister illness, from which mankind has not yet recovered, the suffering of man from the disease called man, as the result of a violent breaking from his animal past, the result, as it were, of a spasmodic plunge into a new environment and new conditions of existence, the result of a declaration of war against the old instincts, which up to that time had been the staple of his power, his joy, his formidableness. Let us immediately add that this fact of an animal ego turning against itself, taking part against itself, produced in the world so novel, profound, unheard of, problematic, inconsistent, and pregnant a phenomenon, that the aspect of the world was radically altered thereby. In sooth, only divine spectators could have appreciated the drama that then began, 
and whose end baffles conjecture as yet a drama too subtle too wonderful too paradoxical to warrant its undergoing a nonsensical and unheeded performance on some random grotesque planet henceforth man is to be counted as one of the most unexpected and sensational lucky shots in the game of the big baby of heraclitus whether he be called zeus or chance he awakens on his behalf the interest excitement hope almost the confidence of his being the harbinger and forerunner of something of man being no end but only a stage an in interlude a bridge a great promise seventeen it is primarily involved in this hypothesis of the origin of bad conscience that that alteration was no gradual and no voluntary alteration and that it did not manifest itself as an organic adaptation to new conditions but as a break a jump a necessity an inevitable fate against which there was no resistance and never a spark of resentment and secondarily that the fitting of a hitherto unchecked and amorphous population into a fixed form starting as it had done in an act of violence could only be accomplished by acts of violence and nothing else that the oldest state appeared consequently as a ghastly tyranny a grinding ruthless piece of machinery which went on working till this raw material of a semi-animal populace was not only thoroughly kneaded and elastic but also moulded i used the word state my meaning is self-evident namely a herd of blond beasts of prey a race of conquerors and masters which with all its warlike organization and all its organizing power pounces with its terrible claws on a population in numbers possibly tremendously superior but as yet formless as yet nomad such is the origin of the state that fantastic theory that makes it begin with a contract is i think disposed of he who can command he who is a master by nature he who comes on the scene forceful in deed and gesture what has he to do with contracts such beings defy calculation they come like fate without cause reason notice excuse they are there as the lightning is there too terrible too sudden too convincing too different to be personally even hated their work is an instinctive creating and impressing of forms they are the most involuntary unconscious artists that there are their appearance produces instantaneously a scheme of sovereignty which is live in which the functions are partitioned and apportioned in which above all no part is received or finds a place until pregnant with a meaning in regard to the whole they are ignorant of the meaning of guilt responsibility consideration are these born organizers in them predominates that terrible artist egoism that gleams like brass and that knows itself justified to all eternity in its work even as a mother in her child it is not in them that there grew the bad conscience that is elementary but it would not have grown without them repulsive growth as it was it would be missing had not a tremendous quantity of freedom been expelled from the world by the stress of their hammer strokes their artist violence or been at any rate made invisible and as it were latent this instinct of freedom forced into being latent it is already clear this instinct of freedom forced back trodden back imprisoned within itself and finally only able to vent and relief in itself this only this is the beginning of the bad conscience eighteen beware of thinking lightly of this phenomenon by reason of its initial painful ugliness at bottom it is the same active force which is at work on a more grandiose scale in those potent artists and organizers and build states where here internally on a smaller and pettier scale and with a retrogressive tendency makes itself a bad conscience in the labyrinth of the beast to use goethe's phrase and which builds negative ideals it is i repeat that identical instinct of freedom to use my own language the will to power only the material on which this force with all its constructive and tyrannous nature is let loose is here man himself this whole old animal self and not as in the case of that more grandiose and sensational phenomenon the other man other men this secret self-tyranny that this cruelty of the artist 
this delight in giving a form to oneself as a piece of difficult refractory and suffering material in burning in a will a critique a contradiction a contempt a negation this sinister and ghastly labor of love on the part of a soul whose will is cloven in two within itself which makes itself suffer from delight in the infliction of suffering this wholly active bad conscience as finally as one already anticipates true fountainhead as it is of idealism and imagination produce an abundance of novel and amazing beauty and affirmation and perhaps has really been the first to give birth to beauty at all what would beauty be forsooth if its contradiction had not first been presented to consciousness if the ugly had not first said to himself i am ugly at any rate after this hint the problem of how far idealism and beauty can be traced in such opposite ideals as selflessness self-denial self-sacrifice becomes less problematical and indubitably in future we shall certainly know the real and original character of the delight experienced by the selfless the self-denying the self-sacrificing this delight is a phase of cruelty so much provisionally for the origin of altruism as a moral value and the marking out the ground from which this value has grown it is only the bad conscience only the will for self-abuse that provides the necessary conditions for the existence of altruism as a value nineteen undoubtedly the bad conscience is an illness but an illness as pregnancy is an illness if we search out the conditions under which this illness reaches its most terrible and sublime zenith we shall see what really first brought about its entry into the world but to do this we must take a long breath and we must first of all go back once again to an earlier point of view the relation at civil law of the ower to his creditor which has already been discussed in detail has been interpreted once again and indeed in a manner which historically is exceedingly remarkable and suspicious into a relationship which is perhaps more incomprehensible to us moderns than to any other era that is into the relationship of the existing generation of its ancestors within the original tribal association we are talking of primitive times each living generation recognizes a legal obligation towards the earlier generation and particularly towards the earliest which founded at the family and this is something much more than a mere sentimental obligation the existence of which during the longest period of man's history is by no means indisputable there prevails in them the conviction that it is only thanks to sacrifices and efforts of their ancestors that the race persists at all and that this has to be paid back to them by sacrifices and services thus is recognized the owing of a debt which accumulates continually by reason of these ancestors never ceasing in their subsequent life as potent spirits to secure by their power new privileges and advantages to the race gratis perchance but there is no gratis for that raw and mean-souled age what return can be made sacrifice at first nourishment in its crudest sense festivals temples tributes of veneration above all obedience since all customs are qua works of the ancestors equally their precepts and commands are the ancestors ever given enough this suspicion remains and grows from time to time it extorts a great wholesale ransom something monstrous in the way of repayment of the creditor the notorious sacrifice of the firstborn for example blood human blood in any case the fear of ancestors and their power the consciousness of owing debts to them necessarily increases according to this kind of logic in the exact proportion that the race itself increases that the race itself becomes more victorious more independent more honored more feared this and not the contrary is the fact each step towards race decay all disastrous events all symptoms of degeneration of approaching disintegration always diminish the fear of the founder's spirit and whittle away the idea of his sagacity providence and potent presence conceive this crude kind of logic carried to its climax it follows that the ancestors of the most powerful races must through the growing fear that they exercise in the imaginations grow themselves into monstrous dimensions and become relegated to the gloom of a divine mystery that transcends imagination 
the ancestor becomes at last necessarily transfigured into a god perhaps this is the very origin of the gods that is an origin from fear and those who feel bound to add but from piety also will have difficulty in maintaining this theory with regard to the primeval and longest period of the human race and of course this is even more the case as regard the middle period the formative period of the aristocratic races the aristocratic races which have given back with interest to their founders the ancestors heroes gods of all those qualities which in the meanwhile have appeared in themselves that is the aristocratic qualities we will later on glance again at the ennobling and promotion of the gods which of course is totally distinct from their sanctification let us now provisionally follow to its end the course of the whole of this development of the consciousness of owing twenty according to the teaching of history the consciousness of owing debts to the deity by no means came to an end with the decay of the clan organization of society just as mankind has inherited the ideas of good and bad from the race nobility together with its fundamental tendency towards establishing social distinctions so with the heritage of the racial and tribal gods it has also inherited the incubus of debts as yet unpaid in the desire to discharge them the transition is effected by those large populations of slaves and bondsmen who whether through compulsion or through submission and mimicry have accommodated themselves to the religion of their masters through this channel these inherited tendencies inundate the world the feeling of owing a debt to the deity has grown continuously for several centuries always in the same proportion in which the idea of god and the consciousness of god have grown and become exalted among mankind the whole history of ethnic fights victories reconciliations amalgamations everything in fact which precedes the eventual classing of all social elements in each great race synthesis are mirrored in the hodgepodge genealogy of their gods in the legends of their fights victories and reconciliations progress towards universal empires invariably means progress towards universal deities despotism with its subjugation of the independent nobility always paves the way for some system or other of monotheism the appearance of the christian god as the record god up to this time has for that very reason brought equally into the world the record amount of guilt consciousness granted that we have gradually started on the reverse movement there is no little probability in this deduction based on the continuous decay and the belief of the christian god to the effect that there also already exists a considerable decay in the human consciousness of owing of ought in fact we cannot shut our eyes to the prospect of the complete and eventual triumph of atheism freeing mankind from all this feeling of obligation to their origin their causa prima atheism and a kind of second innocence complement and supplement each other twenty one so much for my rough and preliminary sketch of the interrelation of ideas ought o oh, and duty with the postulates of religion i have intentionally shelved up to the present the actual moralization of these ideas their being pushed back into the conscience or more precisely the interweaving of the bad conscience with the idea of god and at the end of the last paragraph to use language to the effect that this moralization did not exist and that consequently these ideas had necessarily come to an end by reason of what had happened to their hypothesis the credence in our creditor in god the actual facts differ terribly from this theory it is with the moralization of the ideas ought and duty and with their being pushed back into the bad conscience that comes the first actual attempts to reverse the direction of the development we have just described or at any rate to arrest its evolution it is just at this juncture that the very hope of an eventual redemption has to put itself once and for all into the prison of pessimism it is at this juncture that the eye has to recoil and rebound a despair from off an adamantine impossibility it is at this juncture that the ideas guilt and duty have to turn backwards turn backwards against whom there is no doubt about it primarily against the ower in whom the bad conscience now establishes itself eats extends and grows like a polypus throughout its length and breadth all with such virulence that at last with the impossibility of paying the debt 
there becomes conceived the idea of the impossibility of paying the penalty the thought of its inexpiability the idea of eternal punishment finally too it turns against the creditor whether found in the causa prima of man the origin of the human race its sire who henceforth becomes burdened with a curse adam original sin determination of the will or in nature from whose womb man springs and on whom the responsibility for the principle of evil is now cast diabolization of nature or in existence generally on this logic an absolute white elephant with which mankind is landed the nihilistic flight from life the demand for nothingness or for the opposite of existence for some other existence buddhism and the like till suddenly we stand before that paradoxical and awful expedient through which a tortured humanity has found a temporary alleviation that stroke of genius called christianity god personally immolating himself for the debt of man god paying himself personally out of a pound of his own flesh god is the one being who can deliver man from what man had become unable to deliver himself the creditor playing scapegoat for his debtor from love can you believe it from love of his debtor 22 the reader will already have conjectured what took place on the stage and behind the scenes of this drama that will for self-torture that inverted cruelty of the animal man who turned subjective and scared into introspection encaged as he was in the state as part of his taming process invented the bad conscience so as to hurt himself after the natural outlet for this will to hurt became blocked in other words this man of the bad conscience exploited the religious hypothesis so as to carry his martyrdom to the ghastliest pitch of agonized intensity owing something to god this thought becomes his instrument of torture he apprehends in god the most extreme antithesis he can find to his own characteristic and ineradicable animal instincts he himself gives a new interpretation to these animal instincts as being against what he owes to god as enmity rebellion and revolt against the lord or the father or the sire the beginning of the world he places himself between the horns of the dilemma god and devil every negation which he is inclined to utter to himself to the nature naturalness and reality of his being he whips into an ejaculation of yes uttering it as something existing living efficient as being god as the holiness of god the judgment of god as the hangmanship of god as transcendence as eternity as unending torment as hell as infinity of punishment and guilt this is a kind of madness of the will in the sphere of psychological cruelty which is absolutely unparalleled man's will to find himself guilty and blameworthy to the point of inexpiability his will to think of himself as punished without the punishment ever being able to balance the guilt his will to infect and to poison the fundamental basis of the universe with the problem of punishment and guilt in order to cut off once and for all any escape out of his labyrinth of fixed ideas his will for rearing an ideal that of the holy god face to face with which he can have tangible proof of his own unworthiness alas for this mad melancholy beast man what fantasies invade it what paroxysms of perversity hysterical senselessness and mental bestiality break out immediately at the very slightest check on its being the beast of action all this is excessively interesting but at the same time tainted with a black gloomy enervating melancholy so that a forcible veto must be invoked against looking too long into these abysses here is disease indubitably the most ghastly diseases that has as yet played havoc among men and he who can still hear but man turns now deaf ears to such sounds how in this night of torment and nonsense there has rung out the cry of love the cry of the most passionate ecstasy of redemption in love he turns away gripped as by an invincible horror in man there is so much that is ghastly too long has the world been a madhouse twenty three let this suffice once for all concerning the origin of the holy god the fact that in itself the conception of gods is not bound to lead necessarily to this degradation of the imagination 
a temporary representation of whose vagaries we felt bound to give, the fact that there exists nobler methods of utilizing the inventions of gods than in the self-crucifixion and self-degradation of man, in which the last two thousand years of Europe have been past masters. These facts can fortunately be still perceived from every glance that we cast at the Grecian gods, these mirrors of noble and grandiose men, in which the animal in man felt itself defiled, and did not devour itself in subjective frenzy. These Greeks long utilized their gods as simple buffers against the bad conscience, so that they could continue to enjoy their freedom of soul. This, of course, is diametrically opposed to Christianity's theory of its god. They went very far on this principle, did these splendid and lion-hearted children. And there is no lesser authority than that of the Homeric Zeus for making them realize occasionally that they are taking life too casually. Wonderful, he says on one occasion. It had to do with the case of Aegisthus, a very bad case indeed. Wonderful how they grumble, the mortals against the immortals. Only from us, they presume, comes evil. But in their folly, fashion they, spite of fate, the doom of their own disaster. Yet the reader will note and observe that this Olympian spectator and judge is far from being angry with them and thinking evil of them as on this score. How foolish they are, so thinks he of the misdeeds of mortals, and folly, impudence, a little brain disturbance, and nothing more are what the Greeks, even of their strongest, bravest period, have admitted to be the ground of much that is evil and fatal. Folly, not sin, do you understand? But even this brain disturbance was a problem. Come, how is it even possible? How could it have really got into brains like ours, the brains of men of aristocratic ancestry, of men of fortune, of men of good natural endowments, of men of the best society, of men of nobility and virtue? This was the question that for century on century the aristocratic Greek put to himself when confronted with every, to him incomprehensible, outrage and sacrilege with which one of his peers had polluted himself. It must be that a god had infatuated him, he would say, at last, nodding his head. This solution is typical of the Greeks. Accordingly, the gods in those times subserved the functions of justifying man to a certain extent even in evil, in those days they took upon themselves not the punishment, but, what is more noble, the guilt. 24. I conclude with three queries, as you will see. Is an ideal actually set up here, or is one pulled down, I am perhaps asked? But have ye sufficiently asked yourselves how dear a payment has the setting up of every ideal in the world exacted? To achieve that consummation, how much truth must always be traduced and misunderstood? How many lies must be sanctified? How much conscience has got to be disturbed? How many pounds of God have got to be sacrificed every time? To enable a sanctuary to be set up, a sanctuary has got to be destroyed. That is a law. Show me an instance of where it has not been fulfilled. We modern men, we inherit the immemorial tradition of vivisecting the conscience, and practice in cruelty to our animal selves. That is the sphere of our most protracted training, perhaps of our artistic prowess, at any rate of our dilettantism and our perverted taste. Man has for too long regarded his natural proclivities with an evil eye, so that eventually they have become, in his system, affiliated with a bad conscience. A converse endeavor would be intrinsically feasible, but who is strong enough to attempt it? namely to affiliate to the bad conscience all those unnatural proclivities, all those transcendental aspirations, contrary to sense, instinct, nature, and animalism. In short, all past and present ideals, which are all ideals opposed to life, and traducing the world. To whom is one to turn nowadays with such hopes and pretensions? It is just the good men that we should thus bring about our ears. And in addition, as stands to reason, the indolent, the hedgers, the vain, the hysterical, the tired. What is more offensive or more thoroughly calculated to alienate than giving any hint of the exalted severity with which we treat ourselves? And again, how conciliatory, how full of love does all the world show itself towards us as so soon as we do as all the world does? 
and let ourselves go like all the world for such a consummation we need spirits of different calibre than seems really feasible in this age spirits rendered potent through wars and victories to whom conquest adventure danger even pain have become a need for such a consummation we need habituation to sharp rare air to winter wanderings to literal and metaphorical ice and mountains we even need a kind of sublime malice a supreme and most self-conscious insolence of knowledge which is the appanage of great health we need to summarize the awful truth just this great health is this even feasible today but some day in a stronger age than this rotting and introspective present must he in sooth come to us even the redeemer of great love and scorn the creative spirit rebounding by the impetus of his own force back again away from every transcendental plane and dimension he whose solitude is misunderstanded of the people and though it were a flight from reality and while actually it is only his diving burrowing and penetrating into reality so that when he comes up again into the light he can at once bring about by these means the redemption of this reality its redemption from the curse which the old ideal has laid upon it this man of the future who in this wise will redeem us from the old ideal as he will from that ideal's necessary corollary of great nausea will to nothingness and nihilism this toxin of noon and of the great verdict which renders the will again free who gives back to the world its goal and to man his hope this antichrist and an anti-nihilist this conqueror of god and of nothingness he must one day come twenty five but what am i talking of enough enough at this juncture i have only one proper course silence otherwise i trespass on a domain open alone to one who is younger than i one stronger more future than i open alone to zarathustra zarathustra the godless end of section four of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche section five of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche translated by horace b samuel third essay what is the meaning of ascetic ideals part one careless mocking forceful so does wisdom wish us she is a woman and never loves any one but a warrior thus spake zarathustra one what is the meaning of ascetic ideals in artists nothing or too much in philosophers and scholars a kind of flair and instinct for the conditions most favorable to advanced intellectualism in women at best an additional seductive fascination a little morbidezza on the fine piece of flesh the angelhood of a fat pretty animal in physiological failures and whiners and the majority of mortals an attempt to pose as too good for this world a holy form of debauchery their chief weapon in the battle with lingering pain and ennui in priests the actual priestly faith their best engine of power and also the supreme authority for power in saints finally a pretext for hibernation their novissima gloria cupido their peace in nothingness god their form of madness but in the very fact that the ascetic ideal has meant so much to man lies expressed the fundamental feature of man's will his horror vacui he needs a goal and he will sooner will nothingness than not will at all am i not understood have i not been understood certainly not sir well let us begin at the beginning two what is the meaning of ascetic ideals or to take an individual case in regard to which i have often been consulted what is the meaning for example of an artist like richard wagner paying homage to chastity in his old age he had always done so of course in a certain sense but it was not till quite the end that he did so in an ascetic sense what is the meaning of this change of attitude this radical revolution in his attitude for that was what it was wagner veered thereby straight round into his own opposite what is the meaning of an artist veering round into his own opposite 
At this point, granted that we do not mind stopping a little over this question, we immediately call to mind the best, strongest, gayest, and boldest period that there perhaps ever was in Wagner's life. That was the period when he was genuinely and deeply occupied by the idea of Luther's wedding. Who knows what chance is responsible for our now having the Meister singers instead of this wedding music, and how much in the latter is perhaps just an echo of the former? But there is no doubt but that theme would have dealt with the praise of chastity. And certainly it would have also have dealt with the praise of sensuality, and even so it would seem quite in order, and even so it would have been equally Wagnerian. For there is no necessary antithesis between chastity and sensuality. Every good marriage, every authentic heartfelt love transcends this antithesis. Wagner would, it seems to me, have done well to have brought this pleasing reality home once again to his Germans, by means of a bold and graceful Luther comedy, for there were and are among the Germans many revilers of sensuality, and perhaps Luther's greatest merit lies just in the fact of his having had the courage of his sensuality. It used to be called, prettily enough, evangelistic freedom. But even in those cases where that antithesis between chastity and sensuality does exist, there has fortunately been for some time no necessity for it to be in any way a tragic antithesis. This should at any rate be the case with all beings who are sound in mind and body, who are far from reckoning their delicate balance between animal and angel, as being on the face of it one of the principles opposed to existence. The most subtle and brilliant spirits, such as Goethe, such as Hafetz, have ever seen in this a further charm of life. Such conflicts actually allure one to life. On the other hand, it is only too clear that when once these ruined swine are reduced to worshipping chastity, and there are such swine, they only see and worship in it the antithesis to themselves, the antithesis to ruined swine. Oh, what a tragic grunting and eagerness. You can just think of it. They worship that painful and superfluous contrast which Richard Wagner in his latter days undoubtedly wished to set to music and to place on the stage. For what purpose, forsooth, as we may reasonably ask, what did the swine matter to him? What do they matter to us? 3. At this point it is impossible to beg the further question of what he really had to do with that manly, ah, so unmanly, country bumpkin, that poor devil and natural Parsifal, whom he eventually made a Catholic by such fraudulent devices. What? Was this Parsifal really meant seriously? One might be tempted to suppose the contrary, even to wish it, that the Wagnerian Parsifal was meant joyously, like a concluding play of a trilogy or satiric drama, in which Wagner the tragedian wished to take farewell of us, of himself, above all of tragedy, and to do so in a manner that should be quite fitting and worthy, that is, with an excess of the most extreme and flippant parody of the tragic itself, of the ghastly earthly seriousness of earthly woe of old, a parody of that most crude phase in the unnaturalness of the ascetic ideal that had at length been overcome. That, as I have said, would have been quite worthy of a great tragedian, who, like every artist, first attains the supreme pinnacle of his greatness when he can look down into himself and his art, when he can laugh at himself. Is Wagner's Parsifal his secret laugh of superiority over himself? the triumph of that supreme artistic freedom and artistic transcendency which he had at length attained? We might, I repeat, wish it were so, for what can Parsifal taken seriously amount to? Is it really necessary to see in it, according to an expression once used against me, the product of an insane hate of knowledge, mind, and flesh? A curse on flesh and spirit in one breath of hate? An apostasy and reversion to the morbid Christian and obscurantist ideals? And finally, a self-negation and self-elimination on the part of an artist, who till then had devoted all the strength of his will to the contrary, namely the highest artistic expression of soul and body, and not only his art, of his life as well. Just remember with what enthusiasm Wagner followed in the footsteps of Feuerbach. Feuerbach's motto of healthy sensuality rang in the ears of Wagner during the thirties and forties of the century, as it did in the ears of many Germans. They dubbed themselves young Germans, like the word of redemption. Did he eventually change his mind on the subject? 
for it seems at any rate that he eventually wished to change his teaching on that subject and not only is that the case with the parsifal trumpets on the stage in the melancholy cramped and embarrassed lucubrations of his later years there are a hundred places in which there are manifestations of a secret will and wish a despondent uncertain unavowed will to preach actual retrogression conversion christianity medievalism and to say to his disciples all is vanity seek salvation elsewhere even the blood of the redeemer is once invoked four let me speak out my mind in a case like this which has many painful elements and it is a typical case it is certainly best to separate an artist from his work so completely that he cannot be taken as seriously as his work he is after all merely the presupposition of his work the womb the soil in certain cases the dung and manure on which and out of which it grows and consequently in most cases something that must be forgotten if the work itself is to be enjoyed the insight into the origin of the work is a matter for psychologists and vivisectors but never either in the present or the future for the aesthetes the artists the author and creator of parsifal was as little spared the necessity of sinking and living himself into the terrible depths and foundations of medieval soul contrasts the necessity of a malignant abstraction from all intellectual elevation severity and discipline the necessity of a kind of mental perversity if the reader will pardon me such a word as little as a pregnant woman is spared the horrors and marvels of pregnancy which I, as i have said must be forgotten if the child is to be enjoyed we must guard ourselves against the confusion into which an artist would fall only too easily to employ the english terminology out of psychological contiguity as though the artist himself actually were the object which he is able to represent imagine and express in point of fact the position is that even if he conceived he were such an object he would certainly not represent conceive express it homer would not have created an achilles nor goethe a faust if homer had been an achilles or if goethe had been a faust a complete and perfect artist is to all eternity separated from the real from the actual on the other hand it will be appreciated that he can at times get tired to the point of despair of this eternal unreality and falseness of his innermost being and that he then sometimes attempts to trespass on to the most forbidden ground on reality and attempts to have real existence with what success the success will be guessed it is the typical velleity of the artist the same velleity to which wagner fell a victim in his old age and for which he had to pay so dearly and so fatally he lost thereby his most valuable friends but after all quite apart from this velleity who would not wish emphatically for wagner's own sake that he had taken farewell of us and out of his art in a different manner not with a parsifal but in more victorious more self-confident more wagnerian style a style less misleading a style less ambiguous with regarding to his whole meaning less schopenhauerian less nihilistic five what then is the meaning of ascetic ideals in the case of an artist we are getting to understand their meaning nothing at all or so much that it is as good as nothing at all indeed what is the use of them our artists have for a long time past not taken up a sufficiently independent attitude either in the world or against it to warrant their valuations and the changes in these valuations exciting interest at all times that i have played the valet of some morality philosophy or religion quite apart from the fact that unfortunately they have often enough been the inordinately supple courtiers of their clients and patrons and the inquisitive toadies of the powers that are existing or even of the new powers to come to put it at its lowest they always need a rampart a support an already constituted authority artists never stand by themselves standing alone as opposed to their deepest instincts so for example did richard wagner take when the time had come the philosopher schopenhauer for his covering man in front for his rampart who would consider it even thinkable that he would have had the courage for an ascetic ideal without the support afforded him by the philosophy of schopenhauer without the authority of schopenhauer which dominated europe in the seventies this is without consideration of the question whether an artist without the milk of an orthodoxy would have been possible at all this brings us to the more serious question what is the meaning of a real philosopher paying homage to the aesthetic ideal 
a really self-dependent intellect like schopenhauer a man a knight with a glance of bronze who has the courage to be himself who knows how to stand alone without first waiting for men who cover him in front and the nods of his superiors let us now consider at once the remarkable attitude of schopenhauer towards art an attitude which has even a fascination for certain types for that is obviously the reason why richard wagner all at once went over to schopenhauer persuaded thereto as one knows by a poet her way went over so completely that there ensued the cleavage of a complete theoretic contradiction between his earlier and his later aesthetic faiths the earlier for example being expressed in opera and drama the later in the writings which he published from eighteen seventy onwards in particular wagner from that time onwards and this is the volte face which alienates us the most had no scruples about changing his judgment concerning the value and position of music itself what did he care if up to that time he had made of music a means a medium a woman that in order to thrive needed an end a man that is the drama he suddenly realized that more could be effected by the novelty of the schopenhauerian theory in majorem musicae gloriam that is to say by means of the sovereignty of music as schopenhauer understood it music abstracted from and opposed to all the other arts music as the independent art in itself not like the other arts affording reflections of the phenomenal world but rather the language of the will itself speaking straight out of the abyss as its most personal original and direct manifestation this extraordinary rise in the value of music a rise which seemed to grow out of the schopenhauerian philosophy was at once accompanied by an unprecedented rise in the estimation which the musician himself was held he became now an oracle a priest nay more than a priest a kind of mouthpiece for the intrinsic essence of things a telephone from the other world from henceforward he talked not only music did this ventriloquist of god he talked metaphysics what wonder that one day he eventually talked ascetic ideals six schopenhauer has made use of the kantian treatment of the aesthetic problem though he certainly did not regard it with kantian eyes kant thought that he showed honor to art when he favored and placed in the foreground those of the predicates of the beautiful which constitute the honor of knowledge impersonality and universality this is not the place to discuss whether this was not a complete mistake all that i wish to emphasize is that kant just like other philosophers instead of envisaging the aesthetic problem from the standpoint of the experiences of the artist the creator has only considered art and beauty from the standpoint of the spectator and has thereby imperceptibly imported the spectator himself into the idea of the beautiful but if only the philosophers of the beautiful had sufficient knowledge of the spectator knowledge of him as a great fact of personality as a great experience as a wealth of strong and most individual events desires surprises and raptures in the sphere of beauty but as i feared the contrary was always the case and so we get from our philosophers from the very beginning definitions on which the lack of a subtler personal experience squats like a fat worm of crass error as it does on kant's famous definition of the beautiful that is beautiful says kant which pleases without interesting without interesting compare this definition with this other one made by a real spectator and artist by stendhal who once called the beautiful une promesse de bonheur here at any rate the one point which kant makes prominent in the aesthetic position is repudiated and eliminated le disinteressement who is right kant or stendhal when forsooth our aesthetes never get tired of throwing into the scales in kant's favor the fact that under the magic of beauty men can look even naked female statues without interest we can certainly laugh a little at their expense in regard to this ticklish point the experiences of artists are more interesting and at any rate pygmalion was not necessarily an unesthetic man let us think all the better of the innocence of our aesthetes reflected it as it is in such arguments let us for instance count to kant's honor the country parson naivete of his doctrine concerning the peculiar character of the sense of touch and here we come back to schopenhauer who stood in much closer neighborhood to the arts than did kant and yet never escaped outside of the pale of that kantian definition how was that the circumstance is marvelous enough he interprets the expression without interest in the most personal fashion out of an experience which must in his case have been part and parcel of his regular routine 
on few subjects does schopenhauer speak with such certainty as on the working of aesthetic contemplation he says of it that it simply counteracts sexual interest like lulupin and Kempfor. he never gets tired of glorifying this escape from the life will as the great advantage and utility of aesthetic state in fact one is tempted to ask if his fundamental conception of will and idea the thought that there can only exist freedom from the will by means of idea did not originate in a generalization from the sexual experience in all questions concerning the schopenhauerian philosophy one should by the by never lose sight of the consideration that it is the conception of a youth of twenty-six so that it participates not only in what is peculiar to schopenhauer's life but in what is peculiar to that special period in his life let us listen for instance to one of the most expressive among the countless passages which he has written in honor of the aesthetic state world as will and idea book one page two thirty one let us listen to the tone the suffering the happiness the gratitude with which such words are uttered this is the painless state which epicurus praised as the highest good and as the state of the gods we are during that moment freed from the vile pressure of the will we celebrate the sabbath of the will's hard labor the wheel of ixion stands still what vehemence of language what images of anguish and protracted revulsion how almost pathological is that temporal antithesis between that moment and everything else the wheel of ixion the horrid labor of the will the vile pressure of the will but granted that schopenhauer was a hundred times right for himself personally how does that help our insight into the nature of the beautiful schopenhauer has described one effect of the beautiful the calming of the will but is this effect really normal as has been mentioned stendhal an equally sensual but more happily constituted nature than schopenhauer gives prominence to another effect of the beautiful the beautiful promises happiness to him it is just the excitement of the will the interest by the beauty that seems the essential fact and does not schopenhauer ultimately lay himself open to that objection that he is quite wrong in regarding himself as a kantian on this point that he has absolutely failed to understand in a kantian sense the kantian definition of the beautiful that this beautiful pleased him as well by meaning of an interest by means in fact of the strongest and most personal interest of all that of the victim of torture who escapes from his torture and to come back again to our first question what is the meaning of a philosopher paying homage to ascetic ideals we get now at any rate a first hint he wishes to escape from a torture seven let us beware of making dismal faces at the word torture there is certainly in this case enough to deduct enough to discount there is even something to laugh at for we must certainly not underestimate the fact that schopenhauer who in practice treated sexuality as a personal enemy including its tool woman that instrumentum diaboli needed enemies to keep him in a good humor that he loved grim bitter blackish green words that he raged for the sake of raging out of passion that he would have grown ill would have become a pessimist for he was not a pessimist however much he wished to be without his enemies without hegel woman sensuality and the whole will for existence keeping on without them schopenhauer would not have kept on that is a safe wager he would have run away but his enemies held him fast his enemies always enticed him back again to his existence his wrath was just as theirs was to the ancient cynics his balm his recreation his recompense his remedium against disgust his happiness so much with regard to what is most personal in the case of schopenhauer on the other hand there is still much which is typical in him and only now we have come back to our problem it is an accepted and indisputable fact so long as there are philosophers in the world and wherever philosophers have existed from india to england to take the opposite poles of philosophic ability that there exists a real irritation and rancor on the part of philosophers towards sensuality schopenhauer is merely the most eloquent and if one has the ear for it also the most fascinating and enchanting outburst there similarly exists a real philosophic bias and affection for the whole ascetic ideal there should be no illusions on this score both these feelings as has been said belong to the type if a philosopher lacks both of them then he is you may be certain of it never anything but a pseudo what does that mean for this state of affairs must first be interpreted in itself it stands there stupid to all eternity like any thing in itself 
every animal including la bête philosophe strives instinctively after an optimum of favorable conditions under which he can let his whole strength have his play and achieves his maximum consciousness of power with equal instinctiveness and with a fine perceptive flair which is superior to any reason every animal shudders mortally at every kind of disturbance and hindrance which obstructs or could obstruct his way to that optimum it is not his way to happiness of which i am talking but his way to power to action the most powerful action and in point of fact in many cases his way to unhappiness similarly the philosopher shudders mortally at marriage together with all that could persuade him to it marriage is a fatal hindrance on the way to the optimum up to the present what great philosophers have been married heraclitus plato descartes spinoza leibniz kant schopenhauer they were not married and further one cannot imagine them as married a married philosopher belongs to comedy that is my rule as for that exception of a socrates the malicious Socrates married himself, it seems, ironic, just to prove this very rule. Every philosopher would say, as Buddha said, when the birth of a son was announced to him, Rahula has been born to me, a fetter has been forged for me. Rahula means here a little demon. There must come an hour of reflection to every free spirit, granted that he had previously an hour of thoughtlessness. Just as one came once to the same Buddha, narrowly cramped he reflected is the life of the house it is the place of uncleanness freedom is found in leaving the house because he thought like this he left the house so many bridges to independence are shown in the ascetic ideal that the philosopher cannot refrain from exultation and clapping of hands when he hears the history of all those resolute ones who on one day uttered a nay to all servitude and went into some desert even granting that they were only strong asses and the absolute opposite of strong minds what then does the ascetic ideal mean in a philosopher this is my answer it will have been guessed long ago when he sees this ideal the philosopher smiles because he sees therein an optimum of the conditions of the highest and boldest intellectuality he does not deny existence he rather affirms thereby his existence and only his existence and this perhaps to the point of not being far off the blasphemous wish periat mundus fiat philosophia fiat philosophus fiam eight these philosophers you see are by no means uncorrupted witnesses and judges of the value of the ascetic ideal they think of themselves what is the saint to them they think of that which to them personally is most indispensable of freedom from compulsion disturbance noise freedom from business duties cares of a clean hand of the dance spring and flight of thoughts of good air rare clean free dry as is the air on the heights in which every animal creature becomes more intellectual and gains wings they think of peace in every cellar all the hounds neatly chained no baying of enmity and uncouth rancor no remorse of wounded ambition quiet and submissive internal organs busy as mills but unnoticed the heart alien transcendent future posthumous to summarize they mean by the ascetic ideal the joyous asceticism of a deified and newly fledged animal sweeping over life rather than resting we know what are the three great catchwords of the ascetic ideal poverty humility chastity and now just look closely at the life of all the great fruitful inventive spirits you will always find again and again these three qualities up to a certain extent not for a minute as is self-evident as though perchance they were part of their virtues what has this type of man to do with virtues but as the most essential and natural conditions of their best existence their finest fruitfulness in this connection it is quite possible that their predominant intellectualism had first to curb an unruly and irritable pride or an insolent sensualism or that it had all its work cut out to maintain its wish for the desert against perhaps an inclination to luxury and dilettantism or similarly against an extravagant liberality of heart and hand but their intellect did affect all this simply because it was the dominant instinct which carried through its orders in the case of all the other instincts 
it affects it still if it ceased to do so it would simply not be dominant but there is not one iota of virtue in all this further the desert of which i just spoke in which the strong independent and well-equipped spirits retreat into their hermitage oh how different is it from the cultured classes dream of a desert in certain cases in fact the cultured classes themselves are the desert and it is certain that all the actors of the intellect would not endure this desert for a minute it is nothing like romantic and syrian enough for them nothing like enough of a stage desert here as well there are plenty of asses but at this point the resemblance ceases but a desert nowadays is something like this perhaps a deliberate obscurity a getting out of the way of oneself a fear of noise admiration papers influence a little office a daily task something that hides rather than brings to light something associating with harmless cheerful beasts and fowl the sight of which refreshes a mountain for company but not a dead one one with eyes that is with lakes in certain cases even a room in a crowded hotel where one can reckon on not being recognized and on being able to talk with impunity to everyone here is the desert oh it is lonely enough believe me i grant that when heraclitus retreated to the courts and cloisters of the colossal temple of artemis that wilderness was worthier why do we lack such temples perchance we do not lack them i just think of my splendid study in the piazza di san marco in spring of course and in the morning between ten and twelve but that which heraclitus shunned is still just what we too avoid nowadays the noise and democratic babble of the ephesians their politics their news from the empire i mean of course persia their market trade and the things of to-day for there is one thing from which we philosophers especially need a rest from the things of to-day we honor the silent the cold the noble the far the past everything in fact at the sight of which the soul is not bound to brace itself up and defend itself something with which one can speak without speaking aloud just listen now to the tone of a spirit when it speaks every spirit has its own tone and loves its own tone that thing yonder for instance is bound to be an agitator that is a hollow head a hollow mug whatever may go into them everything comes back from him dull and thick heavy with the echo of a great void that spirit yonder nearly always speaks hoarse has he perchance thought himself hoarse and maybe so ask the physiologists but he who thinks in words thinks as a speaker and not as a thinker it shows that he does not think of objects or think objectively but only of his relations with objects that in point of fact he only thinks of himself and his audience this third one it speaks aggressively he comes too near our body his breath blows on us we shut our mouth involuntarily although he speaks to us through a book the tone of his style supplies the reason he has no time he has small faith in himself he finds expression now or never but a spirit who is sure of himself speaks softly he seeks secrecy he lets himself be awaited a philosopher is recognized by the fact that he shuns three brilliant and noisy things fame princes and women which is not to say that they do not come to him he shuns every glaring light therefore he shuns his time and its daylight therein he is as a shadow the deeper sinks the sun the greater grows the shadow as for his humility he endures as he endures darkness a certain dependence and obscurity further he is afraid of the shock of lightning he shudders at the insecurity of a tree which is too isolated and too exposed on which every storm vents its temper every temper its storm his maternal instincts his secret love for that which grows in him guides him into states where he is relieved from the necessity of taking care of himself in the same way in which the mother instinct in woman has thoroughly maintained up to the present woman's dependent position after all they demand little enough do these philosophers their favorite motto is he who possesses is possessed all this is not as i must say again and again to be attributed to a virtue to a meritorious wish for moderation and simplicity but because their supreme lord so demands of them demands wisely and inexorably their lord who is eager only for one thing for which alone he musters and for which alone he hoards everything time strength love interest 
This kind of man likes not to be disturbed by enmity. He likes not to be disturbed by friendship. It is a type which forgets or despises easily. It strikes him as bad form to play the martyr, to suffer for truth. He leaves all that to the ambitious and to the stage heroes of the intellect, and to all those, in fact, who have time enough for such luxuries. They themselves, the philosophers, have something to do for truth. They make a sparing use of big words. They are said to be adverse to the word truth itself. It has a certain highfalutin ring. Finally, as far as the chastity of philosophers is concerned, the fruitfulness of this type of mind is manifestly in another sphere than that of children. Perchance in some other sphere, too, they have the survival of their name, their literal immortality. Philosophers in ancient India would express themselves with still greater boldness. Of what use is posterity to him whose soul is the world? In this attitude there is not a trace of chastity, by reason of any ascetic scruple or hatred of the flesh, any more than it is chastity for an athlete or a jockey to abstain from women. It is rather the will of the dominant instinct, at any rate, during the period of their advanced philosophic pregnancy. Every artist knows the harm done by sexual intercourse on occasions of great mental strain and preparation. As far as the strongest artists and those with the surest instincts are concerned, this is not necessarily a case of experience, hard experience, but it is simply their maternal instinct which, in order to benefit the growing work, disposes recklessly, but beyond all its normal stocks and supplies, of the vigor of its animal life. The greater power then absorbs the lesser. Let us now apply this interpretation to gauge correctly the case of Schopenhauer, which we have already mentioned. In his case, the sight of the beautiful acted manifestly like a resolving irritant on the chief power of his nature, the power of contemplation and of intense penetration, so that this strength exploded and became suddenly master of his consciousness. But this by no means excludes the possibility of that particular sweetness and fullness, which is peculiar to the aesthetic state, springing directly from the ingredient of sensuality, just as that idealism which is peculiar to girls at puberty originates in the same source. It may be, consequently, that sensuality is not removed by the approach of the aesthetic state, as Schopenhauer believed, but merely becomes transfigured, and ceases to enter into the consciousness as sexual excitement. I shall return once again to this point in connection with the more delicate problem of the physiology of the aesthetic a subject which up to the present has been singularly untouched and unelucidated. 9. A certain asceticism, a grimly gay, wholehearted renunciation, is, as we have seen, one of the most favorable conditions for the highest intellectualism, and consequently for the most natural corollaries of such intellectualism. We shall therefore be proof against any surprise that the philosophers in particular are always treating the ascetic ideal with a certain amount of predilection. A serious historical investigation shows the bond between the ascetic ideal and philosophy to be still much tighter and still much stronger. It may be said that it was only in the leading strings of this ideal that philosophy really learnt to make its first steps and baby paces. Alas, how clumsily, alas, how crossly, alas, how ready to tumble down and lie on its stomach was this shy little darling of a brat with its bandy legs. The early history of philosophy is like that of all good things. For a long time they had not the courage to be themselves. They kept always looking round to see if no one would come to their help. Further, they were all afraid of all those who looked at them. Just enumerate in order the particular tendencies and virtues of the philosopher. His tendency to doubt, his tendency to deny, his tendency to wait, to be effectic, his tendency to analyze, search, explore, dare, his tendency to compare and to equalize, his will to be neutral and objective, his will for everything which is sine era et studio. Has it yet been realized that for quite a lengthy period these tendencies went counter to the first claims of morality and conscience? To say nothing at all of reason, which even Luther chose to call Frau Kluglin, the sly whore, has it been yet appreciated that a philosopher, in the event of his arriving at self-consciousness, must needs feel himself an incarnate nitimor inventitium, and consequently guard himself against his own sensations, against self-consciousness. It is, I repeat, just the same with all good things, on which we now pride ourselves. 
even judged by the standard of the ancient Greeks, our whole modern life, in so far as it is not weakness, but power and the consciousness of power, appears pure hubris and godlessness. For the things which are the very reverse of those which we honor today have had for a long time conscience on their side and God as their guardian hubris is our whole attitude to nature nowadays our violation of nature with the help of machinery and all the unscrupulous ingenuity of our scientists and engineers hubris is our attitude to god that is to some alleged teleological and ethical spider behind the meshes of the great trap of the causal web like charles the bold in his war with louis the eleventh we may say je combat l'universel arrané hubris is our attitude to ourselves for we experiment with ourselves in a way that we would not allow with any animal and with pleasure and curiosity open our soul and our living body what matters now to us the salvation of the soul we heal ourselves afterwards being ill is instructive we doubt it not even more instructive than being well inoculators of disease seem to us today even more necessary than any medicine men and saviors there is no doubt we do violence to ourselves nowadays we crackers of the soul's kernel we incarnate riddles who are ever asking riddles as though life were naught else than the cracking of a nut and even thereby must we necessarily become day by day more and more worthy to be asked questions and worthy to ask them even thereby do we perchance also become worthy to live all good things were once bad things from every original sin has grown an original virtue marriage for example seemed for a long time a sin against the rights of the community a man formerly paid a fine for the insolence of claiming one woman to himself to this phrase belongs for instance the jus prime noctis today still in cambodia the privilege of the priest that guardian of the good old customs the soft benevolent yielding sympathetic feelings eventually valued so highly that they almost became intrinsic values were for a long time actually despised by their possessors gentleness was then a subject for shame just as hardness is now compare beyond good and evil aphorism two sixty the submission to law oh with what qualms of conscience was it that the noble races throughout the world renounced the vendetta and gave the law power over themselves law was long a vetitium a blasphemy an innovation it was introduced with force like a force to which man only submitted with a sense of personal shame every tiny step forward in the world was formally made at the cost of mental and physical torture nowadays the whole of this point of view that not only stepping forward nay stepping at all movement change all needed their countless martyrs rings in our ears quite strangely i have put it forward in the dawn of day aphorism eighteen nothing is purchased more dearly says the same book a little later than the modicum of human reason and freedom which is now our pride but then our pride is the reason why it is now almost impossible for us to feel in sympathy with those immense periods of the morality of custom which lie at the beginning of the world's history constituting as they do the real decisive historical principle which has fixed the character of humanity those periods i repeat when throughout the world suffering passed for virtue cruelty for virtue deceit for virtue revenge for virtue repudiation of the reason for virtue and when conversely well-being passed current for danger the desire for knowledge for danger pity for danger peace for danger being pitied for shame work for shame madness for divinity and change for immorality and incarnate corruption Ten there is in the same book aphorism twelve an explanation of the burden of unpopularity under which the earliest race of contemplative men had to live despised almost as widely as they were first feared contemplation first appeared on earth in a disguised shape in an ambiguous form with an evil heart and often with an uneasy head there is no doubt about it the inactive brooding unwarlike element in the instincts of contemplative men long invested them with a cloud of suspicion the only way to combat this was to excite a definite fear 
and the old brahmins for example knew to a nicety how to do this the oldest philosophers were well versed in giving to their very existence and appearance meaning firmness background by reason whereof men learnt to fear them considered more precisely they did this from an even more fundamental need the need for of inspiring in themselves fear and self-reverence for they found even in their own souls all the valuations turned against themselves they had to fight down every kind of suspicion and antagonism against the philosophical element in themselves being men of a terrible age they did this with terrible means cruelty to themselves ingenious self-mortification this was the chief method of the ambitious hermits and intellectual revolutionaries who were obliged to force down the gods and the traditions of their own soul so as to enable themselves to believe in their own revolution i remember the famous story of the king vikvamitra who as the result of a thousand years of self-martyrdom reached such a consciousness of power and such a confidence in himself that he undertook to build a new heaven the sinister symbol of the oldest and newest history of philosophy in the whole world every one who has ever built anywhere a new heaven first found the power thereto in his own hell let us compress the facts into a short formula the philosophic spirit had in order to be possible to any extent at all to masquerade and disguise itself as one of the previously fixed types of the contemplative man to disguise itself as priest wizard soothsayer as religious man generally the ascetic ideal has for a long time served the philosopher as a superficial form as a condition which enabled him to exist to be able to be a philosopher he had to exemplify the ideal to exemplify it he was bound to believe in it the peculiarly etherealized abstraction of philosophers with their negation of the world their enmity to life their disbelief in the senses which has been maintained up to the present time and has almost thereby come to be accepted as the ideal philosophic attitude this abstraction is the result of those enforced conditions under which philosophy came into existence and continue to exist inasmuch as for quite a very long time philosophy would have been absolutely impossible in the world without an ascetic cloak and dress without an ascetic self-misunderstanding expressed plainly and palpably the ascetic priest has taken the repulsive and sinister form of the caterpillar beneath which and behind which alone philosophy could live and slink about has all that really changed has that flamboyant and dangerous winged creature that spirit which that caterpillar concealed within itself has it i say thanks to the sunnier warmer lighter world really and finally flung off its hood and escaped into the light can we today point to enough pride enough daring enough courage enough self-confidence enough mental will enough will for responsibility and a freedom of the will to enable the philosopher to be now in the world really possible eleven and now after we have caught sight of the ascetic priest let us tackle our problem what is the meaning of the ascetic ideal and now first becomes serious vitally serious we are now confronted with the real representatives of the serious what is the meaning of all seriousness this even more radical question is perchance already on the tip of our tongue a question fairly for physiologists but which we for the time being skip in that ideal the ascetic priest finds not only his faith but also his will his power his interest his right to existence stands and falls with that ideal what wonder that we have here run up against a terrible opponent on the supposition of course that we are the opponents of that ideal an opponent fighting for his life against those who repudiate that ideal on the other hand it is from the outset improbable that such a biased attitude toward our problem will do him any particular good the ascetic priest himself will scarcely prove the happiest champion of his own ideal on the same principle on which a woman usually fails when she wishes to champion woman let alone providing the most objective critic and judge of the controversy now raised we shall therefore so much as already obvious rather have actually to help him to defend himself properly against ourselves than we shall have the fear being too well beaten by him the ideal which is the subject of this dispute is the value of our life from the standpoint of the ascetic priests this life then together with a whole of which it is part nature 
the world, the whole sphere of becoming and passing away, is placed by them in relation to an existence of quite another character, which it excludes and to which it is opposed, unless it deny its own self. In this case, the case of an ascetic life, life is taken as a bridge to another existence. The ascetic treats life as a maze in which one must walk backwards till one comes to the place where it starts, or he treats it as an error which one may, nay must, refute by action, for he demands that he should be followed, he enforces where he can his valuation of existence. What does this mean? Such a monstrous valuation is not an exceptional case, or a curiosity recorded in human history. It was one of the most general and persistent facts that there are. The reading from the vantage of a distant star and of the capital letters of our earthly life would perchance lead to the conclusion that the earth was the especially ascetic planet, a den of discontented, arrogant, and repulsive creatures who never got rid of a deep disgust of themselves, of the world, of all life, and did themselves as much hurt as possible out of the pleasure in hurting, presumably their one and only pleasure. Let us consider how regularly, how universally, how practically, at every single period, the ascetic priest puts in his appearance. He belongs to no particular race. He thrives everywhere. He grows out of all classes. Not that he perhaps bred this valuation by heredity and propagated it. The contrary is the case. It must be a necessity of the first order which makes this species hostile, as it is to life. Always grow again and always thrive again. Life itself must certainly have an interest in the continuance of such a type of self-contradiction. For an ascetic life is a self-contradiction. Here rules resentment without parallel, the resentment of an insatiate instinct and ambition, that would be master, not over some element in life, but over life itself, over life's deepest, strongest, innermost conditions. Here is an attempt made to utilize power, to damn the sources of power, here does the green eye of jealousy turn even against physiological well-being, especially against the expression of such well-being, beauty, joy, while a sense of pleasure is experienced and sought in abortion, in decay, in pain, in misfortune, in ugliness, in voluntary punishment, in the exercising flagellation and sacrifice of the self. All this is in the highest degree paradoxical. We are here confronted with a rift that wills itself to be a rift which enjoys itself in the very suffering, and even becomes more and more certain of itself, more and more triumphant in proportion as its own presupposition, physiological vitality, decreases. The triumph just is the supreme agony. Under this extravagant emblem did the ascetic ideal fight from of old. In this mystery of seduction, in this picture of rapture and torture, it recognized its brightest light, its salvation, its final victory, crux, nux, lux, it has all these three in one. End of section five. Section six of the Genealogy of Morals by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Third essay, What is the Meaning of Ascetic Ideals? Part two. Twelve. Granted that such an incarnate will for contradiction and unnaturalness is induced to philosophize, on what will it vent its pet caprice, on that which has been felt with the greatest certainty to be true, to be real, it will look for error in those very places where the life instinct fixes truth with the greatest positiveness. It will, for instance, after the example of the ascetics of the Vedanta philosophy, reduce matter to an illusion, and similarly treat pain, multiplicity, the whole logical contrast of subject and object, errors, nothing but errors. To renounce the belief in one's own ego, to deny to oneself one's own reality, what a triumph! And here already we have a much higher kind of triumph which is not merely a triumph over the senses, over the palpable, but an infliction of violence and cruelty on reason, and this ecstasy culminates in the ascetic self-contempt, the ascetic scorn of one's own reason making this decree. There is a domain of truth and of life, but reason is specifically excluded therefrom. By the by, even in the Kantian idea of the intelligible character of things, there remains a trace of that schism, 
so dear to the heart of the ascetic that schism which likes to turn reason against reason in fact intelligible character means in kant a kind of quality in things of which the intellect comprehends so much that for it the intellect it is absolutely incomprehensible after all let us in our character of knowers not be ungrateful towards such determined reversals of the ordinary perspectives and values with which the mind had for too long raged against itself with an apparently futile sacrilege in the same way the very seeing of another vista the very wishing to see another vista is no little training and preparation of the intellect for its eternal objectivity objectivity being understood not as contemplation without interest for that is inconceivable and nonsensical but as the ability to have the pros and cons in one's power and to switch them on and off so as to get to know how to utilize for the advancement of knowledge the difference in the perspective and in the emotional interpretations but let us forsooth my philosophic colleagues henceforward guard ourselves more carefully against this mythology of dangerous ancient ideals which has set up a pure willless painless timeless subject of knowledge let us guard ourselves from the tentacles of such contradictory ideas as pure reason absolute spirituality knowledge in itself in these theories an eye that cannot be thought of is required to think an eye which ex hypothesis has no direction at all an eye in which the active and interpreting functions are cramped are absent those functions i say by means of which abstract seeing first became seeing something in these theories consequently the absurd and the nonsensical is always demanded of the eye there is only a seeing from a perspective only a knowing from a perspective and the more emotions we express over the thing the more eyes different eyes we train on the same thing the more complete will our idea of that thing our objectivity but the elimination of the wheel altogether the switching off of the emotions all and sundry granted that we could do so what would not that be called intellectual castration thirteen but let us turn back such a self-contradiction as apparently manifests itself among the ascetics life turned against life is so much as absolutely obvious from the physiological and not now from the psychological standpoint simply nonsense it can only be an apparent contradiction it must be a kind of provisional expression an explanation a formula an adjustment a psychological misunderstanding of something whose real nature could not be understood for a long time and whose real essence could not be described a mere word jammed into an old gap of human knowledge to put briefly the facts against its being real the ascetic ideal springs from the prophylactic and self-preservative instincts which mark a decadent life which seeks by every means in its power to maintain its position and fight for its existence it points to a partial physiological depression and exhaustion against which the most profound and intact life instincts fight ceaselessly with new weapons and discoveries the ascetic ideal is such a weapon its position is consequently exactly the reverse of that which the worshippers of the ideal imagine life struggles in it and through it with death and against death the ascetic ideal is a dodge for the preservation of life an important fact is brought out in the extent to which as history teaches this ideal could rule and exercise power over man especially in all those places where the civilization and taming of man was completed that fact is the diseased state of man up to the present at any rate of the man who has been tamed the physiological struggle of man with death more precisely with the disgust with life with exhaustion with the wish for the end the ascetic priest is the incarnate wish for an existence of another kind an existence on another plane he is in fact the highest point of this wish its official ecstasy and passion but it is the very power of this wish which is to fetter that binds him here it is just that which makes him into a tool that must labor to create more favorable conditions for earthly existence for existence on the human plane it is with this very power that he keeps the whole herd of failures distortions abortions unfortunate sufferers from themselves of every kind fast to existence while he as the herdsman goes instinctively on in front 
you understand me already this ascetic priest this apparent enemy of life this denier he actually belongs to the really great conservative and affirmative forces of life what does it come from this diseased state for man is more diseased more uncertain more changeable more unstable than any other animal there is no doubt about it he is the diseased animal what does it spring from certainly he has also dared innovated braved more challenged fate more than all the other animals put together he the great experimenter with himself the unsatisfied the insatiate who struggles for the supreme mastery with beast nature and gods he the as yet ever uncompelled the ever future who finds no more any rest from his own aggressive strength goaded inexorably on by the spur of the future dug into the flesh of the present how should not so brave and rich an animal also be the most endangered the animal with the longest and deepest sickness among all sick animals man is sick of it often enough there are whole epidemics of this satiety as about thirteen forty eight at the time of the dance of death but even this very nausea this tiredness this disgust with himself all this is discharged from him with such force that it is immediately made into a new fetter his nay which he utters to life brings to light as though by magic an abundance of graceful yeas even when he wounds himself this master of destruction of self-destruction it is subsequently the wound itself that forces him to live fourteen the more normal is this sickliness in man and we cannot dispute this normality the higher honor should be paid to the rare cases of psychical and physical powerfulness the windfalls of humanity and the more strictly should the sound be guarded from the worst of air the air of the sick room is that done the sick are the greatest danger for the healthy it is not for the strongest that harm comes from the strong but from the weakest is that known broadly considered it is not for a minute the fear of man whose diminution should be wished for for this fear forces the strong to be strong to be at times terrible it preserves in its integrity the sound type of man what is to be feared what does work with a fatality found in no other fate is not the great fear of but the great nausea with man and equally so the great pity for man supposing that both these things were one day to espouse each other then inevitably the maximum of monstrousness would immediately come into the world the last will of man his will for nothingness nihilism and in sooth the way is well paved thereto he who not only has his nose to smell but also has his eyes and ears he sniffs about wherever he goes to-day an air something like that of a madhouse the air of a hospital i am speaking as stands to reason of the cultured areas of mankind of every kind of europe that there is in fact in the world the sick are the great danger of man not the evil not the beasts of prey they who are from the outset botched oppressed broken those are they the weakest are they who most undermine the life beneath the feet of man who instill the most dangerous venom and scepticism into our trust of life in man and ourselves where shall we escape from it from that covert look from which we carry away a deep sadness from that averted look of him who is misborn from the beginning that look which betrays what such a man says to himself that look which is a groan would that i were something else so groans this look but there is no hope i am what i am how could i get away from myself and verily i am sick of myself on such a soil of self-contempt a veritable swamp soil grows that weed that poisonous growth and all so tiny so hidden so ignoble so sugary here teem the worms of revenge and vindictiveness here the air reeks of things secret and unmentionable here is ever spun the net of the most malignant conspiracy the conspiracy of the sufferers against the sound and the victorious here is the sigh of the most victorious hated and what lying so as not to acknowledge this hate as hate what a show of big words and attitudes what an art of righteous calumniation these abortions what a noble eloquence gushes from their lips what an amount of sugary slimy humble submission oozes in their eyes what do they really want 
at any rate to represent righteousness love wisdom superiority that is the ambition of these lowest ones these sick ones and how clever does such an ambition make them you cannot in fact but admire the counterfeiter dexterity with which the stamp of virtue even the ring the golden ring of virtue is here imitated they have taken a lease of virtue absolutely for themselves have these weaklings and wretched invalids there is no doubt about it we alone are the good the righteous so do they speak we alone are the omnes bonce voluntatis they stalk about in our midst as living reproaches as warnings for us as though health fitness strength pride the sensation of power were really vicious things in themselves for which one would have some day to do penance bitter penance oh how they themselves are ready in their hearts to exact penance how they thirst after being hangmen among them is an abundance of revengeful ones disguised as judges whoever mouth the word righteousness like the venomous spittle with mouth i say always pursed always ready to spit at everything which does not wear a discontented look but is of good cheer as it goes on its way among them again is that most loathsome species of the vain the lying abortions who make a point of representing beautiful souls and perchance of bringing to the market as purity of heart the distorted sensualism swathed in verses and other bandages the species of self-comforters and masturbators of their own souls the sick man's will to represent some form or other of superiority his instinct for crooked paths which lead to a tyranny over the healthy where can it not be found this will to power of the very weakest the sick woman especially no one surpasses her in refinements for ruling oppressing tyrannizing the sick woman moreover spares nothing living nothing dead she grubs up again the most buried things the bogos say woman is a hyena look into the background of every family of every body of every community everywhere the fight of the sick against the healthy a silent fight for the most part with minute poison powders with pin pricks with spiteful grimaces of patience but also at times with that diseased pharisaism of pure pantomime which plays for the choice role of righteous indignation right into the hallowed chambers of knowledge can it make itself heard can this hoarse yelping of sick hounds this rabid lying and frenzy of such noble pharisees i remind readers who have ears once more of that berlin apostle of revenge eugen during who makes most disreputable and revolting use in all present-day germany of moral refuse during the paramount moral blusterer that there is to-day even among his own kind the anti-semites they are all men of resentment are these physiological distortions and warm riddled objects a whole quivering kingdom of burrowed revenge indefatigable and insatiable in its outbursts against the happy and equally so in disguises for a revenge and pretexts for revenge when will they really reach their final fondest most sublime triumph of revenge at that time doubtless when they succeed in pushing their own misery in fact all misery into the consciousness of the happy so that the latter begin one day to be ashamed of their happiness and perchance say to themselves when they meet it is a shame to be happy there is too much misery but there cannot possibly be a greater and more fatal misunderstanding than that of the happy the fit the strong in body and soul beginning in this way to doubt the right to happiness away with this perverse world away with this shameful soddenness of sentiment preventing the sick making the healthy sick for that is what such a soddenness comes to this ought to be our supreme object in the world but for this it is above all essential that the healthy should remain separated from the sick that they should even guard themselves from the look of the sick that they should not even associate with the sick or may it perchance be their mission to be nurses or doctors but they could not mistake and disown their mission more grossly the higher must not degrade itself to be the tool of the lower the pathos of distance must to all eternity keep their missions also separate the right of the happy to existence the right of bells with a full tone over the discordant cracked bells is verily a thousand times greater they alone are the sureties of the future they alone are bound to man's future what they can what they must do 
that can the sick never do should never do but if they are to be enabled to do what only they must do how can they possibly be free to play the doctor the comforter the savior of the sick and therefore good air good air and away at any rate from the neighborhood of all the madhouses and hospitals of civilization and therefore good company our own company or solitude if it must be so but away at any rate from the evil fumes of internal corruption and the secret worm-eaten state of the sick that forsooth my friends we may defend ourselves at any rate for still a time against the two worst plagues that could have been reserved for us against the great nausea with man against the great pity for man fifteen if you have understood in all their depths and i demand that you should grasp them profoundly and understand them profoundly the reasons for the impossibility of its being the business of the healthy to nurse the sick to make the sick healthy it follows that you have grasped this further necessity the necessity of doctors and nurses who themselves are sick and now we have and hold with both our hands the essence of the ascetic priest the ascetic priest must be accepted by us as the predestined savior herdsman and champion of the sick herd thereby do we first understand his awful historic mission the lordship over sufferers is his kingdom to that point his instinct in that he finds his own special art his master skill his kind of happiness he must himself be sick he must be kith and kin to the sick and the abortions so as to understand them so as to arrive at an understanding with them but he must also be strong even more master of himself than of others impregnable forsooth in his will for power so as to acquire the trust and the awe of the weak so that he can be their hold bulwark prop compulsion overseer tyrant god he has to protect them protect his herds against whom against the healthy doubtless also against the envy towards the healthy he must be the natural adversary and scorner of every rough stormy rainless hard violent predatory health and power the priest is the first form of the most delicate animal that scorns more easily than it hates he will not be spared the waging of war with the beasts of prey a war of guile of spirit rather than of force as is self-evident he will in certain cases find it necessary to conjure up out of himself or at any rate to represent practically a new type of the beast of prey a new animal monstrosity in which the polar bear the supple cold crouching panther and not least important the fox are joined together in a trinity as fascinating as it is fearsome if necessity exacts it then will he come on the scene with bearish seriousness venerable wise cold full of treacherous superiority as the herald and mouthpiece of mysterious powers sometimes going among even the other kinds of beasts of prey determined as he is to sow on their soil wherever he can suffering discord self-contradiction and only too sure of his art always to be lord of sufferers at all times he brings with him doubtless salve and balsam but before he can play the physician he must first wound so while he soothes the pain with which the wound makes he at the same time poisons the wound well versed is he in this above all things is this wizard and wild beast and tamer in whose vicinity everything healthy must needs become ill and everything ill must needs become tame he protects in sooth his sick herd well enough does this strange herdsman he protects them against themselves against the sparks even in the centre of the herd of wickedness knavery malice and all the other ills that the plaguey and the sick are heir to he fights with cunning hardness and stealth against anarchy and against the ever imminent break-up inside the herd where resentment that most dangerous blasting stuff and explosive ever accumulates and accumulates getting rid of this blasting stuff in such a way that it does not blow up the herd and the herdsmen that is his real feat his supreme utility if you wish to comprise in the shortest formula the value of the priestly life it would be correct to say the priest is the diverter of the course of resentment every sufferer in fact searches instinctively for a cause of his suffering to put it more exactly a doer to put it still more precisely a sentient responsible doer in brief 
something living on which either actually or in effigy he can on any pretext vent his emotions for the venting of emotions is the sufferer's greatest attempt at alleviation that is to say stupefaction his mechanically desired narcotic against pain of any kind it is in this phenomenon alone that is found according to my judgment the real physiological cause of resentment revenge and their family is to be found that is in a demand for the deadening of pain through emotion this cause is generally but in my view very erroneously looked for the defensive parry of a bare protective principle of reaction of a reflex movement in the case of any sudden hurt and danger after the manner that a decapitated frog still moves in order to get away from a corrosive acid but the difference is fundamental in one case the object is to prevent being hurt any more in the other case the object is to deaden a racking insidious nearly unbearable pain by a more violent emotion of any kind whatsoever and at any rate for the time being to drive it out of the consciousness for this purpose an emotion is needed as wild an emotion as possible and to excite that emotion some excuse or other is needed it must be somebody's fault that i feel bad this kind of reasoning is peculiar to all invalids and is but the more pronounced the more ignorant they remain of the real cause of their feeling bad the physiological cause the cause may lie in a disease of the nervous sympathicus or in an excessive secretion of bile or in a want of sulphate and phosphate of potash in the blood or in pressure in the bowels which stops the circulation in the blood or in degeneration of the ovaries and so forth all sufferers have an awful resourcefulness and ingenuity in finding excuses for painful emotions they even enjoy their jealousy their broodings over base actions and apparent injuries they burrow through the intestines of their past and present in their search for obscure mysteries wherein they will be at liberty to wallow in a torturing suspicion and get drunk on the venom of their own malice they tear open the oldest wounds they make themselves bleed from the scars which have long been healed they make evil-doers out of friends wife child and everything which is nearest to them i suffer it must be somebody's fault so thinks every sick sheep but his herdsman the ascetic priest says to him quite so my sheep it must be the fault of some one but thou thyself art that same one it is all the fault of thyself alone it is all the fault of thyself alone against thyself that is bold enough false enough but one thing is at least attained thereby as i have said the course of resentment is diverted sixteen you can see now what remedial instinct of life has at least tried to effect according to my conception through the ascetic priest and the purpose for which he had to employ a temporary tyranny of such paradoxical and anomalous ideas as guilt sin sinfulness corruption damnation what was done was to make the sick harmless up to a certain point to destroy the incurable by means of themselves to turn the milder cases severely on to themselves to give the resentment a backwards direction man needs but one thing and to exploit similarly the bad instincts of all sufferers with a view to self-discipline self-surveillance self-mastery it is obvious that there can be no question at all in the case of a medication of this kind a mere emotional medication of any real healing of the sick in the physiological sense it cannot even for a moment be asserted that in this connection the instinct of life has taken healing as its goal and purpose on the one hand a kind of congestion and organization of the sick the word church is the most popular name for it on the other a kind of provisional safeguarding of the comparatively healthy the more perfect specimens the cleavage of a rift between healthy and sick for a long time that was all and it was much it was very much i am proceeding as you see in this essay from an hypothesis which as far as such readers as i want are concerned does not require to be proved the hypothesis that sinfulness in man is not an actual fact but rather the interpretation of a fact of a physiological discomfort a discomfort seen through a moral religious perspective which is no longer binding upon us the fact therefore that any one feels guilty shameful is certainly not yet any proof that he is right in feeling so 
any more than any one is healthy simply because he feels healthy. Remember the celebrated witch ordeals. In those ideas the most acute and humane judges had no doubt but that in these cases they were confronted with guilt. The witches themselves had no doubt on this point. And yet the guilt was lacking. Let me elaborate this hypothesis. I do not for a minute accept the very pain in the soul as a real fact, but only as an explanation, a causal explanation, of facts that could not hitherto be precisely formulated. I regard it therefore as something as yet absolutely in the air, and devoid of scientific cogency. Just the nice fat word in the place of a lean note of interrogation. When anyone fails to get rid of his pain in the soul, the cause is, speaking crudely, to be found not in his soul, but more probably in his stomach. Speaking crudely, I repeat, but by no means wishing thereby that you should listen to me or understand me in a crude spirit. A strong and well-constituted man digests his experiences, deeds and misdeeds all included, just as he digests his meats, even when he has some tough morsels to swallow. If he fails to relieve himself of an experience, this kind of indigestion is quite as much physiological as the other indigestion, and indeed in more ways than one, simply one of the results of the other. You can adopt such a theory and yet entre nous be nevertheless the strongest opponent of all materialism. 17. But is he really a physician, this ascetic priest? We already understand why we are scarcely allowed to call him a physician, however much he likes to feel a savior and let himself be worshipped as a savior. It is only the actual suffering, the discomfort of the sufferer, which he combats, not its cause, not the actual state of sickness. This needs must constitute our most radical objection to the priestly medication. But just once put yourself into that point of view, of which the priests have a monopoly, you will find it hard to exhaust your amazement at what from that standpoint he has completely seen, sought, and found. The mitigation of suffering, every kind of consoling, all this manifests itself as his very genius. With what ingenuity has he interpreted his mission to, of consoler? With what aplomb and audacity has he chosen weapons necessary for the part? Christianity in particular should be dubbed a great treasure chamber of ingenious consolations, such a store of refreshing, soothing, deadening drugs as it accumulated within itself, so many of the most dangerous and daring expedients has it hazarded, with such subtlety, refinement, oriental refinement, has it divined what emotional stimulants can conquer, at any rate for a time, the deep depression, the leaden fatigue, the black melancholy of physiological cripples, for speaking generally, all religions are mainly concerned with fighting a certain fatigue and heaviness that has infected everything. You can regard it as prima facie probable that in certain places in the world there was almost bound to prevail from time to time among large masses of the population a sense of physiological depression, which, however, owing to their lack of physiological knowledge, did not appear to their consciousness as such so that consequently its cause and its cure can only be sought and essayed in the science of moral psychology. This, in fact, is my most general formula for what is generally called a religion. Such a feeling of depression can have the most diverse origins, and may be the result of the crossing of two heterogeneous races, or of classes. Genealogical and racial differences are also brought out of the classes. The European Weltschmerz, the pessimism of the nineteenth century is really the result of an absurd and sudden class mixture and may be brought about by a mistaken emigration a race falling into a climate for which its power of adaptation is insufficient the case of the persians in india and may be the effect of old age and fatigue the parisian pessimism from eighteen fifty onwards and may be the wrong diet the alcoholism of the middle ages the nonsense of vegetarianism which, however, have in their favor the authority of Sir Christopher and Shakespeare. It may be blood, deterioration, malaria, syphilis, and the like. German depression after thirty years' war, which infected half of Germany with evil diseases and thereby paved the way for German civility, for German pusillanimity. In such a case there is invariably recourse to a war on a grand scale with the feeling of depression, 
let us inform ourselves briefly on its most important practices and phases i leave on one side as stands to reason the actual philosophic war against the feeling of depression which is usually simultaneous it is interesting enough but too absurd too practically negligible too full of cobwebs too much of a hole and corner affair especially when pain is proved to be a mistake on the naive hypothesis that pain must needs vanish when the mistake underlying it is recognized but behold it does anything but vanish that dominant depression is primarily fought by weapons which reduce the consciousness of life itself to the lowest degree wherever possible no more wishes no more wants shun everything which produces emotion which produces blood eating no salt the faker hygiene no love no hate equanimity no revenge no getting rich no work begging as far as possible no woman or as little woman as possible as far as the intellect is concerned pascal's principle il faut s'habiter to put the result in ethical and psychological language self-annihilation sanctification to put it in physiological language hypnotism the attempt to find some approximate human equivalent for what hibernation is for certain animals for what estivation is for many tropical plants a minimum of assimilation and metabolism in which life just manages to subsist without really coming up into consciousness an amazing amount of human energy has been devoted to this object perhaps uselessly there cannot be the slightest doubt but that such sportsmen of saintliness in whom at times nearly every nation has abounded have really found a genuine relief from that which they have combated with such a rigorous training in countless cases they really escaped by the help of their system of hypnotism away from deep physiological depression their method is consequently counted among the most universal ethnological facts similarly it is improper to consider such a plan for starving the physical element and its desires as in itself a symptom of insanity as a clumsy species of roast beef eating free thinkers and sir christophers are fain to do all the more certain is it that their method can and does pave the way of, to all kinds of mental disturbances for instance inner lights as far as the case of the hayshits of mount althos auditory and visual hallucinations voluptuous ecstasies and effervescences of sensualism the history of saint teresa the explanation of such events given by the victims is always the acme of fanatical falsehood this is self-evident note well however the tone of the implicit gratitude that rings in the very will for an explanation of such character the supreme state salvation itself that final goal of universal hypnosis and peace is always regarded by them as the mystery of mysteries which even the most supreme symbols are inadequate to express it is regarded as an entry and homecoming to the essence of things as a liberation from all illusions as knowledge as truth as being as an escape from every end every wish every action as something even beyond good and evil good and evil quoth the buddhists both are fetters the perfect man is master of them both the done and the undone quoth the disciple of the vandanta do him no hurt the good and the evil he shakes off from him sage that he is his kingdom suffers no more from any act good and evil he goes beyond them both an absolutely indian conception as much brahmanist as buddhist neither in the indian nor in the christian doctrine is this redemption regarded as attainable by means of virtue and moral improvement however high they may place the value of the hypnotic efficiency of virtue keep clear on this point indeed it simply corresponds with the facts the fact that they remain true on this point is perhaps to be regarded as the best specimen of realism in the three great religions absolutely soaked as they are with morality with this one objection for those who know there is no duty redemption is not attained by the acquisition of virtues for redemption consists in being one with brahman who is incapable of acquiring any perfection and equally little does it consist in the giving up of faults for the brahman unity with whom is what constitutes redemption is eternally pure these passages are from the commentaries on the kankara quoted from the first real european expert of the indian philosophy my friend paul doyson we wish therefore to pay honor to the idea of redemption in the great religions 
but it is somewhat hard to remain serious in view of the appreciation meted out to the deep sleep by these exhausted pessimists who are too tired even to dream to the deep sleep considered that is an, as already effusing into brahman as the attainment of the unio mystica with god when he has completely gone to sleep says on this point the oldest and most venerable script and comes to perfect rest so that he sees no more any vision then o oh dear one is he united with being he has entered into his own self encircled by the self with its absolute knowledge he has no more any consciousness of that which is without or of that which is within day and night cross not these bridges nor age nor deaths nor suffering nor good deeds nor evil deeds in deep sleep say similarly the believers in this deepest of the three great religions does the soul lift itself from out of this body of ours enters the supreme light and stands out therein in its true shape therein is it the supreme spirit itself which travels about while it rests and plays and enjoys itself whether with women or chariots or friends there do its thoughts turn no more back to this appanage of a body to which the prana the vital breath is harnessed like a beast of burden to the cart nonetheless we will take care to realize as we did when discussing redemption that in spite of all its pomps of oriental extravagance this simply expresses the same criticism on life as did the clear cold greekly cold but yet still suffering epicurus the hypnotic sensation of nothingness the peace of deepest sleep anesthesia in short that is what passes with the sufferers and the absolutely depressed for forsooth their supreme good their value of values that is what must be measured by them as something positive be felt by them as the essence of all the positive according to the same logic of the feelings nothingness is in all pessimistic religions called god eighteen such a hypnotic deadening of sensibility and susceptibility to pain which presupposes somewhat rare powers especially courage contempt of opinion intellectual stoicism is less frequent than another and certainly easier training which is tried against the states of depression i mean mechanical activity it is indisputable that a suffering existence can be thereby considerably alleviated this fact is called today by the somewhat ignoble title of the blessing of work the alleviation consists in the attention of the sufferer being absolutely diverted from suffering in the incessant monopoly of this consciousness by action so that consequently there is little room left for suffering for narrow is it this chamber of human consciousness mechanical activity and its corollaries such as absolute regularity punctilious unreasoning obedience the chronic routine of life the complete occupation of time a certain liberty to be impersonal nay a training in impersonality self-forgetfulness incuria sui with what thoroughness and expert subtlety have all these methods been exploited by the ascetic priest in his war with pain when he asks to tackle sufferers of the lowest orders slaves or prisoners or women who for the most part are a compound of labor slave and prisoner all he has to do is to juggle a little with the names and to rechristen so as to make them see henceforth a benefit a comparative happiness in objects which they hated the slave's discontent with his lot was at any rate not invented by the priests an even more popular means of fighting depression is the ordaining of a little joy which is easily accessible and can be made into a rule this medication is frequently used in conjunction with the former ones the most frequent form in which joy is prescribed as a cure is the joy in producing joy such as doing good giving presents alleviating helping exhorting comforting praising treating with distinction together with the prescription of love your neighbor the ascetic priest prescribes though in the most cautious doses what is practically a stimulation of the strongest and most life assertive impulse the will to power the happiness involved in the smallest superiority which is the concomitant of all benefiting helping extolling making oneself useful is the most ample consolation of which if they are well advised physiological distortions avail themselves in other cases they hurt each other and naturally in obedience to the same radical instinct 
an investigation of the origin of christianity in the roman world shows that cooperative unions for poverty sickness and burial sprang up in the lowest stratum of contemporary society amid which the chief antidote against depression the little joy experienced in mutual benefits was deliberately fostered perchance this was then novelty a real discovery this conjuring up of the will for cooperation for family organization for communal life for ke nakula necessarily brought the will to power which had been already infinitesimally stimulated to a new and much fuller manifestation the herd organization is a genuine advance and triumph in the fight with depression with the growth of the community there matures even to individuals a new interest which often enough takes him out of the more personal element in his discontent his aversion to himself the despecta sui of gelinux all sick and diseased people strive instinctively after a herd organization out of a desire to shake off their sense of oppressive discomfort and weakness the ascetic priest divines this instinct and promotes it wherever a herd exists it is the instinct of weakness which has wished for the herd and the cleverness of the priest which has organized it for mark this by an equally natural necessity the strong strive as much for isolation as the weak for union when the former bind themselves it is only with a view to an aggressive joint action and joint satisfaction of their will to power much against the wishes of their individual consciences the latter on the contrary range themselves together with positive delight in such a muster their instincts are as much gratified thereby as the instincts of the born master that is the solitary beast of prey species of man are disturbed and wounded to the quick by organization there is always lurking beneath every oligarchy such as the universal lesson of history the desire for tyranny every oligarchy is continually quivering with the tension of the effort required by each individual to keep mastering this desire such for instance was the greek plato shows it in a hundred places plato who knew his contemporaries and himself nineteen the methods employed by the ascetic priest which we have already learned to know stifling of all vitality mechanical energy the little joy and especially the method of love your neighbor herd organization the awaking of the communal consciousness of power to such a pitch that the individual is disgusted with himself becomes eclipsed by his delight in the thriving of the community these are according to modern standards the innocent methods employed in the fight with depression let us turn now to the more interesting topic of the guilty methods the guilty methods spell one thing to produce emotional excess which is used as the most efficacious anaesthetic against their depressing state of protracted pain this is why priestly ingenuity has proved quite inexhaustible in thinking out this one question by what means can you produce an emotional excess this sounds harsh it is manifest that it would sound nicer and would grate on one's ears less if i were to say forsooth the ascetic priest made use at all times of the enthusiasm contained in all strong emotions but what is the good of still soothing the delicate ears of our modern effeminates what is the good on our side of budging one single inch before their verbal pecksniffianisms for us psychologists to do that would be at once practical pecksniffianism apart from the fact of its nauseating us the good taste others might say the righteousness of a psychologist nowadays consists if at all in combating the shamefully moralized language with which all modern judgments on man and things are smeared for do not deceive yourself what constitutes the chief characteristic of the modern souls and of modern books is not the lying but the innocence which is part and parcel of their intellectual dishonesty the inevitable running up against this innocence everywhere constitutes the most distasteful feature of this somewhat dangerous business which a modern psychologist has to undertake it is a part of our great danger it is a road which perhaps leads straight to the great nausea i know quite well the purpose which all modern books will and can serve granted that they last which i am not afraid of and granted equally that there is to be some future day a generation with a more rigid more severe and healthier taste the function which all modernity generally will serve with posterity that of an emetic and this by reason of its moral sugariness and falsity its ingrained feminism which it is pleased to call idealism and at any rate believes to be idealism our cultured men of to-day 
are good men do not lie that is true but it does not redound to their honor the real lie the genuine determined honest lie on whose value you can listen to plato would prove too tough and too strong an article for them by a long way it would be asking them to do what people have been forbidden to ask them to do to open their eyes to their own selves and to learn to distinguish between true and false in their own selves the dishonest lie alone suits them everything which fools a good man is perfectly incapable of any other attitude to anything than that of a dishonorable liar an absolute liar but none the less an innocent liar a blue-eyed liar a virtuous liar these good men they are all now tainted with morality through and through and as far as honor is concerned they are disgraced and corrupted for all eternity which of them could stand a further truth about man or put more tangibly which of them could put up with a true biography one or two instances lord byron composed a most personal autobiography but thomas moore was too good for it he burnt his friend's papers dr gwinner schopenhauer's executor is said to have done the same for schopenhauer as well wrote much about himself and perhaps also against himself eyes a o on the virtuous american thayer beethoven's biographer suddenly stopped his work he had come to a certain point in that honorable and simple life and could stand it no longer moral what sensible man nowadays writes one honest word about himself he must already belong to the order of holy foolhardiness we are promised an autobiography of richard wagner who doubts but that it would be a clever autobiography think forsooth of the grotesque horror which the catholic priest jansen aroused in germany with his inconceivably square and harmless pictures of the german reformation what wouldn't people do if some real psychologist were to tell us about a genuine luther tell us not with the moralist simplicity of a country priest or the sweet and cautious modesty of a protestant historian but say with the fearlessness of a tain that springs from force of character and not from a prudent toleration of force the germans by the by have already produced the classic specimen of this toleration they may well be allowed to reckon him as one of their own in leopold ranke that born classical advocate of every causa fortior that cleverest of all the clever opportunists end of section six section seven of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche translated by horace b samuel third essay what is the meaning of ascetic ideals part three twenty but you will soon understand me putting it shortly there is reason enough is there not for us psychologists nowadays never to get away from a certain mistrust of our own selves probably even we ourselves are still too good for our work probably whatever contempt we feel for this popular craze for morality we ourselves are perhaps none the less its victims prey and slaves probably it infects even us of what was that diplomat warning us when he said to his colleagues let us especially mistrust our first impulses gentlemen they are almost always good so should nowadays every psychologist talk to his colleagues and thus we get back to our problem which in point of fact does require from us a certain severity a certain mistrust especially against first impulses the ascetic ideal in the service of projected emotional excess he who remembers the previous essay will already partially anticipate the essential meaning compressed into these above ten words the thorough unswitching of the human soul the plunging of it into terror frost ardor rapture so as to free it as though some lightning shock from all the smallness and pettiness of unhappiness depression and discomfort what ways lead to this goal and which of these ways does so most safely at bottom all great emotions have this power provided that they find a sudden outlet emotions such as rage fear lust revenge hope triumph despair cruelty and in sooth the ascetic priest has had no scruples in taking into his service the whole pack of hounds that rage in the human kennel unleashing now these and now those with the same constant of waking man out of his protracted melancholy of chasing away at any rate for a time his dull pain his shrinking misery but always under the sanction of a religious interpretation and justification 
This emotional excess has subsequently to be paid for. This is self-evident. It makes the ill more ill, and therefore this kind of remedy for pain is according to modern standards a guilty kind. The dictates of fairness, however, require that we should all the more emphasize the fact that this remedy is applied with a good conscience, that the ascetic priest has prescribed it in the most implicit belief in its utility and indispensability, often enough almost collapsing in the presence of the pain which he created, that we should similarly emphasize the fact that the violent physiological revenges of such excesses, even perhaps the mental disturbances, are not absolutely inconsistent with the general tenor of this kind of remedy, this remedy which, as we have shown previously, is not for the purpose of healing diseases, but of fighting the unhappiness of that depression, the alleviation and deadening of which was its object. The object was consequently achieved. The keynote by which the ascetic priest was enabled to get every kind of agonizing and ecstatic music to play on the fibers of the human soul was, as everyone knows, the exploitation of the feeling of guilt. I have already indicated in the previous essay the origin of this feeling, as a piece of animal psychology and nothing else. We were thus confronted with the feeling of guilt in its crude state, as it were. It was first in the hands of the priest, real artist that he was in the feeling of guilt, that it took shape. Oh, what a shape! Sin, for that is the name of the new priestly version of the animal bad conscience, the inverted cruelty has up to the present been the greatest event in the history of the diseased soul in sin we find the most perilous and fatal masterpiece of religious interpretation imagine man suffering from himself some way or other but at any rate physiologically perhaps like an animal shut up in a cage not clear as to the why and the wherefore imagine him in his desire for reasons reasons bring relief in his desire again for remedies, narcotics at last, consulting one who knows even with the occult, and see, lo and behold, he gets a hint from his wizard, the ascetic priest, his first hint on the cause of his trouble. He must search for it in himself, in his guiltiness, in a piece of the past. He must understand his very suffering as a state of punishment. He has heard, he has understood, has the unfortunate, he is now in the plight of a hen round which a line has to be drawn. He never gets out of the circle of lines. The sick man has been turned into the sinner. Now for a few thousand years we shall never get away from the sight of this new invalid, of a sinner. Shall we ever get away from it? Wherever we just look, everywhere the hypnotic gaze of the sinner always moving in one direction, in the direction of guilt, the only cause of suffering, everywhere the evil conscience, the gräulichetia, to use Luther's language, everywhere rumination over the past, a distorted view of action, the gaze of the green-eyed monster turning on all action, everywhere the willful misunderstanding of suffering, its transvaluation into feelings of guilt, fear of retribution, everywhere the scourge, the hairy shirt, the starving body, contrition, everywhere the sinner breaking himself on the ghastly wheel of a restless and morbidly eager conscience, everywhere mute pain, extreme fear, the agony of a tortured heart, the spasms of an unknown happiness, the shriek for redemption. In point of fact, thanks to this system of procedure, the old depression, dullness, and fatigue were absolutely conquered. Life itself became very interesting again, awake eternally awake sleepless glowing burnt away exhausted and yet not tired such was the figure cut by man the sinner who was initiated into these mysteries this grand old wizard of an ascetic priest fighting with depression he had clearly triumphed his kingdom had come men no longer grumbled at pain men panted after pain more pain more pain so for centuries on end shrieked the demands of his acolytes and initiates every emotional excess which hurt, everything which broke, overthrew, crushed, transported, ravished, the mystery of torture chambers, the ingenuity of hell itself, all this was now discovered, divined, exploited, all this was at the service of the wizard, all this served to promote the triumph of his ideal, the ascetic ideal. My kingdom is not of this world, quoth he, both at the beginning and at the end. Had he still the right to talk like that? Goethe had maintained that there were only 36 tragic situations. 
we would infer from that did we not know otherwise that goethe was no ascetic priest he knows more twenty one so far as all this kind of priestly medicine mongering the guilty kind is concerned every word of criticism is superfluous as for the suggestion that emotional excess of the type which in these cases the ascetic priest is fain to order to his sick patients under the most sacred euphemism as is obvious and equally impregnated with the sanctity of his purpose has ever really been of use to any sick man who forsooth would feel inclined to maintain a proposition of that character at any rate some understanding should become as to the expression be of use if you only wish to express that such a system of treatment has reformed man i do not gainsay it i merely add that reformed conveys to my mind much as tamed weakened discouraged refined daintified emasculated and thus it means almost as much as injured but when you have to deal principally with sick depressed and oppressed creatures such a system even granted that it makes the ill better under any circumstances also makes them more ill ask the mad doctors the invariable result of a methodical application of penance torture contritions and salvation ecstasies similarly ask history in every body politic where the ascetic priest has established this treatment of the sick disease has on every occasion spread with a sinister speed throughout its length and breadth what was always the result a shattered nervous system in addition to the existing malady and this in the greatest as in the smallest in the individuals as in the masses we find in consequence of the penance and redemption training awful epileptic epidemics the greatest known to history such as the saint vitus and saint john dances of the middle ages we find as another phase of its after effect frightful mutilations and chronic depressions by means of which the temperament of a nation or a city geneva bale is turned once for all into its opposite this training again is responsible for the witch hysteria a phenomenon analogous to somnambulism eight great epidemic outbursts of this only between fifteen sixty four and sixteen o five we find similarly in its train those delirious death cravings of large masses whose awful shriek viva la morte was heard over the whole of europe now interrupted by voluptuous variations and anon by a rage for destruction just as the same emotional sequence with the same intermittencies at sudden changes is now universally observed in every case where the ascetic doctrine of sin scores once more a great success religious neurosis appears as a manifestation of the devil there is no doubt about it what is it query tour speaking generally the ascetic ideal and its sublime moral cult this most ingenious reckless and perilous systematization of all methods of emotional excess is writ large in a dreadful and unforgettable fashion on the whole history of man and unfortunately not only on history i was scarcely able to put forward any other element which attacked the health and rare efficiency of europeans with more destructive power than did this ideal it can be dubbed without exaggeration the real fatality in the history of the health of the european man at the most you can merely draw a comparison with the specifically german influence i mean the alcohol poisoning of europe which up to the present has kept pace exactly with the political and racial predominance of the germans where they inoculated their blood there too did they inoculate their vice third in the series comes syphilis magno sed proximo intervallo twenty two the ascetic priest has wherever he has obtained the mastery corrupted the health of the soul he has consequently also corrupted taste in artibus et literis he corrupts it still consequently i hope i shall be granted this consequently at any rate i am not going to prove it first one solitary indication it concerns the arch book of christian literature the real model their book in itself in the very midst of the greco-roman splendor which was also a splendor of books face to face with an ancient world of writings which had not yet fallen to decay and ruin at a time when certain books were still to be read to possess which we would give nowadays half our literature in exchange at that time the simplicity and vanity of christian agitators they are generally called fathers of the church dared to declare we too have our classical literature we do not need that of the greeks 
and meanwhile they proudly pointed to their books and legends their letters of apostles and their apologetic tractlets just in the same way that today the english salvation army wages its fight against shakespeare and other heathens with an analogous literature you already guessed it i do not like the new testament it almost upsets me that i stand so isolated in my taste so far as concerns this valued this overvalued scripture the taste of two thousand years is against me but what boots it here i stand i cannot help myself i have a courage of my bad taste the old testament yes that is something quite different all honor to the old testament i find therein great men and heroic landscape and one of the rarest phenomena in the world the incomparable naivete of the strong heart further still i find a people in the new on the contrary just a hostile of petty sects pure rococo of the soul twisting angles and fancy touches nothing but convectical air not to forget an occasional whiff of bucolic sweetness which appertains to the epoch and the roman province and is less jewish than hellenistic meekness and braggadocio cheek by jowl an emotional garrulousness that almost deafens passionate hysteria but no passion painful pantomime here manifestly everyone lacked good breeding how dare anyone make so much fuss about their little failings as do these pious little fellows no one cares a straw about it let alone god finally they actually wish to have the crown of eternal life do all these little provincials in return for what in sooth for what end it is impossible to carry insolence any further an immortal peter who could stand him they have an ambition which makes one laugh the thing dishes up cut and dried his most personal life his melancholies and common or garden troubles as though the universe itself were under an obligation to bother itself about them for it never gets tired of wrapping up god himself in the petty misery in which its troubles are involved and how about the atrocious form of this chronic hobnobbing with god this jewish and not merely jewish slobbering and clawing importunacy towards god there exists little despised heathen nations in east africa from whom these first christians could have learnt something worth learning a little tact and worshipping these nations do not allow themselves to say aloud the name of their god this seems to me delicate enough it is certain that it is too delicate and not only for primitive christians to take a contrast just recollect luther the most eloquent and insolent peasant whom germany has had think of the lutheran tone in which he felt quite the most in his element during his tete-a-tetes with god luther's opposition to the medieval saints of the church in particular against the, that devil's hog the pope was there is no doubt at bottom the opposition of a boor who was offended at the good etiquette of the church that worship etiquette of the sacerdotal code which only admits to the holy of holies the initiated and the silent and shuts the door against the boors these definitely were not to be allowed a hearing in this planet but luther the peasant simply wished it otherwise as it was it was not german enough for him he personally wished himself to talk direct to talk personally to talk straight from the shoulder with his god well he's done it the ascetic ideal you will guess was at no time and in no place a school of good taste still less of good manners at the best it was a school for sacerdotal manners that is it contains in itself something which was a deadly enemy to all good manners lack of measure opposition to measure it is itself a non plus ultra twenty three the ascetic ideal has corrupted not only health and taste there is also third fourth fifth and sixth things which it has corrupted i shall take care not to go through the catalogue when should i get to the end i have here to expose not what this ideal affected but rather only what it means on what it is based what lies lurking behind it and under it that of which it is the provisional expression an obscure expression bristling with queries and misunderstandings and with this object only in view i presume not to spare my readers a glance at the awfulness of its results a glance at its fatal results i did this to prepare them for the final and most awful aspect presented to me by the question of the significance of the ad ideal 
what is the significance of the power of that ideal the monstrousness of its power why is it given such an amount of scope why is not a better resistance offered against it the ascetic ideal expresses one will where is the opposition will in which an opposition ideal expresses itself the ascetic ideal has an aim this goal is putting it generally that all the other interests of human life should measured by its standard appear petty and narrow it explains epochs nations men in reference to this one end it forbids any other interpretation any other end it repudiates denies affirms confirms only in the sense of its own interpretation and there ever more a thoroughly elaborated system of interpretation it subjects itself to no power rather does it believe in its own precedence over every power it believes that nothing powerful exists in the world that has not first got to receive from it a meaning a right to exist a value as being an instrument in its work a way and means to its end to one end where is the counterpart of this complete system of will end and interpretation why is the counterpart lacking where is the other one aim but i am told it is not lacking that not only has it fought a long and fortunate fight with that ideal but that further it has already won the mastery over that ideal in all essentials that our whole modern science attests to this that modern science which like the genuine reality philosophy which it is manifestly believes in itself alone manifestly has the courage to be itself the will to be itself and has got on well enough without god another world and negative virtues with all their noisy agitator babble however they affect nothing with me these trumpeters of reality are bad musicians their voices do not come from the deeps with sufficient audibility they are not the mouthpiece for the abyss of scientific knowledge for today scientific knowledge is an abyss the word science in such trumpeter mouths is a prostitution an abuse and impertinence the truth is just the opposite from what is maintained in the ascetic theory science has today absolutely no belief in itself let alone in an ideal superior to itself and wherever science still consists of passion love ardor suffering it is not the opposition to that ascetic ideal but rather the incarnation of its latest and noblest form does that ring strange there are enough brave and decent working people even among the learned men of today who like their little corner and who just because they are pleased so to do become at times indecently loud with their demand that people today should be quite content especially in science for in science there is so much useful work to do i do not deny it there is nothing i should like less than to spoil the delight of these honest workers in their handiwork for i rejoice in their work but the fact of science requiring hard work the fact of its having contented workers is absolutely no proof of science as a whole having today one end one will one ideal one passion for a great faith the contrary as i have said is the case when science is not the latest manifestation of the ascetic ideal but these are cases of such rarity selectness and exquisiteness as to preclude the general judgment being affected thereby science is a hiding place for every kind of cowardice disbelief remorse despectio sui bad conscience it is the very anxiety that springs from having no ideal the suffering from the lack of a great love the discontent with an enforced moderation oh what does all science not cover today how much at any rate does it not try to cover the diligence of our best scholars their senseless industry their burning the candle of their brain at both ends their very mastery in their handiwork how often is the real meaning of all that to prevent themselves continuing to see a certain thing science is a self-anesthetic do you know that you wound them every one who consorts with scholars experiences this you wound them sometimes to the quick through just a harmless word when you think you are paying them a compliment you embitter them beyond all bounds simply because you didn't have the finesse to infer the real kind of customers you had to tackle the sufferer kind who won't own up even to themselves what they really are the dazed and unconscious kind who have only one fear coming to consciousness 24 
And now look at the other side, at those rare cases of which I spoke, the most supreme idealists to be found nowadays among philosophers and scholars. Have we perchance found in them the sought-for opponents of the ascetic ideal, its anti-idealists? In fact, they believe themselves to be such, these unbelievers, for they are all of them that. It seems that this idea is their last remnant of faith, the idea of being opponents of this ideal. So earnest are they on this subject, so passionate in word and gesture. But does it follow that what they believe must necessarily be true? We knowers have grown by degrees suspicious of all kinds of believers. Our suspicion has step by step habituated us to draw just the opposite conclusions to what people have drawn before. That is to say, wherever the strength of a belief is particularly prominent to draw the conclusion of the difficulty of proving what is believed, the conclusion of its actual improbability. We do not again deny that faith produces salvation. For that very reason, we do deny that faith proves anything. A strong faith which produces happiness causes suspicion of the object of that faith. It does not establish its faith. It does establish a certain probability of illusion. What is now the position in these cases? These solitaries and deniers of today, these fanatics in one thing, in their claim to intellectual cleanness, these hard, stern, continent, heroic spirits, who constitute the glory of our time, all these pale atheists, anti-Christians, immoralists, nihilists, these skeptics, effectics, and hectics of the intellect, in a certain sense they are the latter, both collectively and individually, these supreme idealists of knowledge, in whom alone nowadays the intellectual conscience dwells and it is alive, in point of fact, they believe themselves as far away as possible from the ascetic ideal, do these free, very free spirits. And yet, if I may reveal what they themselves cannot see, for they stand too near themselves, this ideal is simply their ideal. They represent it nowadays and perhaps no one else. They themselves are its most spiritualized product, its most advanced picket of skirmishes and scouts, its most insidious, delicate, and elusive form of seduction. If I am in any way a reader of riddles, then I will be one with this sentence. For some time past there have been no free spirits, for they still believe in truth. When the Christian crusaders in the East came into collision with that invincible order of assassins, that order of free spirits par excellence, whose lowest grade lives in a state of discipline such as no order of monks has ever attained, then in some way or other they managed to get an inkling of that symbol and tally word, that was reserved for the highest grade alone of, as their secretum. Nothing is true, everything is allowed. In sooth, that was freedom of thought, thereby was taking leave of the very belief in truth. Has indeed any European, any Christian free thinker, ever yet wandered into this proposition and its labyrinthy consequences? Does he know from experience the minotauros of this den? I doubt it. Nay, I know otherwise. Nothing is more really alien to these mono-fanatics, these so-called free spirits, than freedom and unfettering in that sense. In no respect are they more closely tied. The absolute fanaticism of their belief in truth is unparalleled. I know all this perhaps too much from experience at close quarters, that dignified philosophic abstinence to which a belief like that binds its adherence, that stoicism of the intellect, which eventually vetoes negation as rigidly as it does affirmation, that wish for standing still in front of the actual, the factum brutum, that fatalism in petit fait, c'est petit fatalism, as I call it, in which French science now attempts a kind of moral superiority over the German. This renunciation of interpretation generally, that is, of forcing, doctoring, abridging, omitting, suppressing, inventing, falsifying, and all the other essential attributes of interpretation. All this, considered broadly, expresses the asceticism of virtue, quite as effectively as does any repudiation of the senses. It is at bottom only a modus of that repudiation. But what forces it into that unqualified will for truth is the faith in the ascetic ideal itself, even though it takes the form of its unconscious imperatives, makes you no mistake about it, it is the faith, I repeat, in a metaphysical value, an intrinsic value of truth, of a character which only warranted and guaranteed in this ideal, it stands or falls with this ideal. 
Judge strictly, there does not exist a science without its hypotheses. The thought of such a science is inconceivable, illogical. A philosophy, a faith, must always exist first to enable science to gain thereby a direction, a meaning, a limit and method, a right to existence. He who holds a contrary opinion on the subject, he, for example, who takes it upon himself to establish philosophy upon a strictly scientific basis, has first got to turn upside down not only philosophy but also the truth itself, the gravest insult which could possibly be offered to two such respectable females. Yes, there is no doubt about it. And here I quote my Joyful Wisdom, Book 5, Aphorism 344. The man who is truthful in that daring and extreme fashion, which is the presupposition of faith in science, asserts thereby a different world from that of life, nature, and history. And in so far as he asserts the existence of that different world, come, must he not similarly repudiate its counterpart? This world, our world? The belief on which our faith in science is based has remained to this day a metaphysical belief. Even we knowers of today, we godless foes of metaphysics, we too take our fire from that conflagration which was kindled by a thousand-year-old faith, from that Christian belief, which was also Plato's belief, the belief that God is truth, that truth is divine. But what if this belief becomes more and more incredible? What if nothing proves itself to be divine? unless it be error, blindness, lies. What if God himself proved himself to be our oldest lie? It is necessary to stop at this point and to consider the situation carefully. Science itself now needs a justification, which is not for a minute to say that there is such a justification. Turn in this context to the most ancient and most modern philosophers. They all fail to realize the extent of the need of a justification on the part of the will to truth. Here is a gap in every philosophy. What is it caused by? Because up to the present, the ascetic ideal dominated all philosophy. Because truth was fixed as being, as God, as supreme court of appeal. Because truth was not allowed to be a problem. Do you understand this allowed? From the minute that the belief in the God of the ascetic ideal is repudiated, there exists a new problem. The problem of the value of truth. The will for truth needed a critique. Let us define by these words our own task. The value of truth is tentatively to be called into question. If this seems too laconically expressed, I recommend the reader to peruse again that passage from the joyful wisdom which bears the title, How Far We Are Also Still Pious, Aphorism 344, and best of all, the whole fifth book of that work, as well as the preface to Dawn of Day. 25. No, you can't get round me with science. When I search for the natural antagonists of the ascetic ideal, when I put the question, where is the opposed will in which the opponent ideal expresses itself? Science is not, by a long way, independent enough to fulfill this function. In every department, science needs an ideal value, a power which creates values, and in whose service it can believe in itself. Science itself never creates values. Its relation to the ascetic ideal is not in itself antagonistic. Speaking roughly, it rather represents the progressive force in the inner evolution of that ideal. Tested more exactly, its opposition and antagonism are concerned not with the ideal itself, but only with that ideal's outworks, its outer garb, its masquerade, with its temporary hardening, stiffening, and dogmatizing. It makes the life in the ideal free once more, while it repudiates its superficial elements. These two phenomena, science and the ascetic ideal, both rest on the same basis. I have already made this clear. The basis, I say, of the same over-appreciation of truth. More accurately, the same belief in the impossibility of valuing and of criticizing truth. And consequently, they are necessarily allies, so that, in the event of their being attacked, they must always be attacked and called into question together. Valuation of the ascetic ideal inevitably entails a valuation of science as well, Lose no time in seeing this clearly, and be sharp to catch it. Art, I am speaking provisionally, for I will treat it on some other occasion in greater detail. Art, I repeat, in which lying is sanctified and the will for deception has good conscience on its side, is much more fundamentally opposed to the ascetic ideal than is science. Plato's instinct felt this. Plato, the greatest enemy of art which Europe has produced up to the present, Plato versus Homer, that is the complete, the true antagonism, 
on the one side the whole-hearted transcendental the great defamer of life on the other its involuntary panegyrist the golden nature an artistic subservience to the service of the ascetic ideal is consequently the most absolute artistic corruption that there can be though unfortunately it is one of the most frequent phases for nothing is more corruptible than an artist considered physiologically moreover science rests on the same basis as does the ascetic ideal a certain impoverishment of life is the presupposition of the latter as of the former add frigidity of the emotions slackening of the tempo the substitution of dialect for instinct seriousness impressed on mien and gesture seriousness that most unmistakable sign of strenuous metabolism of struggling toiling life consider the periods in a nation in which the learned man comes into prominence that there are periods of exhaustion often of sunset of decay the effervescing strength the confidence in life the confidence in the future are no more the preponderance of the mandarins never signifies any good any more than does the advent of democracy or arbitration instead of war equal rights for women the religion of pity and all the other symptoms of declining life science handled as a problem what is the meaning of science upon this point the preface to the birth of tragedy no this modern science mark you this well is at times the best ally for the ascetic ideal and for the very reason that it is the ally which is most unconscious most automatic most secret and most subterranean they have been playing into each other's hands up to the present have these poor in spirit and have the scientific opponents of that ideal take care by the by not to think that these opponents are the antithesis of this ideal that they are the rich in spirit that they are not i have called them the hectic in spirit as for these celebrated victories in science there is no doubt that they are victories but victories over what there was not for a single minute any victory among their list over the ascetic ideal rather was it made stronger that is to say more elusive more abstract more insidious from the fact that a wall an outwork that had got built on to the main fortress and disfigured in its appearance should from time to time be ruthlessly destroyed and broken down by science does any one seriously suggest that the downfall of the theological astronomy signified the downfall of that ideal has perchance man grown less in need of a transcendental solution of his riddle of existence because since that time this existence has become more random casual and superfluous in the visible order of the universe has there not been since the time of copernicus an unbroken progress of the self-belittling of man and his will for belittling himself alas his belief in his dignity his uniqueness and his irreplaceableness in the scheme of existence is gone he has become animal literal unqualified and unmitigated animal he who in his earlier belief was almost god child of god demigod since copernicus man seems to have fallen on to a steep plane he rolls faster and faster away from the centre whither into nothingness into the thrilling sensation of his own nothingness well this would be the straight way to the old ideal all science and by no means only astronomy with regard to the humiliating and deteriorating effect of which kant has made such a remarkable confession it annihilates my own importance all science natural as much as unnatural by unnatural i mean the self-critique of reason nowadays sets out to talk man out of his present opinion of himself as though that opinion had been nothing but a bizarre piece of conceit you might go so far as to say that science finds its peculiar pride its peculiar bitter form of stoical ataraxia in preserving man's contempt for himself that state which took so much trouble to bring about as man's final and most serious claim to self-appreciation rightly so in point of fact for he who despises is always one who has not forgotten how to appreciate but does all this involve any real effort to counteract the ascetic ideal is it really seriously suggested that kant's victory over the theological dogmatism about god soul freedom immortality has damaged that ideal in any way as the theologians have imagined to be the case for a long time past and in this connection it does not concern us for a single minute if kant himself intended any such consummation it is certain that from the time of kant every type of transcendentalist is playing a winning game they are emancipated from the theologians 
what luck he has revealed to them that secret art by which they can now pursue their heart's desire on their own responsibility and with all the respectability of science similarly who can grumble at the agnostics reviewers as they are of the unknown and the absolute mystery if they now worship their very query as god xavier doudan talks somewhere of the ravages which l'habitude d'amérir l'intelligible a lieu de rester tout simplement dans le connu has produced the ancients he thinks must have been exempt from those ravages supposing that everything known to man fails to satisfy his desires and on the contrary contradicts and horrifies them what a divine way out of all this to be able to look for the responsibility not in the desiring but in the knowing there is no knowledge consequently there is a god what a novel elegantia syllogismi what a triumph for the ascetic ideal twenty six or perchance does the whole of modern history show in its demeanor greater confidence in life greater confidence in its ideals its loftiest pretension is now to be a mirror it repudiates all teleology it will have no more proving it disdains to play the judge and thereby shows its good taste it asserts as little as it denies it fixes it describes all this is to a high degree ascetic but at the same time it is to a much greater degree nihilistic make no mistake about this you see in the historian a gloomy hard but determined gaze an eye that looks out as an isolated north pole explorer looks out perhaps so as not to look within so as not to look back there is snow here is life silenced the last crows which caw here are called wither vanity nada here nothing more flourishes and grows as the most the metapolitics of st petersburg and the pity of tolstoy but as for that other school of historians a perhaps still more modern school a voluptuous and lascivious school which ogles life and the ascetic ideal with equal fervor which uses the word artist as a glove and has nowadays established the corner for itself in all the praise given to contemplation oh what a thirst do these sweet intellectuals excite even for ascetics and winter landscapes nay the devil take these contemplative folk how much liefer would i wandered with those historical nihilists through the gloomiest gray cold mist nay i shall not mind listening supposing i have to choose to one who is completely unhistorical and anti-historical a man like During, for instance over whose periods a hitherto shy and unavowed species of beautiful souls has grown intoxicated in contemporary germany the species anarchistica with their educated proletariat the contemplative are a hundred times worse i never knew anything which produced such intense nausea as one of those objective chairs one of those scented mannequins about town of history a thing half priest half satyr renon parfum which betrays by the high shrill falsetto of his applause what he lacks and where he lacks it who betrays where in this case the fates have plied their ghastly shears alas in too surgeon-like a fashion this is distasteful to me and irritates my patience let him keep patient at such sights who has nothing to lose thereby such a sight enrages me such spectators embitter me against the play even more does that play itself history itself you understand anacreontic moods imperceptibly come over me this nature who gave to the steer its horn to the lion its kesu odonton for what purpose did nature give me my foot to kick by saint anacreon and not merely to run away to trample on all the worm-eaten chairs the cowardly contemplators the lascivious eunuchs of history the flirters with ascetic ideals the righteous hypocrites of impotence all reverence on my part to the ascetic ideal in so far as it is honorable so long as it believes in itself and plays no pranks on us but i like not all these coquettish bugs who have an insatiate ambition to smell of the infinite until eventually the infinite smells of bugs i like not the whited sepulchres with their stagey reproduction of life i like not the tired and the used up who wrap themselves in wisdom and look objective 
I like not the agitators dressed up and as heroes who hide their dummy heads behind the stalking horse of an ideal. I like not the ambitious artists who would fain play the ascetic and the priest and are at bottom nothing but tragic clowns. I like not, again, these newest speculators in idealism, the anti-Semites, who nowadays roll their eyes in the patent Christian Aryan man of honor fashion, and by an abuse of moralist attitudes and agitation dodges so cheap as to exhaust any patience, strive to excite all the blockhead elements of, in the populace. The invariable success of every kind of intellectual charlatanism in present-day Germany hangs together with an almost indisputable and already quite palpable desolation of the German mind, whose curse I look for in a too exclusive diet of papers, politics, beer, and Wagnerian music, not forgetting the condition precedent of this diet, national exclusiveness and vanity, the strong but narrow principle, Germany, Germany above everything, and finally the paralysis agitans of modern ideas. Europe nowadays is, above all, wealthy and ingenious in means of excitement. It apparently has no more crying necessity than stimulantia and alcohol. Hence the enormous counterfeiting of ideas, those most fiery spirits of the mind. Hence, too, the repulsive, evil-smelling, perjured, pseudo-alcoholic air everywhere. I should like to know how many cargoes of imitation idealism of hero costumes with highfalutin claptrap how many casks of sweetened pity liqueur firm la religion de la souffrance how many crutches of righteous indignation for the help of those flat-footed intellects how many comedians of the christian moral ideal would need today to be exported from europe to enable its air to smell pure again it is obvious that in regard to this overproduction, a new trade possibility lies open. It is obvious that there is a new business to be done in little ideal idols and obedient idealists. Don't pass over this tip. Who has sufficient courage? We have in our hands the possibility of idealizing the whole earth. But what am I talking about courage? We need only one thing here. A hand. A very free hand. 27 enough enough let us leave these curiosities and complexities of the modern spirit which excite as much laughter as disgust our problem can certainly do without them the problem of the meaning of the ascetic ideal what has it got to do with yesterday or today those things shall be handled by me more thoroughly and severely in another connection under the title a contribution to the history of european nihilism I refer for this to a work which I am preparing, The Will to Power, an attempt at a transvaluation of all values. The only reason why I come to allude to it here is this. The ascetic ideal has at times, even in the most intellectual sphere, only one real kind of enemies and damagers. These are the comedians of this ideal, for they awake mistrust. Everywhere otherwise, where the mind is at work seriously, powerfully, and without counterfeiting, it dispenses altogether now with an ideal, the popular expression of, for this abstinence is atheism, with the exception of the will for truth. But this will, this remnant of an ideal is, if you will believe me, that ideal itself in its severest and cleverest formulation, esoteric through and through, stripped of all outworks, and consequently not so much its remnant as its kernel. Unqualified honest atheism, and its air only do we breathe, we, the most intellectual men of this age, is not opposed to that ideal, to the extent that it appears to be. It is rather one of the final phases of its evolution, one of its syllogisms and pieces of inherent logic. It is the awe-inspiring catastrophe of a two-thousand-year training in truth, which finally forbids itself the lie of the belief in God. The same course of development in India, quite independently and consequently of some demonstrative value, the same ideal driving to the same conclusion, the decisive point reached 500 years before the European era, or more precisely at the time of Buddha. It started in the Sankhyam philosophy, and then this was popularized through Buddha and made into a religion. What? I put the question with all strictness, has really triumphed over the Christian God? The answer stands in my joyful wisdom, aphorism 357. The Christian morality itself, 
the idea of truth taken as it was with increasing seriousness the confessor subtlety of the christian conscience translated and sublimated into the scientific conscience into intellectual cleanness at any price regarding nature as though it were a proof of the goodness and guardianship of god interpreting history in honor of a divine reason as a constant proof of a moral order of the world and a moral teleology explaining our own personal experiences as pious men have for long enough explained them as though every arrangement every nod every single thing were invented and sent out of love for the salvation of the soul all this is now done away with all this has the conscience against it and is regarded by every subtler conscience as disreputable dishonorable as lying feminism weakness cowardice by means of this severity if by means of anything at all are we in sooth good europeans and heirs of europe's longest and bravest self-mastery all great things go to ruin by reason of themselves by reason of an act of self-dissolution so wills the law of life the law of necessary self-mastery even in the essence of life ever is the lawgiver finally exposed to the cry patere legem quam ipse tulisti in thus wise did christianity go to ruin as a dogma through its own morality in thus wise must christianity go again to ruin today as a morality we are standing on the threshold of this event after christian truthfulness has drawn one conclusion after another it finally draws its strongest conclusion its conclusion against itself this however happens when it puts the question what is the meaning of every will for truth and here again do i touch on my problem on our problem my unknown friends for as yet i know of no friends what sense has our whole being if it does not mean that in our own selves that will for truth has come to its own consciousness as a problem by reason of this attainment of self-consciousness on the part of the will for truth morality from henceforward there is no doubt about it goes to pieces this is that great hundred act play that is reserved for the next two centuries of europe the most terrible the most mysterious and perhaps also the most hopeful of all plays twenty eight if you accept the ascetic ideal man the animal man has no meaning his existence on earth contained no end what is the purpose of man at all was a question without an answer the will for man and the world was lacking behind every great human destiny rang as a refrain a still greater vanity the ascetic ideal simply means this that something was lacking that a tremendous void encircled man he did not know how to justify himself to explain himself to affirm himself he suffered from the problem of his own meaning he suffered also in other ways he was in the main a diseased animal but his problem was not suffering itself but the lack of an answer to that crying question to what purpose do we suffer man the bravest animal and the one most inured to suffering does not repudiate suffering in itself he wills it he even seeks it out provided that he has shown a meaning for it a purpose for suffering not suffering but the senselessness of suffering was the curse which till then lay spread over humanity and the ascetic ideal gave it a meaning it was up till then the only meaning but any meaning is better than no meaning the ascetic ideal was in that connection the faux de mieux par excellence that existed at that time in that ideal suffering found an explanation the tremendous gap seemed filled the door to all suicidal nihilism was closed the explanation there is no doubt about it brought in its train new suffering deeper more penetrating more venomous gnawing more brutally into life it brought all suffering under the perspective of guilt but in spite of that man was saved thereby he had a meaning and from henceforth was no more like a leaf in the wind a shuttlecock of chance of nonsense he could now will something absolutely immaterial to what end to what purpose with what means he wished the will itself was saved it is absolutely impossible to disguise what in point of fact is made clear by complete will that has taken its direction from the ascetic ideal this hate of the human and even more of the animal and more still of the material this horror of the senses of reason itself this fear of happiness and beauty 
this desire to get right away from all illusion change growth death wishing and even desiring all this means let us have the courage to grasp it a will for nothingness a will opposed to life a repudiation of the most fundamental conditions of life but it is and remains a will and to say at the end that which i said at the beginning man will wish nothingness rather than not wish at all end of section seven recording by jeffrey church end of the genealogy of morals by friedrich nietzsche translated by horace b samuel